Um, thank you all for being here. My name is Oliver DeMille. I am the director for Youth for Freedom here in Utah. Um, and just to get things started real quick, Wesley is going to give us a prayer, and then we'll start things off. Okay? Thank you. All right. So I'm super excited to, to welcome you all here today and to have so many people here. This is going to be awesome. Um, to start us off today, we get to hear from one of my favorite people in the world, one of my first mentors. She's been my mentor in some capacity or another since I was about 11, I think. Um, and I've learned so, so much from this woman and her husband, who is one of my main examples of what it means to be a true, awesome man. <laughs> <laughs> so today we get to hear from the director and one of the founders of Youth for Freedom, um, Tammy Mitchell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Woo hoo! I got to hear you a little bit, but who's excited for Youth for Freedom? <laughs> Let's see how far you guys have traveled. So we have some from Idaho. Let's hear the Idahoans. Woo! Oh, we got some over here, okay. <laughs> Vegas, we've got the Vegas corner back in <laughs> over here. <laughs> Who else has traveled today? Arizona. Ar yeah. Cla oh, that's right, we've got Arizona. You were from Arizona too. Anybody else? California. California right here, Salt Lake. Look at uh, this, Washington. No, no, no. Woohoo! But what? I've traveled from there before. <laughs> <laughs> one time I was there. So I one time was in Hungary. Does that oh. count? <laughs> that is a long way away from here. Yeah. <laughs> Same That's awesome. Okay, my name's Cami Mitchell. Like Oliver said, and this is the very first training of 2015. Welcome to it. We've we've shifted a bunch of different things for Youth for Freedom this year, and we are so excited to give you guys the vision of what's happening, all the changes and everything that's going on. Some of you are brand new. Some of you have never been to Youth for Freedom event at all, ever. Some of you, we raised you in YFF. <laughs> <laughs> and you came as a, as a youth and then as a counselor and maybe you're a session director and you're just all, like, all over the map. You're just like, YFF is the place for me! <laughs> and so we have the broad spectrum of everybody. The youth out there are the same. Some of them come to our conference who have never been there and they're like scared. I was so grateful for the, the prayer. Thank you for that. That we're going to have a comfortable setting that we feel safe and respected in. We'll set that, set that up for the whole training today. But the youth that are coming through are going to feel just like you do. Whether you're brand new or whether you've been here for years and years and years and, and like had nightmares that you didn't get into IFF this year. <laughs> and couldn't wipe the smile off your face for three weeks because YFF training's coming up. Like there's, there's going to be the drastic differences from our youth as well. Some of them are just walking in going, oh my gosh, what is this YFF stuff? And some of them have looked forward to it 364 days of the year <laughs> and have saved their pennies up and gather them up and hand them to me at the last minute. They're like, that's the last of it, Cammy. I'm here. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is exciting. So take notice of how you're feeling right now. The youth will feel the same. And so what, what our job is exactly what she just prayed for, is to create a safe and comfortable and respectable environment for those youth to just absolutely explore their greatness so that they can see who they are inside. And so that's what we get to do with you. Are you excited about that? Yeah. <laughs> nervous? That was, an ex that was a nervous, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I've heard about you, Cammie Mitchell. <laughs> Good, because we're going to do some fun stuff today. Oh my gosh, I'm excited for today. OK, so first of all, if you guys will help me thank my husband, Mark, for providing this classroom. This is where he teaches every day of the year. And he's like, what? It's spring break? You want me to come back to my classroom? Are you kidding me? So let's thank Mark for his classroom. <laughs> also, let's thank the YFF staff. We have many different um, places and th people working in different facets and, and all sorts of different things. And so everybody who helped put this event together in this training, let's give them a round of applause. Okay, 
I, of course, want to thank each of us who are here. The reason that you're in your seat today, I want to thank you for showing up. There's, there's, I have people still having um, nightmare car problems on their way here and all sorts of different problems and things that are happening. You're here. Thank you for showing up today and getting excited to join the vision of YFF. And some of you are like, I don't even know what that is, but I think I'm joining. <laughs> so you'll, you'll understand by the end of today, you'll be a completely different person and you'll be the one going, ah, I can see why they're so excited! <laughs> it's going to be okay. You guys okay at that? <laughs> they're like, I'm already there! I'm already there! Okay, so round of applause for you guys for showing up here today. <laughs> So on, on the docket of what, what we're going to cover today is you're going to get a clear understanding of what Youth for Freedom is. Our vision, our purpose, where we're headed, why you guys are sitting here and wanting in, okay? Um, also, you'll get to feel what the YFF spirit feels like. And that spirit of freedom is humongous. And you may not know it yet, but you'll feel it throughout this day and it, it's about two months before Youth for Freedom that I start getting text messages and, and Facebook posts and kids saying, Cammy, YFF is right around the corner, I can't sleep. I'm like, two months? Two months, you gotta go to sleep, sweetheart. You gotta go to sleep. It's okay. But you're gonna start feeling that Youth for Freedom spirit and the love. Because it all starts right here. It starts within our leadership. And that's why it goes out to all of the youth. who We have 100 youth already registered ready to come into our arms for those three days. And so what, what happens is we start that here and the synergy starts going out. So you get to participate in that feeling and the spirit of YFF and YFF love may look different than you know love to be. You may have grown up in a family different than mine. <laughs> and welcome to YFF. <laughs> the love that we show each other may be totally foreign and I'm okay with that. Welcome to getting outside of your comfort zone. In the Rhodes family, which I'm a Rhodes, there was eight of us kids, and we hug all the time, and we express our love for each other, and we're constantly encouraging each other and wanting each other to do better and, and being each other's biggest fan. And so I've kind of created my home environment into YFF. And so I've, I've welcomed you into my family and that's how we express love. And some people get there the first day and they're like, holy cow, I've, had, I've got so many hugs and, and I, I can't even count how many people have told me they love me and, and I don't even know them. I, oh my gosh, I didn't even, oh, I just need to take a breath. Okay, it's okay. You feel it, huh? Yeah, I'm so excited. <laughs> that's what we're all about, is to absolutely overwhelm the youth of tomorrow with love. And so that's what you're going to start. That's what she's already started feeling like that's what's going to happen. And it starts with us right here, right now. And so that's kind of what we have planned for today. Is anybody excited about that? Yeah. Woo! Okay, awesome. All right, we're going to set up, set up the room like what she was praying for. It's really important to set up the different rules. Can you guys see that one? No. no. I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> Okay, first rule of the day is respect. What does respect look like? Anybody? Wow, that's so quiet. Okay, that won't continue happening. It'll be really, <laughs> like once I ask questions starting in about 20 minutes, everybody will be like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, calm down, calm down, one at a time. Okay, respect. It would be treating other people how you want to be treated. Treating other people how you yourself want to be treated, okay? We're going to be going, yeah, go ahead. Um, accepting differences and Whoa. opportunities. Accepting differences and opportunities and celebrating those differences. This is not a one religion, Youth for Freedom. We have all the facets coming. We have the atheists, the Jews, the Christians, the Catholics, the Mormons, all of them. And it's so cool for these kids to go, oh, what? You believe in what? That's so cool. Tell, tell me about that. Share it with me when they might not have had that opportunity ever before. We have differences all over the spectrum, not just in religion. And we learn to celebrate those differences. Jacob. I was going to say, seeking to understand. Love it. Seeking to understand instead of be understood, which is a lot of the time we, we love taking the limelight and putting it on ourselves and going, oh, when you understand me, you're going to love me. I'm amazing. This is so cool. This is a time to put the limelight on the youth. 
and seek to understand them. And this is what we get to do here is come in and understand each other. We get to start practicing everything that we're going to teach our youth in June. We're going to start practicing now. Is that cool? So thank you. That's exactly what respect is. Who's willing to respect each other as well as themselves? Let me see if I raise the hands. Okay, awesome. What is my next rule? Hundred percent. What is that? Tina, stand up for me. Okay, so if I ask Tina, hey Tina, I'm so excited you're here. I want you to give me 90% today. So go down, scrunch down a little, oh, right there. Now I'm just gonna have you just play like that all day, okay? If you don't move, just go, go, 90%. That's what I want from Tina, 90%. How much success is she gonna have at 90%? <laughs> a good clock workout? Yeah, right, she's gonna be really strong. She's gonna be shaking pretty soon. And then she's gonna get frustrated. And then she's gonna stop listening to anything that's going on because she's gonna be aching and, and like, whoa, oh, I can't stand it, can I just, can I just stand up? It's gonna, is it gonna be way easier for her to stand completely up and give 100% than it is for 90%? What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so what I'm asking for you guys to do today while we're here is to play at 100%. How can I know if she's playing at 100%? You know. Standing tall. She's standing tall. So I can point to her and go, oh, you're not playing your 100%. Can I? Can I even know that, you guys? Who's the only person in the whole room that can know that? It's her. And so I can ask her, hey, was that your 100%? And she can go, okay, I got more. I got more. Let me try it again. I'm so excited. <laughs> right? That's how, how you play. Okay, so 100% looks completely different for every single one of us. I don't want your 100% to be my 100%. I want your 100%. And it's so much easier once we play at 100% rather than when we're playing through life at 80, 70, so 50. So who's willing to play at 100% today? Let me hear it. Let's say it. Okay. I, I got you. you. You're not raising your hand, Seth. I got you. Oh, you're raising. Okay. okay. I'm like, it's okay. You don't have to. If it's not something you want to do, don't raise your hand because I will hold you accountable. He raises his hand 50%. He's <laughs> <laughs> I am playing this big. This, okay, one more, ch one more chance. Who's in 100% today? Yes. <laughs> He's scared to death. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, number three, because it's, because it's YFF and because it's me, we're going to have a lot of fun. This is the fastest way I learn. If I'm having fun, I get it. I experience it, I got it. We're not gonna stand up here and lecture and have you take notes and, and then we all go home. We're gonna experience things. We're gonna actually have activities and do things together, have discussions and, and shift our thinking because if you shift your thinking, what do you really shift? Everything. 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 So we're gonna have a lot of fun doing things outside of our comfort zone today, okay? Who's willing to have fun with me today? <laughs> okay. Some of you are writing notes when I'm asking those questions, and I'm wondering if you're on purpose getting out of the answer. <laughs> I'm seeing what's going on out there. I'm watching you. <laughs> yeah, fun? You're in for fun? Yes. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, we're gonna start off today with the same way that I start off Youth for Freedom, which is all about intentions. What is it, and I want you to pull out your notebook. What is it that you want out of today? A lot of us have traveled. I'm not with my children today. I've given up my, my whole entire day to, to be with you guys here. You guys have given up all sorts of different things. Um, what is it that you want out of being here today? You've shown up. What do you want? What do you want to feel? What do you want to accomplish? What do you, who do you want to meet? Do you want to have new friends by the end of the day? If so, how many? The more details you put into your intentions, the faster the universe can answer. Who's willing to share an intention? Go ahead. I want to be who God wants me to be so I can be an example to others. You want to be an example to others by being who God wants you to be. Who do you want to be? That person. That person. Yeah. You want to align yourself with what he wants for you. Beautiful. Who else? Yeah. 
I want to understand Youth for Freedom, what we stand for, and what our goals are. Good, good, good. I'm glad you're here today. Do you guys think he'll meet his intention? Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> me too. Who else? Yeah. I want to learn how to share fun. Like, I know how to have fun, but I want to learn how to share it. I love it. You know how to have fun here. You want mm -hmm. to share and make sure everybody in the group's having fun. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, I like that. One back here. Yes. Somebody had their hand raised. Was it me? I don't know. Because <laughs> uh, I did, but I didn't know who it was. Who was you? What's that? Sure, I guess. I don't know what that is. Oh! Everybody's pointing to you now. They really want you to share your intention. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think mine are a lot selfish, but I really want to learn how to open my heart to others. That's not, not selfish. Not like Okay, it's interesting. So you want to learn how to open your heart to others. What part of that is selfish? <laughs> oh, okay, not, not one even little part of it is selfish. Interesting. Because that is all about everybody, right? Because we want to get to know you, and the only way to get to know you is if you open your heart to us. And you have a lot of ways that you're going to bless all of us. But if you're closed, does that work? Like not raise my hand. Right? So everybody else knew that you were ready to share that. <laughs> Is that cool? Thank you for being willing to share. That's huge. That we're definitely gonna gonna go after that. That's a huge piece. Anybody else? Yeah. I just want to be a little more prepared and have a good idea of what I can do going forward to prepare and be ready to give my best self. Awesome. Awesome. So you want to know, like, tell me exactly the different things that I need to do in order to know what I'm doing when I get up there so I can make a difference. Maybe not like being told exactly, but get an idea of who I need to become before then. Okay. So not necessarily what I need to do, but who I need to become. Whoa. Who's that going to come from? Me. Yeah. It's going to come inside. I'm 100% responsible for all of these. <laughs> nice. And that comes from inside. You being here gives you the opportunity for that, those types of things to show up in your life. I love it. Um, anybody else? Yes. So I want to help my boys free themselves from inner bondage. You want to help your boys free themselves from inner bondage yes. because? Because it seems to be the bondage within ourselves that holds us back from accomplishing the things we want to. Yeah. And moving forward, we're just making simple decisions throughout the day. Okay. Spencer, how are you going to do that? How am I going to do that? Mm -hmm. First, free myself from bondage. Bingo. Do you guys hear that? So if we want to help someone out there do something, what's the very first thing we need to do? Yeah. It's amazing. Oh my goodness. And I'm, I'm so learning this right now. How often I can prescribe and help fix and oh my goodness, just shift this one thing. You got it. Can I take my own medicine? Whoa. <laughs> That's a tough pill to swallow. But when I can look in the mirror and go, you're the one that I need to free from bondage. Because when I do that, then I can help everybody else do the, do the same thing. So that's perfect, that's awesome. Thank you for being willing to share your intentions, you guys. That's beautiful. Okay, so since we're going to be together, not just today and for the retreat and then for the conference, is it okay if I share with you a little bit about me? Yes? yes? Thank you. I've owned and directed Youth for Freedom. This will be our 14th year. That's a long time. <laughs> I'm looking through pictures of Clearback from 2002 and our first, first kitchen staff and Nathan Reed, who's now my session director, is on my kitchen staff as a little 12-year-old. Hey, I'll serve <laughs> in the kitchen! Because 12-year-olds couldn't come at that time. They had to be 14 that very first year. Oh my goodness. And just looking through all of the different experiences and, and the things that I've learned and become in the ways that I've changed through Youth for Freedom. It's been amazing, an amazing 14 years. Mark didn't join me for about five years of it. And I saw the humongous difference of, because he stood in the background going, oh, Cam, this takes up all your time. And I don't know about this youth stuff. So then he decided, I'm like, just come. You don't even have to help me with anything. Just come. Guess what happened? <laughs> <laughs> he showed up and he's like, that was so fun. Oh my gosh, these youth are so awesome. Okay, I'll help. <laughs> <laughs> and once he joined, the whole program got so much better. What, what he brought to the program just shifted everything. 
and I'm so grateful for, for his participation, his gifts and talents, and what he adds to the, to the mix and to the leadership. And sometimes he thinks he sits on the sidelines or in the back, but every one of us who have ever been to IFF or been through the trainings, we know that without Mark, it's not possible. They, he, he really is the, the glue that makes this happen. So I'm just really thankful for him. Can we all blow him a kiss? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you, got, you got my kiss first, right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and a force field of kisses. <laughs> <laughs> I am a mentor, a speaker, a trainer. I love working with people. I love working one on one. I love doing the group thing. I've been paid five hundred dollars an hour to do the group thing. One on one, I mentor for a hundred dollars an hour, and it is awesome to see what can happen to to not only the mentee but also the mentor as we go through that process. This is nearly my 700th presentation. That's awesome, Mark! Yeah! I um, wanted to read something from one of my recent men mentees. She says, I'm so happy you're my mentor. And if you know this person, don't say anything. I've learned so much from you, and I can't wait to keep on learning. I'm amazed at how far I've come. It's always seemed so far away, and yet, here I am. I mean, I still got a ways to go, but, I, but it's still pretty cool where I am now. And thanks to you and God, you are my favorite. I love you. That is huge kudos. And I love being a tool in God's hand to help people find their way. Um, this is filled with all of the youth from just one, of, one, of, one session. All of the different things and experiences and, and thanks. And I wanted to read to you just a couple things from what the youth will be saying once you guys are their leader and they're looking up to you. YFF has changed my life. I look forward to this camp all year. Thank you so much for creating a place where I can feel safe. And, and Wellesley said it in her prayer, a place where I can feel safe and loved, where I can learn, grow, and improve. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for teaching me to receive. It has increased my power 50-fold. You have, you have been amazing. Um, an amazing influence in my life. I love this one. I fasted for purpose, love, friends, and God. Then he gave me YFF. Is that cool? That's so cool. You guys, that's the program that we're involved in. That's what we get to be um, a part of. These youth that come through, they're going to look up to you, and you, you will be like everything. I've had to actually go back, it's not, um, part of my journey, as I'm going back through and asking to be equals, because there's no difference between me and my 12-year-old son. We're equal. His path is his, my path is mine. We're, we're both whole and complete. The age is different, but that's it. And so a lot of the times, people will put me in their God filing cabinet. Instead of their human filing cabinet, they're like, oh, can't be so cool. I'm going to put her up here. And as counselors and as leaders, as directors, the youth coming through, they're like, oh, Jordan Skousen. Holy cow. She is in my God filing cabinet. She <laughs> could do no wrong. She'll never mess up. And, and I just want to be just like her. That's actually not what we want. I thought that would feel pretty cool when I started doing this. It's actually not the way we want it. I, I want to be an equal with all of you because I am equal. I want to be equal with all the youth coming through. The little 12 and 13 year olds bouncing off the, the walls and climbing trees. I want to be equal with them. Instead of being above or below, I am working on being the same because we are the same. Our journeys are completely different and I'm learning to celebrate the differences. And so, if, by chance, I am in any of your God filing cabinet, I'm going to publicly ask you to take me off. Take me out of that, and please forgive me for, for wanting to be there if I ever did. I don't want to be there. That's not the place for me. I am not in that place. I am so human. I so make mistakes, and I'm learning to say I screwed up and, 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 and appreciate the heck out of it. And so going in as counselors and as leadership, if you find yourself wanting to, to be up above these youth, up above the other counselors in this room, catch yourself. 
We don't want to be up here and we don't want to be down here. And that's the struggle a lot of us will go through. Okay, so we want to come in as equals. And that's a, that's a huge piece for, for me and my journey. And I just, I was not planning on doing that. And so it was supposed to come out. So thank you for letting me be vulnerable and share that with you guys. Um, may I share with you all how this whole journey began? Okay, so when I was 14 years old, I went to, a, I loved it. We sang songs all the time. Everybody had code names. I had a counselor. <coughs> she had a, a fake name that we had to try to figure out the whole time. It, we, they put us in simulations, and they put us in, like, these group of trees with this, this wire up above, like, clear up here. And, and all of us girls were inside the group of trees, and they're like, okay, without talking... You have to get up and over the wire. And if you touch the wire, then you have to start over. If you talk, you have to start over. And so we're like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? This, this huge experience. And, and immediately I went down on the ground on my hands and knees and I'm like, crawl up, come on, get on top of me and climb up the tree. But we had to do it without talking. So we're like miming and doing all this stuff. And they're like, <laughs> start over. I'm like, okay. So all of these experiences started happening to me as a 14-year-old. And I had an impression while I was at that, at that camp that I would be working with the youth. And I'm like, that is really weird because I am the youth. <laughs> so why am I feeling like this? But I'm like, well, okay. If that's true, then I want to figure out why this is all working and how this is working and, and why they're doing it. And so I started interviewing the counselors. And then I interviewed the kitchen staff. And then I went to the top lady who had created Oakrest. And I'm like, tell me, with my piece of paper, I'm 14, tell me why you started Oakrest. She's like, you're 14. Go play. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm like, no, really. I want to know. I want to know. This is important to me. And so she sat and, and told me the purpose and her vision and why, why she was doing all this. And I took notes. And then I totally forgot about stuff like that. And years later, when I was married, we'd had Caitlin, our oldest, Tiffany, my sister, Tiffany Earl, love her, um, came to me and said, Cam, the youth need us. And right upon her saying that, I'm like, oh, I remember. I remember something about that. And she's like, they need to know everything that we wished we'd known when we were their, their age. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much. Well, if they would just know this and this and this. And so we started putting together. And my younger sister, Angie, came in. The three of us sisters just sat and wrote all the different things that we wished we had known when we were 12 and 14 and 16. And we put together this whole entire program. And back then it was called Youth for America. And Tiffany's like, let's just, let's just get a bunch of youth there. Let's try it out. Cam, you're the heart. We'll put you at the, the head. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> I, I don't, I, I'm a great follower. I'll, I'll follow you, Tiff. This would be great. And she's like, no, you're it. I'm like, that scares me. I never asked to be the leader of this. Ah! <laughs> and she set it up, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm seriously the director. Holy cow, here we go. And that was 14 years ago. We had 40 kids come. Some of them are in this room right now. And showed up and said, holy cow, this was amazing. And the next year we did it twice. The next year we did it four times. The next year we did it seven times. We've never marketed. It was just word of mouth. Everyone's going out and going, you have to be at this YFA stuff. What? What do you do? Oh, my gosh, I can't even explain. You just got to be there. Okay, I'll, I'll sign up. And so through the years, it's, it's come through the process. I've completely had to be out of my comfort zone for sure. Um, to be the one up front and to lead out. And I've learned so much. And that's, that's where YFF was, was born um, and become this, this conference that is so different than anything that's out there. And we are about leadership and education, the two together. So the youth read and study before they ever come to us. And they don't just study to, oh, that was a great book, and put it back on the shelf. Then they come to our conference, and they read, they, they talk about, oh, my goodness. 
when Ralph Moody did this for the first time in Little Britches, and he got up on his horse and he did this and this and this, holy cow, or what about when he was so sneaky? And his dad came in and he's like, I don't want a sneaky partner. You're out. Oh my gosh, how did that affect you? How can we use that in our lives? Are you guys sneaky partners? Do you ever feel like being dishonest and, and sneaking around the back door? Yeah, I do. Me too. Let's talk about that. Does it serve us? And so then we, we gather these kids and the books that they've read, we talk about principles from the book that they can apply to their own lives. And how everything, that, how sh it shifts everything. The, a huge part of the vision for, for Cammie, let's see, I am an excellent artist. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> see, what do you guys think it is? <laughs> see, I'm so good! I am amazing, it's totally a person. E.T. E. No! <laughs> no! That is not right! E.T. was swag. It's not E.T. Right. I saw the long neck <laughs> and the wide face. It's not a giraffe! It's not! Uh, <laughs> are you saying E.T. is in a person? Down, so gonna oh, have really okay. feet, okay? Now, yeah. uh, oh, now that's Tyrone! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. Okay. Oh my. Level one. <clears throat> Freedom starts inside of me. The vision of youth for freedom, level one, is inside. How do we become free? We look inside. We explore, we inquire, we ask questions. We're willing to take a look and we're willing to adjust and change things. Everything that's inside determines level two, which is the space around us. <laughs> my person is really flipping awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeehaw. Okay. <laughs> Level two, so when we become free on the inside, and we're gonna be discussing that clear up through YFF. So if you guys are totally confused, what does inside mean? Don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna totally be able to go there. Yeah, Ephraim. I, just, I heard something from uh, Wayne Dyer that I thought really, because everyone talks about like inside and loving yourself and all, and he said something that was so simple, yet it like really gives a perspective for that. And he said that when we, um, he said when you take an orange and you squeeze it, what you get is orange juice. And what you always get is what's inside, like no matter what it is. So when you take a person and like you squeeze it, you know, you put under stress or whatever, and what you get is what's inside. So if there's anger and sadness and whatever it is, that's what comes out. So that was, that, I love that. It's like, it's such a simple way to put it, but like, it makes sense. You squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. Okay, so. hug time. <laughs> what do we get when we hug each other? Holy cow. That, I love that. I Thanks. totally love that. Okay, this is a segue. I want you guys to, to hear this story. So two, it was over two years ago, I met Present Yourself, which is all about presenting. Kirk Duncan is teaching me body language and, and all about being up in front and how to organize and, and do that kind of stuff. And I put in a group with someone named Ephraim on the very last day, and I present, we have like 60 seconds to present on our message, and my message is all about youth for freedom, and, and t t teaching about these youth, and purpose, and, and all this kind of stuff, and Ephraim's like, wow, Cammy, I love your message, I love what you're doing, I want to hear about this YFF, and the next year, he's like, okay, hey, tell me about this YFF, how can I be involved, I want, I want a piece of this, and I'm like, man, Ephraim, you should become a counselor, and just come see what this Youth for Freedom is, because it is amazing. And he totally, like, was amazing, like, in his presentation, I'm like, who is this guy? Holy cow. And there, there was this connection made. And he wasn't able to be a counselor that year, and, and we lost touch, and a couple years goes by. So, two months ago, I get this text. Cammy, it's Ephraim. Tell me about YFF. I'm like, Ephraim! Come be a counselor. Come. I really want you to be a part of my program. I want, I want you to see what this is. It's amazing. And I feel like we have this, this chemistry. Something is supposed to happen with the two of us together. 
there's something that we're going to build. And he's like, well, let's talk on the phone. And so from the time I met him to the time that I'm talking now, his whole life has shifted. He's, he's moved. Now he is mentoring. Oh, let's just give you an idea. One of his 22 clients who he just had in a, in a retreat is paying him a million dollars to mentor him and his entire company, these major business people, over the next three years. And I'm like, oh, and I asked you to be a counselor. <laughs> I'm like, hi, Ephraim, you've totally changed. <laughs> I'm like, about that. And he's like, let's think, I want to be a part of this. I want to see. I want to know what this YFF is. I, I feel like there's something in this for me. And he's like, I'm reaching out to you because... I empower people, and I know that you empower the youth. He's like, I'm all about that. He's like, I am willing to mentor you and come and empower you and your leaders in order to make this program be what it's supposed to be. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, Ephraim's going to mentor me, and he's going to, oh, okay, yeah, that would be great. Would be great. <laughs> totally. Yes, I would, I would appreciate that. So, <laughs> Ephraim happens to be in our midst today and at our entire training today, and that's who you just heard from. And if you didn't take notes on what he just said, like that is empowering. And we get to hear from him later on today. But just so you know, that's Ephraim. <laughs> Can we give a round of applause, Ephraim? I so love that. Like, I'm going to see the hugs that we give. Like, seriously, I'm just going to squeeze whatever's inside you. I'm going to squeeze it out and see what it is. <laughs> and if it's, if it's ick, is that okay? Don't do it in here. Don't do it. We're going to do a lot of squeezing. And, and I'll show you some different directions on how to do that. But that is beautiful. It is okay if it's icky what comes out because we don't want it inside. So we do want to squeeze the heck out of it and get it out and start over. What? No, because that's what that's, she was saying. That's what sort she was saying. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. Expound, oh, go ahead. Just a bit. Um, if you're squeezing it, at least it's coming out. And if it's bad, rather you have that and then you replace it with something and then have it fester inside. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what, we, if, if it's lemon juice that we're, is coming out and we don't want lemon juice and we want orange, let's squeeze that out and put in orange juice because we have that power, right? And so it's interesting, uh, when, I, when I get to address this later on today, I'll totally, that is absolutely where I'm going with that. Okay, so the space Wait, around can us. I, can I yeah. say something that just uh, occurred to me? So like when you, when you did the lemon thing, I'm like, well, technically like a lemon and an orange, like they're totally different. Like you'd have to change their natures. And I think that's where God comes in because God can change our very natures. Mm -hmm. So like we get it out and then we say, God, this is what I want to be. Exactly. Can you help me? Become that. Become that and, and make the shift. And that's what you were saying earlier, right? Because us by ourselves, we just might be a lemon. <laughs> but he totally has the power. And so much of that is right here. Our thinking. Our, who we are like, is determined on, on our thinking. It starts right there on our thoughts. Our space around us. So how do we know our thoughts? How do we know what's inside us? Take a look at the space around you. Um, think about how your car looks. Think about your, oh, I'm here getting some, <laughs> <laughs> flip, 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 why did she say my car? <laughs> Take a look at your closet, your bedroom. Okay, those are, those are immediate things that are space around you. So when I was mentoring this week, I took my, <laughs> my poor daughter, I took my mentee down. I said, I'd like to show you what, like a mentoring tool. And so I had, I showed her my 13 year old daughter's Room, <laughs> which is the space around Caitlin, which is a nightmare. <laughs> all of her clean clothes are all over the place. For her to find one outfit, she has to go through 17 things, and it's all over the place. She comes out, and she's like, oh, I found what I'm going to wear. And I'm like, but your room, but your room. She's like, ah, oh, later, later. So I, sh I brought this mentee down to see, the, see her room, right? I can tell by looking at the space that is around you, what's going on here. That can be frightening. That can be frightening. Yeah, Mark? Some perspective. To you, or to an outsider, that looks maybe looks like a nightmare, but to 
the person in it, it's normal. That doesn't look out of place because that's how I am in my space. And only until they start asking for help from an outside perspective will it begin to change their own perspective and be able to see, oh, okay, I can start to maybe tidy this up a little bit. Totally true. Thank you for pointing that out. That's exactly right. Our, our space around us, if we start in level two, which it, it's a great idea to start all, in all three areas, okay? But if we start in level two and we still have, and we're still made of lemons, you know, on the inside of us, eventually it's going to, the space around us is going to go right back to what's comfortable to us and what's normal, what we feel okay with. And so I can clear off the, the t coffee table in my front room. I can clear it off in about three minutes later. My family will have 14 things on it. I'm like, mm, I just cleaned that cake. Uh, let's go four minutes. Let's go four minutes without anything and we'll all just sit there. Perfect. We did it. We did it. So, okay, the space around us. You take a look at, at what's going on in the space around us. Yes. I was just going to say, I think it's really important that even if, our space is a mess. Like we know that we're kind of a mess inside, but that we're okay with ourselves. Yeah. And recognize that as we become more okay with ourselves, we can change. Because if we're not okay totally with ourselves, true. then it keeps us from being able to make. Changes. We'll can we'll contain the icky. Mm -hmm. Like if I if I drop into shame because I have a really hard time keeping my room clean, that's gonna keep this like black all over it. There's mm -hmm. no way for me to shift. So that's huge. I've got to be okay with, yep, I'm, I'm a mess, and I'm going to take a look. And maybe it's one thing that I can do different. Maybe it's a junk drawer that I can clean out today and put into order. Yeah, Ephraim. This is just where I love the work from Byron Katie. You know, it's like so often we want to look at something and we think that it's a mess and it should be another way. Yeah. And, you know, it's, um, it's just that's a painful way to live. Yeah. But if I can look at it and it's a mess and, a, and I can just, it's a, mess, it, it's a mess and it should be another way, is that true? I love, are you guys familiar with Byron Katie's work? My, my leaders are working on her book. Okay, write this down. Loving what is. That's the book title by Byron Katie. It's good, huh, Laura? <laughs> spell that? Yep. Loving what is by Byron Katie. My oh, suggestion. Oh. <laughs> hey, love what is. Ba ba <laughs> <laughs> that is not our purpose to make fun. Um, loving what is. My suggestion is do the audiobook. She does a lot of interviews and she's actually talking to the people and you can hear them crying and laughing and 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 seeing the complete turnaround. Her whole. Her whole thing, she's got four questions that she asks you. It's all about changing the thinking. Not shifting the thought, but understanding the thought differently. Thoughts are like raindrops. They just come. We can't control those. But what we do is we grab onto a thought, and, and then we attach it to it because we tell stories about it. We're such good storytellers. Oh, my goodness. And, and so, yeah, you've, you've got, you're catching your story right now. <laughs> Counselor trainings rip on me. What the <laughs> heck? <laughs> um, and so what she what she does is guides you through. Is it true? Is it true? Can you absolutely know that that's true? And she, what she she's a huge help to clear up level one. And so we're going to be using her stuff. I've got all the session directors, all the leaders are are listening to her stuff. That is a huge recommendation of mine. Doing the audible and listening to what she's teaching, it is a complete rewrite. And just accepting what is. And, and how my room is right now, I just accept it. And I love who I am right now. This is who I am. And it goes right along with what you were saying, Zach. OK. And we'll get, we'll get more into to that stuff um, as, we, as we go through the different training. Level three is the results in our life. That's everything else. It's the relationships we have. It's the relationships we don't have. It's the 
the money we have, the money we don't have. It's the everything else. It's what's in our bank account. It's, it's the job that we have. It's the job that we want to have. All of the different results that are showing up in our life are level three. Freedom. What is youth for freedom? Freedom is in all three areas. We start here and move here and become. This is becoming. So we, we talk about our identity. Then we go move into connection, which is our relationships with each other, our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with God. And then we find our direction and the path that we want to head on. And then we, we are becoming, which is the results. And results don't lie. But we can change them. We have the power to change them. And so <clears throat> the vision for, for Youth for Freedom is to get clear and, and learn to love ourselves and to be loved by others. And one of the songs that Terry Hawkins came and taught us, we're going to... We're going to sing it right now, because um, then when, when we are with our youth, we're also going to sing it with them. And it is so empowering to me. Like, every time I sing that, my favorite way to hear it right now is, is uh, I have a little niece who was born at 27 weeks. And so she stayed in the NICU for, like, months, months and months. And then she went up to Primary Children's Hospital for m months and months. And she's she's able to get outside like she's able to talk and communicate and and do things like that but i taught her this song and so every time she sees me she starts singing love myself so much so i can love you so much and she goes so much so you can love you so much so you can start loving me okay so we're gonna sing yes you guys all want to sing okay so let's start the, the first I love myself so much, so I can love you so much. Okay, start over. I love myself so much, so I can love you so much. Now this is the tricky part, because the first time I heard it, I'm like, what? So you can love you so much. Because it's, I love myself so much, so I can love you so much. So you can love you so much. So you can start loving me. And the more I get into that song and start understanding the depth of that, I'm like, wow, I have to be able to love myself in order to allow you to love me. Is that cool? And that's same with trust and that's same with value. I have to trust myself in order to trust you and in order to, let, to be trusted by you. And same with value, okay? So start again. I love myself so much. So I can love you so much. So you can love you so much. So you can start loving me. Okay, start again. I love myself so much. So I can love you so much. So you can love you so much. And you can start loving me. Okay, find a partner. You're gonna sing right into their eyes. Here we go. Getting uncomfortable. Okay, look right in their eyes. We're going to sing right to them. Okay. I love myself so much, so I can love you so much. So you can love you so much, so you can start loving me. One more time. I love myself so much, so I can love you so much. So you can love you so much. So you can start loving me. Okay, stand up. Find a new partner. <laughs> find a new partner. I want you to look right in their eyes. <laughs> okay, so... The vision, of, so the vision of Youth for Freedom is becoming free on so many different levels, starting here and moving outward. We, we can learn to be personally free, so that we can be free within our families, so that we can be free within our communities, and then it grows and grows, and within the government, and within, you know, it gets bigger and bigger. And the, the more we are educated and practice being leaders, and understand 
these three levels and work on them, the freedom that comes and the peace that comes is ginormous. So there is the, the overall vision of Youth for Freedom. And Say Go We Do is the theme that we, that we have encapsulated that allows for the direction from up here. And for those people who don't believe in God, then it's direction from the universe. And for those people who think that the mountain is their higher power, perfect. Let the mountain speak to them and impress them, impress upon their mind that, hey, maybe you should smile at her today. Hey, have you called so-and-so yet this morning? Hey, your roommate could really use a hug today. Those types of impressions that serve you and serve someone else are called Say Go Be Do. And I'm going to bring up someone that I really admire and I'm so grateful for his mission and his purpose and, and direction. He understands um, what the world needs on a greater level. And he's, he's, I'm so excited that he's going to explain to us the different shifts that we just created in YFF for this year because we've changed each of the themes. He's going to give you a vision from, from the director. Also, I want to let you guys know that in Missouri, right now, we have a Youth for Freedom going on out there this summer, and today they're holding their first training too, and so just send goodness their way, and we're excited for them. They might be able to Skype in a little bit later to, for us to be able to say hi, and, and they don't want to miss out on Ephraim, what he's going to share with us today too. Um, help me bring up Oliver Jamil. <laughs> get into what I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about this right here for a second. Um, giving your 100%. For me, that's, that's why we're all here. Right? She talks about these three levels. Right? We have to find out where we are in ourselves, who we are, and why we're that person, and what, that, what it means to be that person. So we can go out, affect the immediate space around us, so that we can affect everything else in the world. Right? We have an effect that each of us is supposed to create. And if we're not giving our 100%, we're only going to create maybe 80% of that effect. Right? Or 20%. However much we're giving is as much effect as we can have. Does that make sense? So one of the other things she mentioned is 100% looks very different for different people. Right? She's talking about, I, I, she asked, you know, I, I always have to wonder if people are taking notes are they just trying to get out of the question, right? Um, we need to be careful very often in, in Youth for Freedom with so many youth, so many different kinds of people that we empower people's version of giving their 100% as opposed to try to mold them to our version, right? I am not as flamboyant and happy and excited as Cammie is all the time, right? My 100% looks very different than Cammie's 100%, right? I have, I, I know somebody who, who was a counselor in the past and she, she sometimes was super excited and sometimes wasn't and she was frustrated sometimes when people would say, oh, are you giving your 100%? And she'd be like, yes. And they're like, I don't believe it. <laughs> and she'd be like, what do you want me to do? If I stand up and I cheer like you and I'm not taking my notes, I'm failing my 100% because I need those notes, right? This isn't a diss on Kevin's thing before. But, <laughs> We need to make sure that each of us is giving our true 100%. And I say this both as, as counselors and administrators don't call other people on. As, like she said, only the person can know if they're giving their 100%. So on the one hand, don't, don't try to force people to give your version. On the other hand, don't try to match whatever version that Cami or I or your session director or somebody is doing. Don't try to match their 100%. Find out what your 100% is and do that. What we need is not a bunch of counselors that are that are clones of Cammy Mitchell going around and, and that talking to scary. <laughs> <laughs> we might have an inner energy overload, like <laughs> oh, that, you could see YFF from space with all those. <laughs> what we do need is each of you to figure out what is your number one? What is your level one? Who are you? Why are you that person? What does it mean to be you? 
And what does your 100% look like as that person? And give that thing. Okay. I'm really glad you put all this up here. I wasn't going to talk about this specifically. I was going to talk about things that relate to this. And now I have this up here. <laughs> Is this what I use to erase yes. some things? Okay. I need to erase some things and not others. Sorry to get rid of this. It must go. <laughs> all right. So, before we even get to some of the changes we're making this year, I want to kind of preface it with, with level one. How do we change, if, we, if we, look at, we look at where we're at, we say, this is who I am, and we accept that, we say, okay, here's where I am, and it's good, and it's powerful, and I'm here for reasons, and, it's, and, and I should be here right now. And then the next step is we say, who do I want to be? Who does God want me to be? Who should I be? to have the true effect that I want to have on my family, on my friends, on my youth at Youth for Freedom, on the world, wherever, wherever it is, to have the effect that I want to have on this world, who do I need to be, right? You have to ask this, that question, not just who I am I now, but then who do I want to be tomorrow, okay? And to change that, there's this little process that happens. You have Information, okay? It starts with information. To get to this changing of everything, you have to have the right info go into your brain and eventually, so it can eventually come out as action, right? Before we can say, oh, before we can go and, and speak to that person and, or do whatever the thing is that we need to do, say we need to create a gift for our youth because that's the thing that's really gonna help them or we need to talk about this one principle. We have to know that. Before we can act on any information, we have to have that information in the first place, okay? Once you have information, that leads to your thoughts. Right? I want to say thinking. Information creates your thinking. The way you think, the level at which you can, you can have different thoughts, allow you to better affect the people around you. Okay. Thinking, let me go through this kind of quick. Thinking creates habit. And habits eventually create our results. Okay. So if we change the information so we can change our thinking, these two, and actually all the way to here, are all inside level one. Right? Our habits already start affecting directly level two. Over time, because of the information we get, the way it changes the way we think and the way we act, it changes our habits, which changes everything around us, whether we're meaning to or not. Whatever habits we have are changing our environment and things outside of our, our view or our control without us knowing it. So whether you know it or not, you're having an effect on the world. Make sure, at the beginning, you know what it is, okay? You know what effect you want to have. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. I'm going to get rid of that. Okay. I have a vision, right? Or as Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream, right? <laughs> I have a dream for Youth for Freedom. I have a dream of thousands and thousands of youth who live one particular principle every day of their lives because of Youth for Freedom. And I believe that as we achieve that, as we have these youth living this one principle, they will naturally, and through the, the high level of, of mastery of this principle, they will naturally find everything else that they need to be the successful, powerful people they need to be, to find out who they are now, who they want to be, and make the important changes that they need to in their lives to have the results that they want to have on the world. However big or small that be for each individual. Some people, the results they want to change are in their family, and that's, that's what really matters to them. Some people, it's in their larger community, some people, it's worldwide, and everything in between, right? But each of us has something powerful to do 
We have to figure out what that is. So here's the principle. It's kind of awesome. <laughs> Fine. It's called the find, learn, do. It's a process. Some of you may have noticed the, in your counselor manual, if you turn to a certain page in there, one of the first ones, three or four, I don't know. <laughs> it talks about the different sessions and the names for them. It has a short four. description of what they are. Page four, Julie says. Okay. Look at session three. It's called Define, Learn, Do. Okay. Can I borrow some of your manual real quick? Thanks, Julie. says, this is a simple yet powerful process to finding and achieving your dreams. Who in here has a dream? Something they'd like to accomplish in this life, right? I'm so glad that people have dreams. It's no fun if you just sit around life and you have nothing you want to accomplish. It is super lame. So, real quick, I was going to go on. But I want to know somebody's dream. Who has, a, who has a cool dream they want to share? Amanda. I want a strong family. I want a strong family. Mine might sound kind of selfish, but it's really not, I promise. Okay. <laughs> I work as a financial advisor, and my dream is to make a lot of money so that I can help other people. Like if I see somebody, and they don't, like they have a ton of kids, and they're in a line to buy food, I can just pay for it and be like, there you go, don't worry about it, and then just leave before they even see me. Like just anything like that, because my family grew up struggling money-wise my whole life, and I didn't even know it was an issue. Like we lived out of a camp trailer, and we had to heat up water and bathe in our swimming suits with my like brothers <laughs> because that was the only means we had. And so I want to be able to help people like people helped us when we were in our time of need. I don't think that's a selfish dream at all. But it is when you just say, I want to make a lot of money. People are like, oh, you're selfish. And it's like, no, there's reasons behind it. It's not just, I want to make a lot of money. <laughs> money's, a, money's an important tool to affect powerful change. Sometimes when you define, this is who I am, and these are the results I want in life, you're gonna say, oh, that means I need billions of dollars. You guys realize that Mother Teresa was a billionaire? She had billions of dollars flowing through her, her things. She kept almost nothing. But people gave her million dollar checks multiple times. And they'd come back to her repeatedly and give her money over and over and over. And she said, it's not enough for me to sit at home and, and give bread to the, the few orphans on my block. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of orphans in, on this planet, and they all need me. And, for, and so she would walk in to corporate executives' offices and say, I need money, because this, this is what I need to do. It's not selfish to say, I need to change the world. I need to help people, and for that I need resources. Anyway, that's cool. Who else has a cool dream? I know you all have cool dreams. Who wants to share a cool dream? <laughs> so, um, a dream that I have is I've gone through a process where I have found true happiness and true connection to my higher power, and it's the most happiness I've ever felt. And I want to be able to help others find that with themselves, to find that better world that they're all dreaming of. Nice. I like it. Laura? I want to be able to see truth and to be with truth. Nice. <laughs> Liza. Um, I want to liberate the captive by educating the ignorant, and I want to do that through writing. Okay, real quick, I have to mention, isn't it cool how one, like, a couple people at the beginning sharing their dreams, and now everybody's like, ooh, I dream too. <laughs> <laughs> I got cool. <laughs> this is one of the things I want, I, we have to create for the youth. Share your hopes and your dreams with your youth. Make an environment where it's not just okay, but it's expected for them to have a dream, to want something big, and to go out and achieve it. There is nothing more empowering than being in a group of people who all just assume that everybody there is going to achieve their dreams. And they assume, oh, if you need help, I'm there. Why not? I've got a dream. You've got a dream. I need help. You need help. Sounds good. Let's go. Cammie. It's interesting how we put, like, sometimes we feel like, oh, I don't have an important dream like that. Or that dream's way bigger than mine. I have to remember, like, one of my dreams is to help create a smile 
on my little mm. children's faith. And to understand that what we're living right now is part of our dream. Make what you're doing right now part of your dream. And not, not oh wow, you have this amazing thing, you're gonna change the whole wide world, and I, oh man, I just stay home and change diapers. Holy cow, you change someone's diaper. And you raise that little child. Or you, you know, all of the different things that we're involved in, in in our lives can be our dreams and our purpose. And we can become passionate about it. It's important not to compare. And that's why at first when he said, let's hear your dreams, everyone's thinking, my dream's not big enough. I'm not cool enough to have a dream like what Oliver just described. Bull crap. So my dream is to make a lot of orange juice using the principle that... <laughs> yes. I like it. I like it. One of my favorite stories of any, anybody's dream is about a guy who, who made cookies. Okay? That was, his, that was his thing. And he just made cookies. And he made really good cookies. And he made such good cookies that people wanted to buy his cookies. And he ended up, years later, selling his business... His cookie making business for millions of dollars because he made such stinking good cookies. But it started with, you know, I like cookies. <laughs> <laughs> it was that simple. Okay? <laughs> so everybody's got a dream. And I like another part of it that's important is so often we look at this dream and we say, it's for that thing off on the horizon. One day I'll get there. Okay? How many of you guys realize that what we're doing right now affects? directly affects all the youth that are going to be at Youth for Freedom. Even though they're not here yet. A bunch of them that haven't signed up about it, for it at all yet. A bunch of them that have never heard of Youth for Freedom yet, but will actually be there at the conference. We're affecting them right now. So even though our goal is for after the conference, these are what the youth are going to have. Right now, long before the conference, our actions already affect our purpose. And that's the true, true with any dream you have, you can do something every day to get you somehow closer to it. Even if it's just, well, I need to prepare myself more for when I get there. There's something you need to do every day to fuel your dream, your purpose, your passion. Okay? So back to the principle of to find learn do. My dream, I said there's one principle. My dream is that every youth that goes home from YFF, from Youth for Freedom, understands and lives this principle every day of their lives. Okay? The first step, this is a, a, a three-step process, right? First step is to find. You have to ask yourself, A, who am I? Right? Who am I now? Who do I want to be in the future? What does it look like for Oliver James DeMille the Fifth to be victorious in his life? If I look down the, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on my deathbed, and I can say, wow, did it. What does that mean? What, what, what is the it? What did I do? Who was I? Who did I affect? Who was, who were my friends? Who were my, what does that mean? You have to define your happiness, your victory, your purpose, your mission. All of that. I'm not just, I'm, those aren't just synonyms. Those are all different things that you should define. What is my God-given purpose is different from what do I generally want to do for fun? It's different than, what kind of spouse do I want to have? How much money do I want to make? How much, they all affect each other, they're interconnected. But don't just think you only define one little facet of your life and then base your whole life off of that. The bigger your definition, the more things you define, the more power you can have in everything else you do in your life. Make sense? So once you define, you figure out, what is your victory? What are your victories? Because there's lots of them, okay? And let's say, how do I do that? If I'm going to have that victory, what do I need to know? What, what skills do I need? What knowledge do I need in order to achieve that thing? Whatever it is. The best way to learn that is from people who already have that. Right? If you say, I want to be a great father, what you don't do is just sit and hope that somehow <laughs> the knowledge comes into your brain by osmosis, from some stump talking, I don't know what, how it's going to come. What you do is you go and you watch people who are great fathers, 
maybe your father, maybe a friend's father, maybe your grandfather, maybe a friend, you find people who have the results that you want, you figure out what they did, so that when you are a father, you can do what they did that got them their results. Okay? Another great source of that is books. Okay? Is you can do it through movies, you can do it whatever it is, but you look at people, real or fictional, who had the results that you wanted and how they got them. And you learn what they did so you can apply what they did. Okay? Now, you never get to step three if you don't do something in step two. Okay? For me, you have this, this direct space around you that includes the actions. Every time I create an action, I do something outside of myself, it directly changes my environment around me. Right? So for me, action falls in the second level. Okay? If you never do anything, you just know all this stuff. You know how to be a great father, but you apply none of the principles you had, and you're actually a crappy father, you're failing, I'm sorry. You have to apply the things that you learned, okay? So it's a three-step process. Define your victory, learn from people who have the results you want, and do what they did to achieve those results, okay? Any questions, any comments? Snide remarks? You can keep to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, just pointing out, like, it sounds really simple, but so many times we do this backwards, and we just, like, act without purpose and without intention, and we, you know, and we, then we define ourselves based on what we are doing, what we are, not, not what we want to be. Um, so, I don't know, for me, I've heard of this principle before, and when I, when I first heard it, I kind of had to sit down and have like a really big come to myself moment where I was like, oh, these are all the places in my life where I'm just doing and letting it define me. So, like, I don't know. It, I just like would encourage everybody to sit down and like assess where you're doing this and where you're not because yeah. it, it makes sense. But sometimes we don't realize how the world has already gotten to us. Yeah, it's horrible when you go backwards and you realize one day you, you have this little crisis and you're like, man, why aren't I happy? Oh, it's because I want these, these results, these dreams, and I'm not getting them. Why am I not getting them? And you're like, oh, dang it. It's horrible when the answer is because I'm too busy doing something I don't care about. Whatever that be, whether it be you're sitting and watching TV all your life, whether it be you're stuck in a job you hate that has nothing to do with your dreams or passions, whether it be whatever it is, if you're stuck doing a whole bunch of things that don't get you to your passion, your purpose, your, your victories, your definition of true success and happiness, it's really sad for everybody involved. For you, because you can't be fully fulfilled, and for the people that you would have helped had you gone the right direction and figured out from the beginning. There's that, that cliche phrase of begin with the end in mind. It's cliche because it's awesome. It's been repeated so many times. <laughs> begin with the end in mind. Figure out what your happy ending is. <laughs> to go even more cliche. <laughs> 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 Figure out what it looks like. And then learn it and then do it. Laura. Like, shouldn't this be incorporated into all of them? Like you said that it is, but why is this specifically session threes? Okay, good question. So, now we're going to go into, more specifically, changes this year. Awesome. So you can see, for those of you that have been with Youth for Freedom for a while, um, we changed the names and the themes of the sessions this year. Um, session one is now focused solely on Say go be do, which Cammy talked about before, which for me is the principle of action. Not just action, but the habit of seeking out what the right thing to do in any given situation is and doing that. However it is that you find that, find it and do it. Most of the time it comes from a higher power, whatever that higher power be for you. In any given moment, there's something that you could do that would make all the difference. What is it? If it's within your power, go do it. 
Tammy, you have Can I share an experience? Yeah. Okay. So, I've been teaching Sego video for how many years? 14. Oh yeah, 14. You'd think I'd have it down, right? Oh my goodness. So this week, I had an experience, and I think I it happened to, to learn <laughs> from me. No. Okay, so Mark and I were talking in our bedroom. It was a nighttime. My son comes into the bedroom and says, Mom, did you park the van in the garage? Because it's freezing in the morning, it's all iced over, and I take my kids to, to school early. And I'm like, oh, I haven't parked in the garage yet. I'm like, and then just open the garage, and I'll pull the, pull the van in. He's like, okay. So he goes and opens the garage. And in that moment, the first impression came. To either go pull the van in right now, or shut the garage. And I'm like, so I stood up to just go do it right then. And I looked at Mark, and he's like, because we're in this deep conversation that once you get married, you just have to have those conversations where I'm apologizing to him for not being present and, and not, um, he offered to help me. And then I got busy doing something else. And so we're in this and he's like, I'm, listen, I'm vulnerable right now. We're having this conversation. I'm like, ah, oh, I can't leave this conversation. I can't let him down again. So I'm not going to be pulling the van in right now. So my thought was, okay, either have Andon close the garage, and now Andon had gone to the front room, so I'm like, oh, I don't want to yell to Andon to have him come back and shut the garage, because I just had him open the garage. I'm like, oh, and, I, and I'm like, Mark, just make sure that I remember to pull the van in the garage. And he's like, okay. And so we're talking. Another impression comes. At least have Andon bring you the keys to the car so that you know what you're gonna do after this conversation. And I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> because then I would look down after the conversation and go, why am I holding, oh, the van, I'm gonna pull the van in. And then the justification came. Well, I'm talking to Mark, this is a serious conversation, Andon's in the front room, if I yell to Andon to bring me the car keys, Mark might get mad at me, because we're in this conversation, and. Uh, I'll just remember to park the van in the garage once we're done, right? Okay, so we have finished having our conversation, and we're like, okay, we're okay, we all can make up, and then we go in the, in the kitchen and get, get busy on taxes. And then um, I clean the kitchen, now Anne's gone to bed, the kids are, every, we've had scriptures, prayers, everybody's gone to bed. I go into my bedroom and soundly sleep on my pillow, while the thief is so grateful that I left the garage door open for him so that he or she could come in and take bicycles and Mark's power tools that he got for Christmas and like he seriously would have had to carry this big huge a lot, a lot of things walked out of our garage that night while I slept on my pillow and in the morning I wake up <gasps> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you listen to my stories. I love it. I love telling you stories. I'm like, I'm like, Mark, oh my gosh, I forgot to park the van in the garage. He's like, I know, honey, I know. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I was gonna, I was, and he's like, it's okay. We lost a bicycle. We lost the, my power tools. We lost, I'm like, Mark, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It was all of these Sego we do's. All of them, not just one, like very different, different. They came to me, if, the, if you're not going to do it this way, if you're not going to do it. I'm sitting there praying for protection, praying for guidance, praying for, for help from the other side. It's coming, and it's coming, and it's coming. And I'm like, I know better than you. I'll remember myself. And Andon comes to me in the morning. He's like, Mom, oh, as I was opening the garage door, I felt terrible about it. I was just going to shut it. But then I thought you'd get mad at me because I'd be disobeying. And so I opened it for you. And then I went in the front room and I felt horrible about it. But I didn't do anything. And so we're all, <laughs> oh, man, we're all getting these impressions and say go be do's And all of us just decided that we knew better and to not worry about it. And because of that, we lost a lot of stuff. 
And so I'm like, oh my goodness, like I'm teaching Sego We Do all the time and they're happening. You guys, it's happening to us all the time. If you don't feel like you get those impressions, ask for them. And notice when you're justifying out of something, that's a red flag to go back and say, I had a Sego We Do because I'm already saying she won't even care if I call her. And besides that, it's been three years. That's justifying out of the, the impression we just got to make a phone call to so-and-so. Does that make sense? So I learned a lot that night. I forgave myself. Um, my eight-year-old's like, is daddy so mad at you? <laughs> I'm like, no, daddy's okay with mommy. He's like, it's just a good thing it was my bike, mom. <laughs> Nathan, I'm sorry. And Caitlin, whose bike was dull, and she's like, you know what? They obviously needed it more than I do. Aww. I'm like, Caitlin? You're awesome. <laughs> She's been listening to Byron Katie. <laughs> Loving what is. So th that totally shifted. Um, but I understand, like, that is what, and it's not just, oh, now I got sick, I'll be doing down, we're, we're good. It's a daily thing and on a daily basis. So let me share that experience so that you guys can learn from. And Cammie, can I just yeah. point out, one, it's obvious to see like that part of the impact is that you got stuff taken out of your garage and that stuff's gone, but the other impact that like kind of goes unnoticed, and I'm sure there's more if we look, but one of the things that even kind of goes unnoticed is that like you're having this conversation with Mark, and I don't know if I'm the only one thinking this back here, but I'm going, how in the world were you talking to him with all this going on in your head? <laughs> <laughs> well, how were you listening to him? Like, it's almost impossible to actually just be with him and be present with all that other stuff. Yeah. The impact is like, then you're not even, you're not doing not either, either thing. Yeah. I totally was not doing either. So I let both. Mark's like, thank you, E for me. <laughs> it's totally true. Interesting. Interesting. Holy cow. Like, just being present and in that place, do it like... Taking care of, of the first thing, yeah, Laura. Something I like about this story is how if you followed the impression, how you would never would have known how important it was. If you had just said, hey, I'm in close the garage, you know, and you, mm -hmm. if you just would have yelled to him something that simple, yeah. you never would have known the consequences and have realized or even recognized it as a say obedi You might not have even realized it. And totally. that's how subtle understanding, you know, like our thought process and, you know, like what is and what should be or... Yeah. You know, like where you want to be. That's beautiful. Well, it's interesting. If I had just done that, I would have been able to be present in the conversation with Mark. If I had just acted, which t it was so simple, so simple. Every single one of the things was so simple to ask Anton to reshut it, to have him bring my keys to me, like all those things would have taken three seconds. And then I really could have been clear and present instead of, ah, uh, ah, uh, I know I'm going to forget this. I got, ah, uh, uh, what's going to happen? Because we've been, Things have been taken from our garage several times. We're not, you know, we're not newbies to that. And so, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for putting that up. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking, because um, I'm going to school to get a degree in communications, and uh, some of the things they teach us in our classes is that sometimes we need to um, say what we're thinking and not what we want to say. Ooh. Yeah. And it, because I've, I've had hearts to hearts heart to heart with people, kind of like you and Mark, yeah. Mark were having. And something I've learned is that sometimes you're thinking to yourself, I want to be here for Mark so he knows that I love him and I want to listen to what he's saying. Mm -hmm. But you can't be fully present thinking about all those other things. Right. And just take two seconds and be like, you know what, I love you and I want to be fully present, but right now I'm thinking about this and this and this. Can I take 10 seconds, take care of him so I can listen to you? And I've had many mistakes <laughs> where I'm sitting there thinking about something else, and because I am, I'm missing everything they're saying. Yeah. Well, that's... Just take 10 seconds and be like, let me take care of this. Let me go pee or whatever. Right. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's taking, that's taking my mind off of you. you. Yeah. And, right. and Katie, Byron Katie's teach it. She's like, you can only do one thing at a time. And what I was doing wasn't being present with Mark. It was worrying that I hadn't taken care of the impression that had come. That's beautiful. Just acknowledging, and that's something that Ephraim is teaching me, acknowledging that. Just saying, can you hold on? Just say, I am so not here right now. Just give me a few seconds to take care of something in my mind or something out here so that I can fully be present. 
because oh my gosh when someone's fully present and you have their whole soul their eyes everything everything changes and so that that is a huge point did someone have yeah oh. i'll go here <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah yeah who wants to go first okay you're first um one thing that's come to my mind is how great time. life really is because even though you made these mistakes, even though we make all of these mistakes and we fail at things sometimes, um, there's just so many great lessons to learn from this one mistake hmm. that you made. And it's the same with all the mistakes that we ever make. So we really don't have to go through life fearing mistakes, fearing failure. We, um, we can almost embrace it sometimes wow. and learn from it and better ourselves because of it. I love it. Well, and I wouldn't have even thought about what you just brought to my mind. Because I was, the stuff that walked out, me not li listening to the impressions, that was like, can I teach this stuff? Come on, I gotta, I gotta get better at this. And if I had, but holy cow, what a whole new level just by sharing it with you guys. And the stuff that you guys are learning, because I made a mistake and I'm willing to, to make them and accept it, that's a whole new world for me. Because I've made them my whole life. But I haven't been willing to accept them. And so I just have shamed myself and put myself in a corner and said, don't, don't go around to people. Don't be in front of people. Don't answer your phone. They don't deserve to have you in their lives right now. Anybody relate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, sh the shame laughter. I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I would just put myself in a corner and time out before instead of saying, you guys, I totally made a mistake. And this is what happened. And this is what I want to learn from it. And holy cow. And you now you guys are teaching me even at a whole new level that I didn't see myself. That's awesome. So a different way to look at it that's happy for you is that you really wanted to be there for your husband. Instead of wanting to put something else over his emotions, you're like, no, I want to be here for him. I told him I'd be present. So what if you lost a bicycle? Your husband knows you love him. <laughs> and he would know it even more if I, if I was willing, because it yeah. could have been a win-win. Right. If I had taken care of the Sago video, but hopefully, you know, but at least he like, does know that I chose him in that yeah, in that and moment. Yeah, like you cared about him enough to be like, okay, I need to be present. Right yeah, now. Yeah, there's a different scenario that might have been a little bit there for you guys. <laughs> yeah. But it's still happy to see that you were like, no, I care about his emotions. I want to be here. So it was like that personal struggle of, I want to be here for him. I need to listen to this. I don't know what to do. Yeah. So. Now I just learned how to totally get them all in the, in the same thing. Sorry. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Sorry. He's going to cut me off. Back, back, back to Oliver. So <laughs> Literally, we could talk about this for the rest of our lives, and we'd find more stuff. Except that we might forget a bunch of Sago be doos because we were just talking about this. Uh, um, can, I, can I add one thing? Yes. Incredible sharing, and thanks for what you shared. And, I'll, and your, your sharing was so perfect, like just saying what was there. And like the next step of that might even be like something... I don't know what the concern was. If you look, there's a concern underneath that. Yeah. Like The concern would be like, if I go and do that, then he think, he'll think I, I don't love him or something, whatever the con I don't know what it was. I'm just making that up. Yeah. And just saying that. But he'll think he's Like, that's important. actually, there'd be an openness and a connectedness and a vulnerability that wouldn't have been there. Like, I really want to be present with you. And I just keep thinking about closing the garage door. And, I, and what is there for me is I think if I go and close the garage door or if I handle that, then you'll think that you're not important to me. Mm. And I want you to know you are important to me. And the reason I want to do it is so I can be here and be present with you. Wow. Like kind of just the next. Wow. And then he would, it would leave him really getting that. You know, he would really get, okay, yeah, she really does she care. She does. Yeah. And she's willing to do really that rich, and yeah. be vulnerable with me in order to be present and yeah. show me that I'm important to her. It's so simple. I mean, it you really make it is. so simple. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks. Thanks for letting us take your time. <laughs> so. To sum up, say go be do, do what you should be doing. <laughs> if you don't know what you should be doing, figure it out and then do it. <laughs> don't accept the easy answer, find the right answer. What should I be doing? Not what would be easy, what would be convenient, what would make me happy in the next two minutes, but what's the right thing that I should be doing right now and do that, okay? So that's step one, okay? Tammy and I met months ago, and we talked about, as we're kind of melding our vision for, for Youth for Freedom, what would it look like? And we came down to there being two basic principles that were kind of two halves of a whole. One of them is the define, learn, do principle that I talked about a few minutes ago, and the other one is say, go, be, do, right? So say, go, be, do being find, in any given moment, find the right thing. 
not passively Jamie waiting had a set life. intentions, right? That's the, that's the beginning of defining today. When I get to the end, I will know whether or not I was successful by how close I came to fulfilling that victory, right? And it, it's in degrees. It's like, wow, I came this close, or I achieved it and more, you know? Or I didn't do anything. Man, I, I was really bad. I only gave 10% instead of 100 Wherever it, wherever it falls. But if you don't start with a definition of what your victory looks like, you could have lost or won, and you wouldn't know. Reminds me of the, 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 the scene in Alice in Wonderland where she asks, which path should I take? And the Cheshire cat, cat asks, which way, or where do you want to go? She says she doesn't know, and he responds, well, it doesn't really matter which path you take. It's kind of that we, we can't know what action to take. Say go be do can be so much less effective if we didn't first ask ourselves and our higher power, where should I be at the end? And if we get a vision for that, all of a sudden, just the knowledge of that's where I'm going immediately opens us up to so many say go be do's. Oh, if that's where I'm going, there's five different things I could do right now that would help me get there. Which one do I pick? Because I can't do them all at the same time. I'll do that one, and then that one, and then that one. And as you do those, you get more and more and more. The, the two principles complement each other, right? And as you live both of them, you find all other principles, knowledge, skills, relationships, people, whatever it is, you will naturally find everything else you need to fulfill your hopes, your dreams, your purpose, your passions in your life. And so for me, that's my goal, my dream for you through freedom is people that come and get those two halves and live them on a daily basis. Understanding the big picture of where they want their life to go so they can already find the say go be do's that start getting them there. Understanding all the little pictures of this today, this hour, this whatever you're, they're doing, what is success for me? Learning how to do it from people who have it and then acting on the things they learn. A lot's been said about this, but it, it's super powerful. So the four sessions this year, the first one, again, somebody asks, I don't even remember now, but, but somebody asked, it was Lara, why isn't that the theme for the whole conference, right? Way before we, we renamed the sessions, Cammie and I sat down and talked to him and made that unified vision of that's, that's the whole, is those two things. We have four sessions on purpose, right? The first one, this theme, is focused completely on one of the principles. And the third one is focused completely on another one. The other two are principles that support both of them. Does that make sense? So the first one is say go be do. We have our 12 and 13 year olds coming in and what they need to learn right then is find and act upon the right thing right now. Become, create the habit of acting when it's time to act. Because the hardest thing is when you make a big definition but you're so in the habit of losing you're so in the habit of not acting, you're so in the habit of justifying, of letting things pass, that it doesn't matter how big your dream, you're not going to do anything. The first principle is say go be do. Become a person of action. Actively seeks for the right things and does them. You then have session two is focused on the power of purpose. Figure out why you were created, who you are. What, who are you and why are you that person? repeating myself, but it's, it's that basic. Who are you? What do you want to do? What effect do you want to have on the world? I love that we have this one second because at least in the, this process, I've gone through this process in my life, um, being aware of the state of views and then that, just doing that led me to seek out my purpose. Does that make sense? Like, understanding that I'm following my higher power when I'm doing these things, or however you want to say it, automatically leads you to the next step, which is discovering the spe more specific what you're made for and what you're here for. And I love that we have this in a second. Yeah. You find out why are you on this earth. There's tons of people on the planet. And each of them has a purpose. What's yours? That's session two. So now you're a person of action, and you know 
why you exist. Okay? Then you have session three, define, learn, do. You go and you define more of your purpose as well as everything else that's important to you. Everything else, you find out what your victory is. You learn the principle of not just to find out your purpose, your passion, your, your happiness, your victory, but then how to gain the skills that will get you there, the knowledge, the whatever it be, and then how to implement it. Okay? And finally, you have session four, be the change. Act on it. Become a person who, isn't just, who doesn't just make changes, who isn't just occasionally doing stuff, but who habitually, and because of the, their character and who they are, actively every day, day in and day out, makes the changes in themselves, in their environment, and in the world around them that need to happen because of their purpose, because of their definition of success and happiness and themselves. That's why we made the change. For me, Youth for Freedom is about, for me, it's about level three. We're here to affect the world. None of us, you've heard the phrase, no man is an island. None of us is here just for ourselves. We all are ourselves, and we have to start there. You can't change here without first doing here, right? That's kind of what we talked about earlier. You have to, and also, like I said, with the, the, the learn step, you learn from people who have the results you want. If you want to go out and create certain results in other people's lives, you have to first create those results in your own life. It starts here. Then we act and we create a ripple effect throughout the world. Each of us has an effect to have on somebody else. It starts with us and it moves to them. Are there any questions? Gone a little bit over time. It should have gone a little bit over time. Um, again, I want to restate my dream. My dream is thousands and thousands of youth who know and live the principles of say, go, be, do, and define, learn, do on a daily basis. I firmly believe that by achieving that dream, we will have thousands and thousands of adults, once those youth get a little older, who go out achieve their dreams and give other people permission to do the same. And as each of us achieves our dreams, whatever it be, the whole world will be a better place. Thank you. <laughs> We're now going to have a few minutes for um, <laughs> each of the sessions to share a little bit about what their kind of goal is, okay? We have a slight irony of none of the four, well, ah, Jordan got here. You weren't here at the beginning, you got here later. So here's what we did. None of the, no, let me start over. Okay. Two of the four session directors, there we go, two, are not here, okay? One of the third session has two session directors. So one of them is here. We're lucky. <laughs> so I know Spencer is going to first share for Aubrey, who is unfortunately home sick with a sick baby, too. Um, Spencer's going to share, and then we'll go from there. For session one, say good do. Spencer. <laughs> All right. Well, <clears throat> um, so yeah, I got a call from Aubrey yesterday saying that I would be representing number one, talking about saying that. Um, I learned that these, this was a theme for level one. I was already preparing to teach my boys about Sego Bidu because I understand that it's important that if you understand Sego Bidu, you can learn to take those actions that will get you to achieving your dreams and to changing many lives. So um, as level one, we're going to teach people, the, the youth of that session, about how to follow Sego Bidu so they can go along with this process with YFF. And so um, we want to teach them how to, to follow the Sego Bidus and how to master their fears and to understand what is holding them back from moving forward, how that they can slay their personal dragons in their lives, finding their personal swords, their personal strengths, and to fighting those battles in their mind so that they can move forward. And so we, that's our main objective is to basically learn how to follow your mind and to follow and to fight the battles in your mind. Mm -hmm. So, thank you, Spencer. 
Nathan Reed, the session director for session two, is currently broke down in Fillmore with radiator fluid leaking all over the freeway. So, <laughs> <laughs> he will hopefully be here later in the training and we'll give him an opportunity to, to share with you all. Michael Harrison, co-session director for Define, Learn, Do, session three, will now share with us some wonderful awesomeness. <laughs> Oh man, I am so excited that I have this opportunity to help my sister out. Um, she's Session 3's director, but she is currently acting upon her mission. She's in New Zealand right now, so you get me today. Um, <laughs> one thing before we start, I would, I've been thinking a lot about the conference themes. I've noticed that if you look at your life, you can almost see uh, where you're at, like, for me, I'm in the define, learn, do stage, which is awesome because I have a little bit of experience with it, so I get to share with you, but um, I'm going to use this so I don't have to hold my stuff. So maybe today, take a minute to see where you're at so you know where you can move to next, if that makes sense. So, um... Define, learn, do. This, oh man, I love this principle so much. It is just like expanding my thinking so much. I've been trying to apply this over the past five or six months, I guess. Um, and I wanted to share with you how this fits more specific to getting the kids to do action steps in their lives. This is kind of mine and Heather's vision. So when we talk about defining your life, um, I actually want to start here uh, because it's the most important. So when we, when we have the kids with us, we want to really instill in them, like, who do you want to become? So defining that specific thing in their life, if that makes sense. So. I just listened to a great CD by Oliver DeMille, uh, his father, who talks about um, if you were to meet, like, say, the president or a great leader, and you had 60 seconds to say what your mission is, just get it to a one-liner. So here's mine. I'm Michael Harrison, and my mission is to enlighten the world. So that's kind of like... <laughs> If I can get the if I can get the kids in the session to come away with something um, as simple as that, but but more character based. So like the way Heather defines it, like we want to help the kids start with something small. So if you see a piece of trash on the ground, you're the type of person who will pick it up because that's part of your character. Does that make sense? So let me step back a little bit from the specifics and talk about why a vision for the future is so important. Um, I think I have lots of notes written down. I only have 10 minutes, but I just kept writing. So <laughs> let me choose one that's good. Um, they're all good. Let's see. Wayne Gretzky, one of the, probably the all-time greatest hockey player ever. The reason being, um, I should have read the story more. He, in, in, when, when he was doing an interview, they asked him what made him so much better than everybody else. Because people are here and he's like here on his statistics for, for hockey, right? So he talks about skating towards where the, the puck is going versus skating, just following it wherever it goes. That's, that is the difference between here and here, skating to where the puck is going. Now to tie that in with define, learn, do, it's so important to know where you're going. Does that make sense? The, the, Thing that you want to achieve, you have to be able to, to skate towards that in effect. So 
when when we're with our youth, it's so important to start at this level on character. And we have, I brought these books today, um, two of the greatest books that I've read in my life. I've, I've started reading more and it is one of the awesomest things. I never knew I loved reading so much, but <laughs> <laughs> this book, I just finished it this week, Endurance by Shackleton. It's one of the session three books. It is the most insane story. Like, you think it would be made up, but the, the things that they overcame in their lives um, were incredible. But what this book did for me is it showed me the ultimate power of, of a vision for the future and how that can take you as a leader, share it with your group, and get them through any hardship. So that's the power of vision on, a, on a, a more grand scale. And every everybody in this, not just Shackleton, um, were leaders in their own right because most of them had this character down. When he, One of the great things about Shackleton is he knew how to bring a team of people with him that um, he knew how to surround himself with good people, like great people. So that's, that's I'm excited for you guys to read this. So that's kind of like the big picture vision. It doesn't teach many like principles, mostly just inspires you with vision and things. This, oh my goodness, I've read this probably three or four times. Um, if you... If you want to change this, follow this book. Like, it, it, it takes you from, uh, from yourself. It makes you think about others. It, it, it really helps you apply true principles in your life for becoming a person of character. So that you can affect these next two levels. Um, Who is that one by? That is by the Arbinger, Ar Arbinger, Arbinger Institute. There's also a, one that's more based on leadership that's really awesome. We've had leadership and self-deception that everybody should read as well. <laughs> um, I love Cammie's story. Uh, because it, it encompasses the journey that we're on um, in our lives for success and, and what we're really trying to bring the kids through. When, when she had the realization that she was going to be working with youth, like when she was 14, that is like, that is my favorite moment. Like those moments in my life where I can see my purpose are so empowering. Like it lasts, like she forgot about it a little bit, but when somebody brought it up, it was still in her mind, you know, still very powerful. That's the power of the Say Go We Do section. But then when she got together with her sisters, they went deep into the define, learn, do principle. And it is changing so many lives. Um, this principle that I've been reading a bunch of books that have to do with success and they all say this over and over and over in different ways but this principle I can't I can't explain to you enough how how important it is on the little things in life and how important <coughs> doing that will affect everything in your life um, I really, just in this talk, I just really want to, like, empower you with this principle so you, you, you can take the necessary steps to learn it for yourself so that you can share that with your youth. Um, 
one more story that talks about the define and the learn, I think, a little bit. And it's actually more of just, just kind of a, it's not really a story, I don't know, an anecdote? Maybe that's a good word. We'll use that one. It's kind of an anecdote to make you think about uh, the define and learn part. So let's say um, we were talking about how your thinking affects your results, right? So let's say um, somebody who's working at a job and they earn $40,000 a year, right? All of a sudden they win the lottery. Let's say they earn $10 million. So, and this has been statistically proven, like 95% of people who win the lottery will be in three to five years back at the $40,000 a year or below. So in opposite of that, if we take like a millionaire, um, if he has a huge business, million dollar business, he loses everything, you can better believe that in three to five years, he'll be a millionaire again. Does that make sense? And what's the difference there? <coughs> so the thinking. It's, it, it's the most insane thing to think about. I've never thought of it in that way before. And you can think about it, <laughs> you can think about it financially, but it, it, it works with any, any part of your life. So, um, oh, it's just such a powerful principle, and I'm so grateful that I've had the opportunity to come and present to you guys. Um, I'm so grateful to get to know all of you again, and, and all of the new people, and, and I'm super excited. Um, I think that's everything I have to say. If I'd say one more thing again is just see where you're at on in, in these four sections because really what we have here is is like the process of success. So if you know where you're at in this, then you can choose the next step. Anyways, I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you for letting me present. Anything that Michael just said or did up here empowered you. Okay? I want you to look at every single one, every single person who has their hand in the air and see if your intention was met. Oh, it was. No, I want you to. You did. Okay, okay I'll come look on. Longer. Come on. Scan. <laughs> that in right here, okay? okay? That's huge. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Michael. He always has so much to share, and we never give him enough time. <laughs> <laughs> so now we get to hear from the wonderful, wonderful session director from session four, Be the Change, Jordan Scott. Woo! I got an introduction that is like so <laughs> nerve-wracking. Um, First of all, I would just like to publicly apologize for being late today. That is very uncharacteristic of me and made me so uncomfortable. Usually I'm like time Nazi and I get really, really nervous when we're like going over time. But it's been really weird today because I haven't been there. And it's actually really cool and I'm really excited about it because it shows that I'm changing and I love that. Anyways, so session four, be the change. Um, I literally started planning this during session four or session three last year um, with two of my counselors, Zach Gardner and um, Colin McClain, who isn't here today, but Spencer's older brother. They were my counselors then. And we like went around and we talked to all the youth and we were just like, hey, so are you guys going to come next year to session four? Are you super excited about it? And they were just like, meh. I don't, I don't want to go to session four, I want to keep going to session three, because session three has like a super awesome simulation, which hopefully you all will get to experience in some way or the other. Um, I'm sorry, I'm session two and that's so exciting that we get to do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's super exciting. I've okay. done session two too. Two too. Mm -hmm. Anyways, <laughs> so, um, and that like totally bummed me out. I was just like, are you serious? Session four is supposed to be like, the top, the best, and ever since we used to have something called the Andow Character Prize that made Session 4 what it was, and we have since like discontinued that. And so, 
I was really bummed. And so me and Zach and Colin, we got together afterwards at Iceberg, and we sat there and we listened to, or we re-listened to what the youth told us, and we talked about it, and we like planned all this stuff. We literally, we wrote out simulations, we wrote out plans, we wrote out all this stuff, because we were so, like, we had so much passion about what it was going to be. And then we went on with our lives a little bit. Um, December, I was just like, okay, things have got to get going, so I started planning and planning and planning. Um, and then Oliver made the change for the names, and it was really cool because that was exactly where I was headed in my personal planning for this, which I had not even been communicating with him at all, because I don't communicate very well sometimes. <laughs> um, so, because I get so set in what I'm going to do, and then I expect everybody else to be there as well. Um, so, be the change. That's something that is super powerful, right? If we are able to be the change that we want to be, that will just, like, that's like the biggest thing you could think of, right? At least for me. I'm a huge change person. Um, so this year, I've made a lot of changes. Um, instead of, we're not going to have the Andow Character Prize, we are having a um, simulation intensive session. And basically what that's going to be is we're going to have, like, four or five simulations, and we're going to... Like, they're going to be super, super intense, hopefully. Like, this, if it goes according to plan, it's going to be super, super intense. And, um, yeah, I'm super excited. Thanks. I heard no, that. I, <laughs> I, think, I love that's you. That's awesome. Um, and we're also going to not have book discussions like you normally would. We're going to base some of the simulations off of the books and um, discuss them in the simulation debrief which is a huge change and something that I'm super excited about, something that we've talked about. And I'm super grateful for your input, by the way. Um, and I'm really, like, I have never felt so driven for a session, like last year even. Like, it's, it's going to be amazing because I know that it is what it's meant to be. And um, that's... Kind of what it is. I'm not really. So Jordan, if I have a really, really hard time with change, you're like totally promoting be the change, like be okay with change. Wow, ah, it's, it's so hard for me. What are you gonna do for me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna kick you in the pants. <laughs> Actually, um, thank you for that. I feel like in my head. Okay, got me back to my heart. Um, yes, I'm gonna kick you in the pants. Like literally, I'm. These simulations will just take you from where you were and take you to somewhere you've never been because it's where you've always wanted to be. Like, I'm not going to take you where you don't want to be, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Okay, so get real with me for a minute. It's so hard to be real with a camera. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm like so nervous right now. <laughs> okay, what about the live people here? Look, look into our eyes. Like, fill up our energy. I, I have. A lot of us have trouble with change. Does anybody have trouble with change? Is that hard for anybody? Okay, this is your counselor. These are the leaders that are going up. The kids will come, I promise, similar. So you are so good with change. How are you going to implement that into my heart? I don't like change. It's very uncomfortable. I fight against it. I, it just makes me so nervous and anxious. And so you're like advocating being that, like wanting to be excited about this change. Whoa. How are you going to implement that? I'm going to show you why it's important. Okay, why? It's um, important because you will never, without change, you will not be happy. What if I'm, what I'm, if I'm happy in this moment, just? Totally happy with this, with who I am, and, and change like scares me, it frightens me. Like that doesn't seem happy to me. I can't. I'm like I'm. I can't even like imagine that. This it's a really hard question for me. And it's really the right question. I know it is. Because you're going to direct all of us through getting through how hard it is for us to change, and you're so excited about it, but I'm not. Ah. Uh, it's frightening to me. Why would I want that vision? So ask, ask from them. 
May I share a story? Yes, you may. Please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I forgot the, for some reason my mind just went blank. The name of the animal that has the shells there in the sea. <laughs> Sorry. Crab. 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 Yeah, well, anyways, so, so these animals, right, they, they go about their life, they grow this shell on top of them, right, and this shell protects them, it, keep, it keeps them away from danger, but um, with time, this animal is growing into that shell, and it, it becomes really uncomfortable for them, it really starts to cramp them up and everything, um, so at that point in their lives, they have a decision to make. They can either shed that shell and then regrow another one, or they can keep that same shell. But what happens is when they shed that shell, they become vulnerable. Um, for the time it takes them to grow the new shell, um, they're vulnerable to any attacks from anything. Really, any animal, they're, they're pretty much done for if anything comes to attack them. But when they finally regrow that new shell, they will have even more space in their shell. They will be even better. They will be bigger. They'll be even more protected than before. So change is like that for us. We, you know, when we start to change, we become vulnerable. We open ourselves up to new ideas, new thoughts, um, new ways of living. But if we actually do, if we take the um, effort, if we put ourselves out there, we make ourselves vulnerable, we can become better, we can become stronger, we can live better lives. Sure, it's hard, and there's always a risk to it, but it's definitely worth it. Thank you. This is my long-lost cousin, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm just going to quote Brene Brown. If you guys haven't heard of Brene Brown, just exactly what you were saying. Change. is one of the most vulnerable things we'll do in our life. <laughs> do you wonder why some of us don't want to go there? That scares us. Like the whole being late thing? <laughs> scared you yeah. to death! Yeah, I did. I'm still right? scared. It's yeah. still frightening you. That was awesome. Oh, thank you, Jordan. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Either, either way. <laughs> so this is something I actually learned in an advertising class. Because when you're advertising a product, like, you know the benefits of it. You're advertising change. You know what's good about it. You know, you know why it's good. You've experienced it. But there's, there's two ways to to sell somebody else on change, or on a product, or on a book, or whatever. You either have to make them completely discontent with where they're at, so they want to change, or you have to sell them on where they can be. Like, it's a push or a pull, and the best, the best inspiration, or the best motivation is a combination of both, where not only, like, does where they're going to go look so awesome, but where they're at starts to look not as awesome. And, and that push and pull eventually you know, makes you go, I don't, I, I'm not okay with just being where I am, and that looks awesome. That change, I know it will be worth it because you know, I want to serve, I want to you know, be successful, I want to be a better public speaker. I see, I see success and I want to get there and I see where I'm at, and I'm now not content with it anymore. And, and those two things are, are the combination that makes us want to change. Even, you know, even though somebody else can see it, until we can see it, we'll never have that motivation to change. Thank you. So you have to kind of make them see both sides. There. Okay, so since I'm going to be in session four with you, I'm super excited that this is what it's about. Because um, change is hard for everyone, and I think the biggest reason is because we think in our minds, okay, change has to be a drastic thing right away. Okay, it's baby steps. We're going to take baby steps, and we're just going to do a little change at a time, and then later on it ends up being this huge change, which is awesome. But we have to take small steps and realize our higher power 
is going to help us. Our close friends help us. Our family. I hear the word change. I'm like, oh, I'm on my own, and it's going to be humongous. Okay, well, you take little steps to where it is humongous, but you have to think of one step at a time and where you're at and then ask your higher power for help because that's the only way that I know I can do it. So I'm super excited. This is what our topic is. You should be. I am. I am. There and there and there and there. I'm so grateful for this. <laughs> Just so you know. Okay. Hey, okay, so it'd be kind of a long comment, but I We're actually, used to those. I, <laughs> I had a discussion with my higher, like with God, and we had this conversation. When I try to understand something, He teaches me by simulation. Like He gives me images in my mind of something that happens, so I understand how everything works. It happens all the time. But this one I had. It's, Specifically, like, how to deal with this situation. I was really frustrated that my life got really difficult at this certain point, and I was like, why are you doing this to me? Like, everything's falling to pieces, and I'm just so frustrated. And in my mind, like, the simulation that he gave me is there's, like, it was in a form to teach it to someone else, so that I could, anyway. So the simulation was is if there's, like, a group of people, and there's, like, you separate them, like, group A and group B. And group B, they all have, like, a box, and it's, like, big enough for them to fit in, and you tell them, this is your box, you created it, this is like all your accomplishments, this is all your dreams, this is everything that you, whatever it is. And they're like, whatever you do, don't get out of the box. Like this is, you'd be very careful, like this is your protection, this is your security, all these things. And then you talk to group A, and group A are like, people in the box are going to die within two minutes. You have two minutes to convince them to come out of the box, but you're not allowed to force them out of the box. <laughs> All these people going towards people in the boxes, and the people in the boxes don't know it. They're not allowed to tell them they're going to die. So the people like come up, and some people are like, Will you please get out of the box? Like, please, let's just like, come out of the box. And they're like, no. And other people are like, please get out of the box! And then like, they start shaking the box, and like, <laughs> they're trying to convince these people that like, the box is not where it's at. Like, we have to get out. And so you see the wide range of like reactions. Like, some people are like, you're in a snow, like, get out of the box! And then people are like, is, like crying because the person's going to die, and you're like, oh, you can't tell them that. And then God was like, you're the person in the box. And he's like, and I've gone through all those stages. At first, it was a little like say go, but he's like, hey, maybe you should think about getting out of the box. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, maybe, maybe sometimes soon you should think about getting out of the box. And I was like, no. This is my box. And he's like, and he gets more and more intense, and then he starts shaking the box. And that's my life falling to pieces, because he's shaking the box. And I'm mad at him, and I'm like, why are you shaking my box? Because like, you're going to die, okay? So get out of the box. And, uh, I don't know, I think that, like, demonstrates how change is so important, but that we're so stuck in our box, and it takes someone outside of us to come over, and that's our parents. Because if you notice, parents do the same thing, like, hey, you should probably clean your room. Or, you if you don't clean your room. Like, they go to those some people are going to bribe people to get out of the box. Other people are going to, you know, motivate. Some are going to push. Some are going to pull. All these different things apply into that scenario, and we all respond differently. Some people, if like you said, no, I'm not getting out of the box, they give up. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Just die then. Other <laughs> 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 you know, people would be like super forward and pushy, and like that's how we tend to be with like our higher powers and with people close to us. Is the same way with like when oh, there's our friends trying to get us to change, or like a principal, or all these things. You're Danielle, right? Yeah. You're I'm in session. session. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm totally going to use that simulation idea, by the way. <laughs> um, okay. So I feel like... You. Because you're the only so, one I can remember that raised that. <laughs> so, with that example, I think it's really important that the people who are trying to help the people get out of their box remember that the box is really nice. Yeah. They have this, like, fancy box that they're in, and they like it a lot. And... If, if we try and get them out of the box in a way that, um, yeah, you can't force someone out of their box. You have to like help them realize the advantages of getting out of their box. And if you can't do that in a way that will help them, then you're just going to make them more stubborn. Make them make cling them to it more. Like their box even more. Yeah. Like, so it's this, we, if we apply that in our lives, like if we see someone that we know we can help to move forward in their life, but we... We try and help them in a way that would help us. For example, I, I recently was talking to someone and I realized I'd been trying to help them in a way that would help me, but it was making things worse for them. Mm. So we need to put ourselves, we almost need to get in the box with them to understand where they're at so that we can help them out of the box. Or, 
or there's no way we can help them in the way they need to be helped. So, so maybe for the simulation, you just tell the people in the box, if they get in the box with you, you can get out. <laughs> hey, go over their box. Yeah. <laughs> I'm about to get big boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I heard one time a proverb that said that there are three great mysteries in the universe. The water to the fish, the air to the bird, and the mind to the man. Right? We don't even realize our captivity. We don't even realize what's all these things that are around us, the things that are limiting us because they've always been there. Or they've been there so long that it, we, it's not even that we just think they're normal. We don't think they're things. We don't, we don't recognize their existence. But they still block us from doing whatever it is that we, we should be doing or we want to be doing. We have to get past, we have to recognize, oh, these are real, there is a box before we can get out of said box. Another thing that goes along with this that I learned from Tony Robbins is he says that everything that we do as human beings is motivated by two forces. Uh, avoiding pain and running towards pleasure in everything that we do. So if we think of change and why people are afraid of change, they're linking pain to changing and pleasure to staying where they're at. And they're, most people are controlled by pain, rather, pain and pleasure rather than using pain and pleasure to go where they want to go. So if we could create a story in our mind where it's more painful to stay where we're at, or we can find evidence in our life where it's painful to stay where we're at, then that, that pain of where we're at is going to motivate us, ourselves, to move forward. So if we can ask the right questions to, those, to, the, to the youth, or even to ourselves, if we're wanting to go somewhere and we're afraid to change, we need to find out, you know, why, what is painful? What am, I, what am I not having in my life right now? Or what am I not becoming in my life right now because of where I'm at? And based on where I want to go, what is the pleasure, what are the list of things that I can enjoy and the pleasure of going where I want to go? So having that vision in mind and then having a list of the things that you can do, be, have by getting to this, this, this point B or this next place we want to go. And then making a list of the pain in our lives that, we're, that we have right now of staying where we're at. And by using those two forces, we'll be able to create change and have passion in the change that we're making. Sorry, we gotta like wrap up. Oliver was doing this. But can, no, can Spencer talk? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a voice too. Yeah. Um, so I was actually just gonna talk about what Josh was saying. That sometimes when I look at change and look at where I'm at, I'm like, well, what do I want to do? This is gonna be painful to get here, but staying here is gonna be painful. So which one do I want? Well, if I'm gonna be painful either way, why not try doing that while being pro progressive with that goal? No, because like some, you know, to kind of like add a little visual to that, it's kind of like in the Jackrabbit Factor thing. You guys have read that. There's a part where you know he's on this path, and you only get fed by peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And then there's these few occasions where people will run out and go catch a jackrabbit. Well, it's uncomfortable. It's hard. It's fast. You have to chase them. You have to visualize them. You have to get them through hard ways. But once you get them, you can go home. But when you're on that path, you're dreaming of when you can go home to your family, we can provide. But you're barely making enough for yourself to get to the next sandwich. So change, you could be painful, you could stay in that pain your whole life, that comfortable pain your whole life, but if you want to move forward, it's going to be painful either way. It's a battle, but you learn so much, you progress, you make yourself, you put yourself at the top of the success ladder. Either way, it's going to hurt, but you're going to progress if you make that change. Change is mandatory to get in there. Thank you all for your wonderful comments. You made up for my lack of, seriously, that camera is so intimidating. Um, I just want to close by saying that my vision, my mission in this is to enable the youth to be that change in the world that they want to see, that needs to be there in order for health and wellness and happiness and love to abound in the world. Um, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity, and I thank you for listening. <laughs>
<laughs> so the term be the change, right? Being is here. Changing is here. The change in a past tense is here. Whoa! You have to be change. It's cool. Sorry. <laughs> um, I really don't have time. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> so, we now have a wonderful, awesome person who almost wasn't going to be a counselor this year who's going to come up and tell us about what it means to be a counselor for Youth for Freedom. Okay. Well, welcome up, Lara Earl. Just kidding, now you have to talk. <laughs> so, but I'm really grateful to share with you um, my experience with having counselors, because as I was thinking about this, I was like, well, what do I want to share with them? And pretty much I'm going to share with you from the side of a kid, like what my counselors did for me so that you can know what you need to be and what you need to do. So, like, my first year I got to YFF, I was, like, super pumped, you know, I'd heard about it my whole life growing up, you know, my aunt, Cami, she always does it, and my brother's gone and everything, and so finally I was 12 and I could go, and I get there, and I'm like, uh, there's, like, 100 people, and I don't know anyone, and I was extremely out of my comfort zone. So, I meet my counselor and everything, and I'm like, okay, this is cool, you know, and I am like this awkward little 12 year old. And, but it was just amazing to me how much, like I remember what she did for me. <laughs> it's really, like I think about it and it's like one of those things that you might call stupid or something, but it really isn't stupid. But she had us all pick a character from one of the books that we um, read and we had read one of the ones from Chronicles of Narnia and so we all picked our favorite character, and then she called us that favorite character. So I went around as Reepa Cheep. That's who I was. <laughs> and I, I always think about that. And so when I think of like counselors, you know, when I got there and I'm in this uncomfortable situation, and something that Kami's taught me is where change happens, you know, we keep talking about change and stuff. Change happens outside of your comfort zone. And so I got there, and I was ready to change. I was outside of my comfort zone. and. Oftentimes when people are put that way, they can really shut down fast. And it's hard to give your 100% when you're uncomfortable because it's so much easier to just kind of disappear and now you guys can't see me and it's over, right? But um, for me, the counselors are there to support the kids in that situation because you are their best friend. And while we don't want to be filed in the God cabinet, um, you, like, you're there for them. And by even showing them that you are their equal and not above them, you encourage them to be their best self. So like, by being changed, oh, I'm getting all emotional. By being changed inside, you really affect these kids. And just having confidence in yourself and pretty much, if you guys are 100% in the activities that we do, in the simulations, in the book discussions, you know, throughout the things that we do, if you guys are present, and if you guys are aware of your kids, what they need from you, and like who you want them to be, seeing them as equal and as their best self, then you'll be able to give them the support that they need. Another thing, too, is to please set your intentions with your kids and for yourself. That's something that last year as a counselor, I wish I had done. The biggest thing that, as I look back, and Cammie told me, she was like, what, what's something that you want to change about life, I feel like, or something with the change, uh, something that you would have changed. And, and it's something that I could have done, but just set intentions for myself as a counselor, I want to do this. Because all my, my intentions before were, I want my kids to, I want my kids to, and so then I would work on those things too, but specifically from being a counselor, I want to change by this. And so, and you know, like we keep talking about how that's selfish, but it really isn't. So, pretty much, just be who you want your kids to be, and then listen. Right. We're going to applause for her one more time. Counselorness wasn't here today, so we looked around. And we're like, "Who is an awesome counselor? Who can share some brilliance with us?" And we're like, "Laura." <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, real quick before lunch, we have one more person that's going to talk to us. And this is one of my favorite people on the planet Earth. Um, she has been one of my mentees for a long time, and has now surpassed me in some of the things that I mentored her, and um, and inspires me like every day to be to live my definition, to find my dreams, and to achieve them. She's only barely 18, and already like she has all these successes that are like amazing and awesome. Um, so I'd like to bring up my sister Eliza DeMille. So. Hey guys, I am so excited to be here today. I just want to tell you, um, like Jordan was saying, these guys get started on Youth for Freedom while they're at Youth for Freedom. They get started for the next year. And Oliver, he, I've been able to work with him and with the session directors and camp directors throughout the year and uh, we started actually in October of last year and we've just been working on how to inspire the youth this time and how to get the people there that the counselors that can inspire them and change their lives and it's been such a cool experience and there's one thing I wanted to specifically talk to you about actually it's kind of been hard because all of these people live in random places all around and they have families and work and it's been really hard to like meet up together but um, last month, we finally got it to where all the session directors and the camp directors, we finally all met, and we had all of this stuff we had to talk about. There's all these things we need to decide. We're getting so close. We're almost to our first training, and we're, I, I at least was freaking out, because I'm like, oh, this list of stuff we've got to do. And I, I was like, oh, how are we going to do this? So then we get together on that day, and I'm like, okay, we've got to get to business. We started at like 9 a.m. We only have one day to do this. We've got to do it all. And we sat there for a while and just talked, and I was like, but what are we doing? We, we've got to get to work right now. And then they're like, let's go to the park and hang out. And I was like, what? We can't go to the park. We, we've got to get to work. But I'm like, okay, let's go to the park. So we went to the park, and then we went for a walk, and we played tag on the bridge, and it was so fun. And then we went into a river, and we played in the mud, and then all of the girls, we held hands and ran through the river and got all... Wet. And then the guys, they skipped rocks, and they were really good, by the way. Those guys are like a team of experts or something at skipping <laughs> rocks. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, we just hung out that whole day. And then we went, and Cammy took us for frozen yogurt. And then finally, at 7 p.m., we went out to dinner. And I'm talking, we hung out all day. We didn't talk one thing about what we're going to do for Youth for Freedom or how it's all going to happen. And I finally stopped freaking out because I'm like, these guys know what they're doing. I, I, I'm just along for the ride, so this is going to be fun. Finally, I just trusted them. And then at 7 p.m., we went out to dinner, and we talked about stuff. And I thought it was going to be all chaotic and stuff, because we have all this stuff we've got to fit in here. But it wasn't. It was so synergistic. We just worked together, and we talked about certain things. And we didn't even make final decisions on half of it. But we just the talking through is how we've gotten to where we are here today. And I just wanted to share that with you guys, because these people... <laughs> Cammy wrote fun on the board for a reason, because the relationships, that's the most important part here, and that's how we get to the rest of it. And I, I guess I didn't really get that as much, because I saw the camp, the result of it all, and I didn't get how they got there, because I've been a youth for five years there, and it's changed my life every time, but I didn't realize all the work that you have to do to put into it until I got involved in it, but I also didn't realize all the fun, and I, you guys, it's going to be so much fun. I'm so glad one of the coolest things we're doing this year for the counselors that we came up during one of our just little talks is um, the like retreat thing for all the counselors. We're going to hang out for two days and just have basically a conference of our own, and it's going to be so amazing. And I just want you guys to know that the fun and the relationships matter so much, and all of this stuff, is that's just part of it. How we get to know each other and how we form relationships and learn to care about each other, that is how we're going to be able to inspire the youth and make relationships with them and help them to make relationships with each other. And for me, that has been the most important thing about YFF. All the things that I have learned, the relationships that I've formed are going to stick with me forever. And I want you guys to know that you are all here for a reason. Whether you're an alternate or you're chosen to be a counselor, these session directors and camp directors looked at you and said, I want them around our youth. They're amazing. They have something to offer them. And I, I'm so grateful to be around you guys today and to be able to learn from you and
form relationships with you. So I just want to tell you guys, you're here for a reason, and I'm so excited to get to know you. Thank you, guys. All right. One of my favorite things to do when there's multiple presenters and speakers is to notice how they treat the podium. I hate it. <laughs> some people stand behind it the whole time, some people lean on it, some people do different things. This isn't relevant to anything. I just wanted to express my dislike. <laughs> Sorry. So, we now have the opportunity to break for lunch. Does that say, I'm at a weird angle, 12.30? Okay. So, Michael's gone to get the food. We're gonna, there's some wonderful tables out here where we're going to eat. It's going to be a bunch of sandwiches. It will be awesome. Okay. So, they're trying to like make your own sandwiches. So go quickly because we want to be back by one. Okay. So that's not very much time. Be quick, have fun, talk to each other, it'll all be good. Um, real quick, before we all head out, I have a volunteer to bless the food for us. Okay. <laughs>
Set the chairs up in a circle, okay? Two, you're gonna need to set that camera up in such a way that you don't have to be doing it because your eyes are gonna be closed the whole time. Okay. So if you wanna still be filming, it needs to not need you to mess with it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, set chairs around the circle. Go, go, go. Okay. All right. <coughs> so, this activity is going to be silent, except for the possible sounds of Zach chewing. <laughs> Other than that, it will be silent. <laughs> anyway, so everybody, close your eyes. Today I'm going to lead you in what's called a guided vision quest. Okay? I'm going to take you along a path. And on this path, you're going to encounter various items and various obstacles, each of which will have different meaning to you and will be individual in some cases, and some things mean very similar things to everybody, and we'll talk about those when we're done. So at the beginning, imagine yourself walking down a path, somewhere in nature, somewhere away from general human construction, or buildings, or cities, or anything like that. You're on a path. Picture everything about this path. What do you see? Is it a stone path? Is it a dirt path? Is it, are you in a forest? Are you on a mountain? Are you, where are you? Think about every detail. Think about how you feel about this path. This path that you're on is the path of your life. Everything you do from the time you're born to the day you die happens on this path. This is the, the path on which you take your life's journey. So let's, let's go down. As you continue down this path, after a short time, you encounter a key. Think about everything about the key. What does it look like? How do you find it? Where is it? On the path, next to the path? What do you do with the key? Do you leave it there? Do you take it with you? Most importantly, how do you feel about this key? What does it make you think of? What feelings does it bring you? What memories does it, does it bring back to mind?
whatever you did with this key here, however you found it, I want you to now continue down your path. As you walk down your path and continuing to see all the all the sights, all, everything there is to see, whatever that be for you, after a short time, you come to the chest. Again, think of all the details of this chest. How big is it? What does it look like? What is it made out of? What do you do with this chest, if anything? Some of you will be able to open it, others won't. If you can open it, what's inside? Maybe some of you don't approach it at all. Think of everything that happens as you encounter this chest. Think of how you feel about it this chest. Continue again down your path. Continue walking and living again, living your life on this path of life. Continue until you find a map. Again, all the same things. What does it look like? How do you find it? Do you look at it or not? If so, what do you see on your map? How do you feel about what you see, if you see anything? Continue again. Keep going. Eventually, after some time this time, you encounter right there in the middle of your path a big old bear. <laughs> what happens between you and this bear? What does he look like? What is he doing? <coughs> Think about every detail of, of the encounter between you and this bear in your path. How does it make you feel? How do you react? What does the bear do? Think of every detail of this whole little incident with the bear. As you finally continue down the path, however, however you continue, however you leave that spot where, the, where you found the bear,
after the bear, on the path, you come to a vase. Think about this vase. What does it look like? How big is it? What are the colors? Are there patterns or is it solid? Think of all the details. Think of where and how you find it. Picture what you do with it. Or about it. How do you feel about this face? Once again, continue down your path. Continue until you eventually come to a body of water. What kind of water is it? Is it a pond? Is it a river? Is it a lake? The ocean? Is it a puddle? Think about this water and how you feel about it. What do you do about it, if anything? Picture all of the details and everything that happens as you find this body of water. Once again, continue down your path, leaving the water behind, maybe. Continue this time for a very long time. <clears throat> you keep going down your path until, eventually, you come to a barrier. Something that stops you from keeping on the path, something that halts your progress. <coughs> what is it? What stands in your way of continuing down this path of life? Think of every, every detail of it, of, of <coughs> the nature of the barrier. And take special note of how you feel towards this barrier. This thing that keeps you from going forward. What happens? What do you do? Do you get past it? Consistent right. to the subconsciouses of most people. There are some people who aren't, who are variant and they don't see that thing as that, sorry, that object as the same thing as everybody else, but it's actually super rare. I don't actually know why, but it is. So we're going to go through, take turns kind of telling about the different things we encountered and how we saw it. And to do that, I'm going to tell you 
what some of the different things that you encounter. I'm a little town called Los Angeles. Does that make sense? Again, this this is kind of a like any vision quest. Um, kind of a, has a dual. It has two senses. One is you seeing how your subconscious sees things, and another is opening yourself up for you know higher higher power and outside sources to to inspire you and and see things otherwise. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of there's always a mixture of both. Okay, but in either case, because of the human psyche, we always have to interpret things through. The conscious, and sometimes things are lost in translation. It's kind of sad, <laughs> but we're gonna do it as best we can. Okay. So we have two options. We can. We can choose the one that won't take us an hour and a half over time. That's what we do. I'm gonna tell us about each thing as we go, and we can each share about. Well, how each of us saw that object. Does that make sense? So, we're starting out with the key. Right? We've already talked about the path of life being the path of life. Right? Everything that we saw was on our journey through our life. And the key is the first thing you encounter because it's yourself. The way you see the key, the way you feel about the key, is the way that you feel and see yourself. In all the cases. Now, here's an important detail. None of these things are how you necessarily should see it or how you consciously want to see things. They're how part of you sees it right now. Does that make sense? It's one of the reasons I love this exercise because it helps you see where you are now so you can say, do I love that? Is that who I want to be? If so, awesome. And now because I know that, I can work off that and play on my strengths. Mm -hmm. If not, I now know what I need to change. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. So, who wants to talk about their key? Zach? Mine was just like floating in the air. It was a car key. Um, and I got to um, drive a car later. So. <laughs> <That's kind of laughs> you know, mine was a big silver key that I found in the dirt. In my dirt pathway. And I actually just stepped on it. Mm -hmm. How'd you feel about it? How did I feel about it? It was just something that was just laying there. I picked it up. And, uh, there's a part where it kind of I can feel it as a bigger key, like one of those medieval keys, and I can unlock some kind of ancient dungeon. That's what I felt like. <laughs> I, could, I could feel the weight and stuff, so I knew it was a bigger key. Well, I know it was one of those big olden day keys that had like the circle on the end of it. With It was pure gold, and I was just walking, and all of a sudden I had it in my hand. I didn't realize how it got there. It was, yeah, big golden chain. It's interesting to see how people find it and then what it does for them. Right? Again, remember, this isn't just a key. This is how you see yourself, right? So when you just stumble over it, it's kind of there, it's cool, but at the same time, you saw it, felt it had weight. And it was cool, and it was like, it was, it was, it was a cool key, right? And you, you're like, you don't really know how you found it. It was just there, but pure gold, powerful, you said it was cool. Something Isn't that interesting? That, no, uh, who else? Uh, the key. Mm -hmm. My key was gold colored, but was not gold itself. I felt like it was steel or a, a more durable material. Um, and it was somewhat shaped like a skeleton key, but instead of at the end of having like two little teeth, it was sharp, like it had sharp edges, like a blade. <laughs> and it was fairly heavy. How did you feel about it? Um, I felt like, to me, I think <laughs> it belongs to like an evil villain. So I don't know what that says about me. Um, Y'all better watch out. <laughs> you had your hand up earlier. Yeah, um, so my key, I found it on the side, and it was huge, like, like this big. Like, it was made out of iron, and it was, like, rusty and really old, and, like, I picked it up and was, like, with reverence, because I'm, like, wow, like, there's a lot of history behind this, and, like, I didn't know if, like, you know, it was the key to some great city or some ancient thing. Like, I didn't know if it had use anymore, but, like, it was just a lot of reverence because of the history that it had. Like, it was really old, but so beautiful because it was, it just had so much history. And then, like, when I moved on, like, I just set it down gently and then moved on. I freaking love 
loved my king. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know how I found it. It was kind of rusty, kind of beat up, you know, like it wasn't a very perfect key at all, but I was like, this key is awesome. I didn't even, like I didn't really know what it was, and I kept like trying to figure out more details about it or where it led to, and I was just like, I don't know, but I love this key. And I even like, I put it next to my heart. I don't know how it stayed there, but I just put it here, and it was like there. So like I could see. But then I had to leave my key. <laughs> Right now or later? When I got to the chest, I put it in the chest and it, w and it like halfway unlocked it and then it didn't and I left the key. Interesting. Mine was glove cap, but the glove we'll talk about that and the glove <laughs> 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 Mine was uh, an old style key. It was bronze. Pretty fancy. I don't know how to explain it. Like, that's probably going to be useful, so I picked it up in here. <laughs> Useful. Like self? Useful. Jonathan, are you from? You guys? That was a lot. <clears throat> My experience is like this, like re like this old bronze key, and I it was like in the I was on the beach, <laughs> and um, I picked it up, and and I just thought I should probably keep this with me, so I took it with me. <laughs> yeah. I was walking on my path. I had a river next to me the whole time. I was like water, and I like the sound it makes. And I remember I was walking and looked in the water, and I saw a key and picked it up. It wasn't very big, um, and uh, it was covered with rust. And uh, and I would, and I was, as I was walking, I was trying to scrape the rust off, and I realized that it was always wet and never dried off. Um, but by the time I uh, I cleaned it off, you know, it was still wet, and there was no rust on it left. Uh, you know, it was a I don't know how to describe it, but it was a fairly simple like, key. But something like, about it yeah, made it, it was, unique. Just totally it, it seemed kind of fancy for such a simple key, out, for such a simple and small key. Really but, um, you know, it was like a prison cell key, but like, something about it, and I don't know what, something about it made it seem unique enough. Uh, that made it more than just a prison cell key. I think the thing that stuck out to me the most was the fact that it like never dried off. It was always wet, and it would drip once in a while. I, I don't know why that stuck out to me so much, but it did. So the interesting thing about doing this vision quest is that there's these you know, six or seven things, I can't remember how many there are, but that I know the meanings for. But everybody has some hands. I have no idea what it means to have a car. No idea why it's what. No idea why. I have no idea. It means something. Oh, yeah. I was excited. Either to you or to a higher power or to, Just because to it was something. Familiar and I, I, I have no idea what it is. Where I to end up. And you may want to ask yourself those questions. So, what does that mean? I was excited. Right, don't focus your whole life on I must figure out why my key was wet. Right? But it can be valuable to ask yourself the question and get an answer. And you're the only one that can really answer it. Because it's you. Let's move on to the next thing, the chest. The chest represents how you see your education, or educational pursuits. <laughs> <laughs> so Laura has already tried a little bit of the chest. You get to it, you try to open it with the key, it doesn't work. Half opens, and then you left the key and the chest. It's like, I can see the back of the chest, it's like this wooden chest. You know, pretty much like a pirate's chest, okay? And I get there, I'm like, oh, that's why I have this key, of course. And so I turn it, I unlock it, and it won't lift all the way up. And it just stops. And so it's like the whole time you're talking about the chest, I'm just like trying to get it open, and it's not opening. And then finally you move on, and so I just have to let it go and leave it. And it was like so hard. I was just like, ah! Oh! But I did. And what was cool, though, is I was able to leave it. Even though I'm never going to leave my education, guys. <laughs> But that actually makes sense in my head. <laughs> See, and that's the crazy thing. When I first heard about this, I was like, key means you to everybody? You crazy? You crazy? But then I've done this with, I don't know, a couple hundred people now. And so many people are like, oh my gosh, it totally makes sense. With everything. It's crazy how much it always makes sense. I don't understand it. It does. Anyway. Who else wants to share about their chest? So, right after I found my key, I actually used it to unlock a door into a cave. And I walked into this cave, and it was there's like some water in there, and it was glowing blue. There was some gems in there, 
and then um, I saw the chest like on the side of the pathway. So I pulled it aside, I opened it, and the first thing I saw was light. And I tried to imagine what else I wanted in there, but I couldn't find it. I pictured gold, water, but the only thing that really stuck out was light. I don't know, like I, I was trying to picture some kind of treasure, but I, I, I guess to me, all I wanted to see was light, something bright. Just like in those movies when you open up treasure, like the, glow, the gold glows in their face. It was just kind of like that, except I, I didn't know what it was that was glowing in my face. Mine kind of relates to his, except when I opened the chest, like, all I could see was a ball of, ball of light in there. And the first thing that came to my mind was to take it with me, and it represented knowledge. So I took a ball of light, and I, it was like I shoved it and pushed it inside of me, in my heart, and then I left the chest. And in my mind, it was knowledge as I go down the path that is going to help me. jar with the lid on it so I was able to just take the so lid off like, and there's like, light in it and I took something out but I couldn't tell what it was <laughs> until later and then I realized what it was. What was it? <laughs> You're all gonna laugh at me but so and my roommates and I we play the Pokemon so games on our phones sometimes and there's a Pokemon that you have to wake up with a flute. It turned the bear ended up being that Pokemon because it will fall asleep and it's really big. It was in my way, so I, I realized that what I took out of the jar was a flute, and I played the flute, and it moved out of the way. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I love the way that, like, because the subconscious works on images, right? And everything you ever see is somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. So when somebody says this, you know, like, the coolest things come up. They're awesome. My chest was, was, really it was like, in a real life world, it was cartoon. It was like an animated chest. It was like totally disproportionate and everything. And I knew that the only way to open it was to sing a song while dancing around it. <laughs> a little stupid little song. And but I knew that inside of it were very, oh, hundreds and hundreds of um, very I valuable also, well, um, also like gold coins, it was specifically to blue. Huge, like, each one had been gotten so from, was, from hard work well, and know, effort put in to achieve something. I thinking about it, like, it was just like if I wasn't too convenient. <laughs> where did that come from? Like, well, 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 I, I kept asking myself that, and then I so remember. Yeah, the answer at first, like, gosh, and then I was like, it's a chest from a kid so I like saw years ago. Um, like a little cartoon <laughs> show. <laughs> Horrible. Like, uh, but like, it totally fits you know, with like, my so education. Like gold. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Mine was really interesting because um, like I came upon it and it actually wasn't a chest. It was like, or if it was, it was huge. Like like a building. Um, and, well, like more like a wall. And it was like the same type of stuff as my key. Like this big iron wall like I don't know if it was box or what but um like I was feeling guilty for leaving my key behind because I was like what does the key mean like (laughs) why did I leave my key behind and I was like because like I felt like I should leave it there but then I was like maybe I'll need it you know and then when it got there I'm like well it's this huge thing and the only thing that can open it is my key so I was like but I was also like really like looking at I'm like this is like a really beautiful wall like it's old and rustic and you know all this stuff and then I was like if I were to go back and get my key and open it I felt like there wouldn't be anything there like that it was just empty and dark which is really kind of funny because like I've had a lot of education but when I look back on it I'm like it's not really like I learned stuff but like in the long scheme of things it's not worth that much so that's really funny that like my formal education when you not life education but my formal education this is not necessarily oh dang it my, my education is a cartoon. <laughs> I always knew it. You know, this is, I kind of saw it, like, when I first did this, it was, I don't know, several years ago. And I, I kind of saw my, my education as frivolous, valuable, but not that impressive, right? And when I did, I was like, man, it's not all education to be. So I went out, and I had to learn stuff, and I had to change my view of the education I already have, because... It's not some geeky little cartoon with a little dance and song around it, right? I had to change that view to what I actually wanted it to be. And then once I did that, I was a lot more confident in dealing with people because 
I no longer saw my education as yeah. kids show. <laughs> so, here's what I propose we do. If we all share on all of them, it's going to take a really long time. We don't have a long time. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a couple people share on each of them, and then if we have time, we can come back and have more people share on, on the ones that we missed. Okay? So let's move on to the map. Okay. The map represents one of two things, sometimes both. Um, <laughs> it represents either how you see your purpose or how you see yourself receiving revelation or correction. It differs from different people. Some people, they see their purpose right there and it's, oh, this is my thing. And other people, they see how they receive their purpose. Also, a value counter is the same thing. Like, I knew someone sense. had put that there. So, like, either one is a, yeah. is a valid thing. Cool. Who wants to share about the map? Preferably someone who didn't share about the chest. Anybody? Um, <clears throat> the map was uh, kind of an old treasure map, but I knew that it was the path that it was on, if that makes sense. So, it was just off to the side, and I picked it up, and I referenced it throughout my journey. Over and over again, looking at the map. How do you feel about your map? I knew that it was true. Like I picked it up, and I knew that that is where it was. I kind of, I was thinking of personally. I, I love when people like are. So with either, sure with either interpretation, whether it be the purpose or revelation, it's valuable to are, um, realize you trust it. No, um, I love genuine, yeah, making it conscious. Like, when, really when you cares, when you find something positive in it, the, a lot of people have a tendency to question, oh, but is that real? If it's positive, if it's good, if it's a trait you want, and anyway, 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 kind of thing. It makes sense. Even whether it's real or not, it came from you. Part of you believes it. Emulated on purpose as well as subconsciously. Does that make sense? I feel, I feel Who else wants to share about that totally makes sense. The map. Yeah. Mine was interesting because it was the one thing I never left behind. Interesting. Interesting. Except maybe at, at the water. I might have left it at the water, but like it was the only thing I picked up and took with me. So important in my future, anyways. Like I'm used to getting where I needed to go. That someday I was going to come to the door, and that piece was going to open up. My map was actually just like one of those simple. X marks a spot, treasure maps, and that's part of it. So like those little dotted lines that went up, and then there's this big red X. And it was actually nailed to the tree, and I just like tore it off and looked at it. At first, I could barely see anything, but like as I started to imagine it, I started to just imagine this, just this simple map, simple little direction, and then there's this big X at the end. So everybody who hasn't shared about either the chest or the map. Think about your chest and your map and your connections to how you see your education, and how you see revelation or purpose. Okay. Let's move on to the bear. The bear is one of my favorite ones. The bear is how we see trials, how we see just the random annoying crap that happens in our life, right? or the bigger horrible things that are truly <coughs> dangerous and life-threatening. Everything, you know, from annoyance to I'm going to die in 20, 20 seconds. And everything in between. I already heard of another group, so that's right. <laughs> so the second I hear all of our the mill's voice say bear, I know. my bear went big gun bear. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't even consider that possibility. <laughs> Had anybody else said it, my bear might have been different. Um, but me and my bear, which all looked like all of our trial. Awesome. I he told the whole big brown bear story. <laughs> And we sat down and ate and had a good time and laughed about it, and then I went on my way. <laughs> Which, relating to all my trials and hardships, that's how I've dealt with trial and hardship my whole time. It's like, I just kind of laugh and brush it off. Like, I don't care, it doesn't affect me, I'm not going to let 
whatever hard trial or disappointment or annoyance in my life in my life affect me, like get me down and tear other people down. It's just like this happened and that's horrible, but I'm not gonna let it bring me down. I'm just gonna take it, laugh about it, set it aside, and then move on. So there's a lot of like funny occurrences. Eliza's first Eliza's done this several times and her first two times her bear was a sheep. Not a bear. Okay. So that's like weird stuff happened with like people whose chest was not a chest but a library inside of a tree. Like all sorts of weird stuff happened. I've never however been somebody's bear. So. <laughs> Thank you. Well that so this relates to my chest or jar that I found a lot because I, I couldn't tell what I found in my jar until I had the bear. So I just, I think that represents, like my education I see is something that will help me to overcome my trials in a way that won't negatively affect me. So I thought that was pretty cool. Because I'd forgotten what the bear meant. Like I knew it was something to do with trial, but like I don't know, it just made more sense when we talked Who, about Who's it. done this before today? Just you? I think I've done it before. Um, it's been years. Yeah, years. Like I've, like I've, I've done a couple different versions. Yeah, there's like, different versions. Um, cool. And it was... Like, I have one. Um, mine was... Mine was weird, because it wasn't a bear. Honestly, for me, it seemed kind of like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing. <laughs> where it, it was kind of like a copy of me. But it was a lot darker, a lot more violent. And... Uh, we did fight on the road. And uh, thinking about that, my whole life I've kind of dealt with depression quite a bit in my life. And that's honestly something that I see in my life a lot is the fact that even if it's just a small trial, I end up having that Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, where my mind completely splits apart. And I end up having this whole fight, this whole confrontation. And, um, I, and honestly, there are a lot of times where the other guy wins because he's just stronger and he, he knows where to get me. So, so um, I honestly think that that was one of the strongest things for me is because it showed, you know, my biggest problem when it comes to trials is myself, my, my split self. So true. I think that's true of most people. Um, one of my favorite bo books is uh, Dune by Frank Herbert. And he talks and over and over and over about, about what really like, stops us from doing things is not the negative like, consequences yeah, that could happen like for me or, or that do happen. It's the fear new, of what might happen. And there's so much stuff though. That People like, don't decide not to do things because it hurts like or because I was sad you know what any reason they, they stop things or or fail to start things the whole time. because of fear. So, no, it was, it was so cool. often it was we are big, our own like, biggest obstacle. That's sad. Like a sand dune? Oh. I have to it's hard one to one recommend one that book. Sci -fi it novel has some time, uh, by the way. Frank Herbert. It has some Okay, so when I saw my chest He's kind of cosmic humanist. Maybe even secular humanist. Anyway. He uh, kind of have to translate things from his version of truth to actual truth. So there's some translation needed, some transposing, if you will. Um, but he has some amazingly amazing, awesome principles in that book. Um, anyway. So the next one. Keep going. The next one. Vase. The vase. Um, that how you see your vase <laughs> is how you see <laughs> your <laughs> eternal <laughs> companion, <laughs> your <laughs> current <laughs> or future <laughs> spouse. Mine was gigantic. Yeah. People tease me. Too. <laughs> <laughs> it had like this inscription on um, it. It was like this really cool. huge vase, and then I. I well, I feel like it would be easy to explain. I got past there. it, and then it was like I was. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I'm like, when you say that, mine all of a sudden seems out of place. I'm like, it was kind of a medium-sized bass, but bass, it was kind of, it reminded me of a lot of, like, the Greek and Roman basses, where it kind of told this whole story around it, or it had, like, one picture on it, but it told this whole story about it, and, um, no, I really enjoyed the story, and so what I, I kind of, like, built this kind of pillar thing and put it on there for others when they kind of walked by to see the story and think, wow, this is an amazing story. Just what this is te teaching about, I'm like, this is an amazing thing. Uh, the interesting thing about the vase is it's the one that, that most often doesn't mean what it usually means, if that makes sense. I found when you do this with younger people, right, younger than about 14, has nothing to do with their future companion because that's not anywhere in their psyche. They, they have no they have no concept of it. And so they don't have a form of it. Which is always interesting. So it's always interesting to see what their base is to them. Okay, I know it was taught because it's usually not that for this specific trip. Um so my base and I thought this was really interesting that you said this. So I first discovered this key that clearly belongs to an evil supervillain. <laughs> My chest is half buried on the ground and I just walk past it, knowing that the key will probably open it, but I don't even bother. I find the map and see that it leads back to the chest and it loops around several times, it's very repetitive, and I was like, oh, I'm not gonna follow that, it's pointless. <laughs> then I meet the big brown bear. We laugh about it and have a good time. <laughs> And then I make it to the vase, and my vase is golden, similar to the key, but it's also transparent glass that has like a goldish sheen aspect to it. It's sitting on a pedestal, it is asymmetrical, because I really like asymmetrical things. Symmetry almost bothers me. <laughs> Not that it, it bothers me per se, but so many things that we create as humans are all symmetrical, so I like things asymmetrical. You like your woman just a little bit off. <laughs> <laughs> and then the thing that I find most interesting about this is there's a protrusion on the vase that like comes out right out of the front that the key fits perfectly into. And I set the key on the vase and left it there. And so I perfectly. So to me that was like the fact that I fit perfectly with my eternal companion. But since the key belongs to the evil, evil supervillain <laughs> and the vase does as well. <laughs> I don't know what that means. You, didn't, you see yourself as an evil super. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> be Megamite, man. It's good for Groove. Anyway, anybody else before we move on? Uh, oh, I keep oh, sorry. Were you going to go? No, you go ahead. Okay. So, uh, my vase was on top of a kind of like a little watchtower with a well up on top of the watchtower. So my path went around it. So I had to go up and walk up the stairs to get to the vase to get out. I had to get off my path temporarily. And then it was full of water, so I drank it. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> but it could mean a variety of things. You could your wife. <laughs> <laughs> or you could just Fell into it. his very massive vase, got trapped in it, <laughs> called for help, and his bear came and tipped the vase over, broke it, and they were quite happy that he was rescued from the place. <laughs> oh my god. Very, that's that really bad. Oh. Okay. Oh, wow. It's open. Anyway. Who was that? Or I guess. I was about to. I thought you know. Anyway. Fun, fun. Just out of curiosity, is anybody in here married? Or? Somebody brought me How does your view of your vase compare to your view of your vase? Perfectly. So when I saw the vase, what I first saw was it was like this crystal, like this rare, like, like, and it had this pattern that I couldn't even begin to describe or explain to you what it looked like. I had never seen anything like the pattern on it. And um, it was just like in the vase were like the most beautiful roses you'd ever seen. And then he said, you do whatever with the vase. And it was like, I put it up on like a little pedestal. And yeah, that was the, and um, I mean, if at any, any point you meet my wife, yeah, it's perfect. What is next? Water. Came to a body of water. Right. Zach's trying to remember his water. Well, I was just thinking because before I came to the vase, I was with someone else already. So when I came to the vase, I had someone with me.
I'm not going to dwell on. We drove in the car together for a while. Okay, Matt, we're seeing you right now. Yeah, so don't exactly want to worry about it. I've had people, I've had multiple people ride their bears. One had a, it was a princess. No, I'm sorry, a prince. She was the princess. Okay. Another one, the vase transformed into a bear. She had to choose one of them. They were identical bears. She had to choose one of them. And that's the one that went with her the rest of the time. She never knew whether it was the vase or the bear that was with her. Like, it's crazy. Like, it's so cool. I love it. Anyway. Um, water. Yes. Water represents how you see your relationships with with friends and family and just your general relationships with people. Who wants to share about their relationships? <laughs> um, my path kind of goes up like this and then it spirals around to the top of the mountain. Um, <clears throat> so at the peak of the straight part, down off the path, there's a crystal clear mountain lake surrounded by trees and I stopped and I was just staring at it for a good, I don't know, probably the whole time you were talking, I was staring at the water. How do you feel about it? It'd be really refreshing if I was swimming in it, but I was just staring at it instead. <laughs> do you feel that's a, an accurate view of how you see your relationships? Uh -huh. <laughs> Is that the view you want to have of your relationship? Probably not. I think I'd rather be swimming. But <laughs> swimming is good. Josh? It's interesting. I thought it was cool the way that I viewed it. When you said relationship, I don't know if it's cool or not anymore. Because <laughs> when I got to the water, it was an entire lake. It was like crystal clear blue, blue lake. And there's no way to go around it. So. <laughs> I got down, took my hat off. Um, I like, I was also, like, in the, like put water in, the in my hair and stuff because it was a hot day. And then how big is this thing? And then I walked across the, the water a lot of, like, tiny text to the other was, side. Like, really boring to read. And, and, and actually, I think there's like yeah. There was a match. Like, oh, someone left behind their blueprint. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a way to look at it. Something. And but I also held on to it. Mine was almost like Josh's. It was just this big, annoying, dirty puddle. I was there, and I just like <laughs> wait, just kicked my way through it, and then got I mean, continued on. Well, <laughs> <laughs> pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Is that accurate? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Or how did you I would. That's say, what he would say if he was sitting. Yes, there. <laughs> I think so. I use this, just this annoying, dirty puddle. <laughs> So I just I just stomped my way through it. Like kept on going. So I'm sure I missed it. This was a puddle that he just like splashed through. A dirty puddle. I've had people had a puddle that they felt like they're like oh and they tried to jump into it. Yeah. And then it was just like they just went like really. And she was like it was actually Eliza. She's like. When she don't find out those relationships, like I feel like that. Man. It's like a, right now I really have one friend, but we are like <laughs> she used the Adam Green Gables term. We are bosom friends. It's like it's a very small pool of friendship, but it goes really deep. It's really cool. That's cool. Um, I didn't really figure out what mine looked like, but it was like if, if you've read Journey to the Center of the Earth, there's like places where there's water and then there's light, but I'm not really sure where it comes from. It's kind of like. Yeah, really another time Eliza did it. I always like to tell <laughs> stories of other people. Another time Eliza did it, it was a river. And there were sharks. And Eliza is like deathly, irrationally afraid of sharks. And she was just like. <laughs> this was a time that she was going through. It. She did it. And the worst point in her relationship with that person, who the first time had been that one relationship, the worst time she's ever had with him. And about a week later, we did this, and she's like, I can't go near that. It was really interesting to see the juxtaposition. Anyway. And then we did it again about four months later, and it was the again. She said it's the same river that the sharks are gone. And she was with good friends again. It was interesting to see the difference. Anyway, let's go on to the next one, the last one. The barrier. It's how you see death, how you see the end. 
I can only sense from the past times I've been. Can I just be my mobile? That's scary. Uh oh. What's the share about? Beat up, and I finally got it, and it was like, like it was huge, like, uh, this morning I went on a, on a walk with St. George, and you just, I just watched the sunrise, and it was just like gorgeous. Um, you can see like all the different the the uh, mountains, you know, like how they get gray areas, they go back, and it's just chest, amazing. So and I got up there, and that was like the view. In the past, for me, like so, other ones I've done, it's been a cliff, but basically um, it's the same thing. In the past, I've just like sat on the edge and I like, just sat there. It's like felt okay with it. This time, it was very similar. It was like a, I was on a mountain and it was a big, huge crack in the ice, in, the, in like a glacier. But I could see but, down there forever, and then the longer yeah, I looked at it, it like started to shimmer almost, and I knew I needed to like, like jump in or like somehow get down there. And then, and then the <laughs> so, because I'm okay with the idea of death. Yeah, because I knew like okay, like I don't have any loving on these, like there's no way I'm gonna like. So mine, when you first said something blocking your path, I pictured, so I was in like a, a, a forest, and so there were fallen trees over it, and I started to envision it a little more. I'm sure you guys have probably all seen The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smog. I just picked, envisioned this big, big murk wood, this big illusion type woods in front of me. And it was too thick to walk through, and so you had to like climb on top and just kind of like work your way through around, but the path went right through it. So you don't know if it would turn this way or this way, so there's no direction after you got on top because you weren't following the path anymore. You couldn't go through it, it was way too thick of broken branches and trees that have fallen over. So it was this big pile of trees you had to walk on. Um, I came to mine and it was like this uh, big brick wall and it stretched in all directions but there was no way to get around it and it cut through the trees and it, it cut through the river right next to me and you could tell that there, there was no water going through it so there was really no way to, to, um, to get over it somehow I picked up like pickaxes somewhere and started to try to climb up the wall Got to the other like side, and it was it was a beautiful place. But to me, it I also saw a lot of dead trees and a lot of stuff. And I, you know, when you mentioned its death, that honestly you know, makes me wonder. I don't know a lot about death. I'm willing to accept the fact that I'll die, but I'm honestly scared of what lies beyond. And it, it stretched on for as far as the eye could see. It never seemed to end. And with the, you know, with the. Uh, dead trees that started to pop up, you know, it's one of those things, that, what will it be like, and, and what is it really on the other side that I don't understand. I had, I had another student who, his barrier wasn't a wall, it wasn't a cliff, it wasn't a chasm, it was himself. He found himself on the path, a copy of himself, the sword. He had to fight himself to get past. He eventually won and he got to the other side. I had another another friend, my sister actually, not the sister, another one, who uh, got to the got to the wall. It was a transparent glass wall. She realized she needed to go on the other side, so she put her hand against it. And she fell, shattered to the ground. She walked through, and reconstituted itself. And she turned around, and her bear that had been her friend and helping her throughout the whole thing, uh, helping her understand everything that she found on her path. She turned around, and her bear was on the other side, looking, you know, lying at her on the side. So she put her hand on it again. The wall fell down, and her bear fell away through. Really There's so many different. I've seen other people, another student who saw castle gates, and on the inside of the castle, 
with her family. And she knew she had to get there, but she could tell the customers were fully closed. So she had to sprint to get to it. And then the barrier wasn't the closed gates, it was the closing gates. And was she fast enough to get there? Interesting. It's power, I, for me, uh, they're all powerful, but I'd like to see people's view on death specifically. I think a lot of people have a view that they don't actually like them. Yet. And a lot of people need to change it. And a lot of people, I think, wow, they, they have this little, they see it a little bit into their subconscious and they're like, wow, they realize that I'm so okay with life. Being okay with death shows a lot about being okay with life. If that makes sense. Is there anything else that somebody wants to share, not just about death, but about anything that we've, we've done before we, we close? Just to share my barrier. And my barrier was a cliff, like stretched on. It was fairly straight, I guess. Right to left, and I was emerging from a forest straight to the edge of the cliff, and then everything I saw on the cliff was desert, cactus, tumbleweed, <laughs> <death. laughs> um, as far as the horizon would go. And uh, I walked up to the edge of the cliff, and I just looked at it, and I was just like, I knew, I was like, there's no going back. And I was like, this is just another obstacle on, on my path, just another thing I need to get by. And I went back 20 paces, and then I sprinted 20 paces forward and jumped off the cliff. And as I fell, I pulled a parachute, <laughs> and I glided down to a walk. I just took the parachute off, and I was like, all right, here we go. And I just kept walking down to the death. <laughs> Me, so how many of you guys got past another the barrier? <laughs> My barrier was a tree that uh, fell over, and I looked at it, and I stepped over it because my map said I needed to keep going. <laughs> the barrier wasn't at the pinnacle of the mountain. And I left it for someone else to drink out of it. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> Again, there's a tendency to. Everything that you saw, everything that we've talked about, meant something. Some of it was super important to you, some of it was just a little passing detail that's not that important. It's not going to change your life if you know it or not. Ask yourself questions about what do things mean and what, what really it's, who am I now? Who do I want to be after now? Ask yourself those two questions. This is kind of to help you see kind of already how you see things. The next question is, how do I want to see things? So you can start making the, the steps to change those things. I'm going to try and gather the other two groups. We're already cutting into Cammy's time. So. <laughs> I felt like it was valuable and they learned something about themselves. Yes. <laughs> Who's done this more than once? I've done one somewhere. Who's done it more well, than it's, twice? This exact one, no. Who's done it more than three times? <laughs> Who's done it more than Liza? I will be. And Liza, do you get something new every time? I do, definitely. Those of you that have done it more than once. Powerful each time? It's yeah. cool. I love to see. It's powerful to do it again and see how you've changed in even just a space of a few months. So maybe we'll do this again sometime. Or you can do it for yourself. You can, if you took notes, do it, ask yourself the same questions. Take yourself through the journey again and see how things have changed for yourself. There's a part two to this, and it's an assignment. Most of you, if not all of you, all of you should have, if you haven't, go do it, should have written the My Story Challenge that Cami asked everybody to do. Who has not completed that yet? To be honest, I haven't. <laughs> so, do that. Now here's the cool thing, is now you have a second story to write. Not just your future story, but write the story that you just lived. Okay. Wait, you want us to write another story? I want story? you to write, not, not the same as the story that she said, but the vision quest you just went through, write it. Okay. Write that story. 
write it however you want, write it in a, in a third person as though it happened to somebody else, write it in this is exactly what happened to me, write it in Oliver said this and then I thought this. I, I write it however you want, but write it in such a way that A, you'll remember it well, you can go back to it and see what, how it was, and B, you can show it to somebody else and have them be moved by it. Okay? Not just one of them, but both. How long do you recommend it be? I recommend it be at least a page. Okay. Um, but is 10 pages too much? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's the reason the book is always better than the movie, is because you can have 10 pages on something that, in a movie, there's, you can't make it more than like 20 seconds. Okay. It's like, dang. Uh, <laughs> anyway, just say. <laughs> anyway. So who commits to me to write their vision quest story? Everybody? Okay. What am I committing to, sweetheart? Oh. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for participating in that. It's super fun, super awesome. We've taken up enough of Cammy's time. So, once again, I'd like to bring up the awesome Cammy Mitchell. Yeah, <laughs> About this podium, Oliver. <laughs> no, I mean, yes. <laughs> um, later. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe not at all. <laughs> I will let you know. Okay, we we have our <laughs> we have our one session director who was broken down on the side of the road. He finally made it. Nathan Reed. Nathan, let's give you a round of applause. Marketing and if you're on Facebook, he does all of the cool little Sago We Do pictures and fun little sayings and stuff like that. He's our marketer. They will come in soon. Um, before I get into teaching you some different concepts, I want to introduce someone. I'm going to have him share something that this is YFF 2015, right? And Ephraim's helping us, like, we're going to go and like just do this type of a thing. Me and Jonathan have been working on. Like, how, how can we grow, how can we get more youth into this program? And so, I'm going to let him introduce something that he and I have been working on. For, it's been a couple of years. Jonathan is my younger brother. That I used to have, like, he's been a counselor for YFF. He com comes into the trainings all the time. and He's a personal development guru. He speaks in front of thousands of people and touches lives like crazy. We were in a, a training, I can't remember who it was that was like, man, when your brother Jonathan taught me about Meet Your Counselor, and I brought, I still have my 100% popsicle stick from him when he still, when he taught me this and this, I'm like, oh my gosh, Jonathan, he moves people. Um, he's going to just share with, with us something that is in the works on, on in, like getting even more, more youth into our program, perhaps a completely different type of kids because right now like we have cream of the crop kids that are just like you guys that are just on their edge of their seat going I want more I want more I want to change the world I want to find my purpose I want to run with it oh my gosh he's going to introduce a, a different concept to us maybe that that there's other kids that are absolutely struggling with with the law and with being a part of their family and with being loved and being and trusting themselves and having integrity those kind of kids We've got a different option, and, and I'm just going to have him introduce just some things that we're thinking about and some ways that we could grow YFF and see if you guys would be like, yeah, let's totally do that. It would be a different venue but our same program. So help me welcome my brother, Jonathan Rose. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. No pressure, right? None. <laughs> well... How many here feel like you're in where you're supposed to be? Me too. You guys have some serious energy in this room and some beautiful power. Because I wasn't planning on being here today, but I'm like, something's pulling me this way. <laughs> and so I ended up here. Um, I was not planning on talking, but I will take the opportunity to share something I believe will bless a lot of people. How many here want to do something in this world, in this life, that helps other people? Me too. I've looked for ways to help people, serve people, love people my entire life. 
And I found different ways, different methods to be able to do that. One of them is YFF, right where you are right now. It's one of my favorite ways to help people. And through this lifelong journey and craziness, um, we've ran into different opportunities. And there's one where about four years ago, me and my sister got a chance to go in and sit down through a program where some people who don't have parents to help them guide them on a healthy path, who don't have someone to tell them, you know what, you're a good kid, I love you, you can do this, I believe in you, hug them in the morning. Sometimes they do have those things, but they chose to follow other paths. But anyways, they find themselves on the other side of the law because they've stolen a car, because they've done drugs, they've gone into some pretty bad stuff, right? And it can get a lot worse. And so they end up in court, and the court says, you know what? Um, your, your infraction was at this level. If you continue to go, you're going to end up in jail for the rest of your life. So we're going to give you an option. You go through this course over here with a parent or with a guardian, with anybody that can stand by you, that, that can vouch for you, and we will actually let you expunge your record. And we will help you so you don't go back into your life of crime. And 83% of the people that go through that program don't go back out there and reoffend the law. Where the average here, if they don't go through that program, is the exact opposite. 83% that go and make a, a, have a problem immediately go back out there and redo it again and again until it's such a large crime that they, they're stuck in jail for the rest of their lives. So me and Cammie went to this program and we sat down with the youth who are in that place. It is not the youth that we usually see at YFF. <laughs> there is a very large difference. And we said, wow, um, we are really working with the cream of the crop with the people who we're working with. And recently we've had the opportunity to bring that program that's in Las Vegas, running in Vegas, to Utah. And I don't want it to be after the fact that the kids messed up, that we're teaching them how to fix themselves, but I want it to be before any child goes and makes that mistake. So preventative. And we're gonna bring that, that, uh, that program to Utah and we want it to be for everyone. And everybody who comes through our program, it's called the Reset Utah Program. After they go through our program, if, if we decide that we run a, a separate event for YFF for the ones who have gone through the troubled stuff, then we're gonna have to train you guys how to deal with that. If we decide it's only the cream of the crop that's coming through the program on this one, awesome. Guess what, we get to sponsor all of those guys to go to YFF, which takes YFF from this to this. We have 40,000 families we can shift off over to YFF and have you guys have a whole summer long worth of stuff and hopefully make enough money you guys can get paid a bunch of money. How many would you like to be paid even more than you're getting paid now to do what you're doing? Okay, all right, it's okay. <laughs> they all look amazing. <laughs> me too, I had my hands in the air. Um, I, uh, for, for some reason, I want to ask this question. How many here know the four um, levels of YFF? Like we got four, yeah, there's four sessions, but there's four levels. That's what you're t you call them, right? The four levels. Come up here and t share the four levels. I want to hear them real quick. Oh, okay, so Oliver was just, he showed the, the theme, right? The say, go, be, do, that per power of purpose, that kind of stuff. So what it is to me, level one is about identity. Level two is about connection. Direction. Level three is about direction. Yeah. And level four is about becoming. Now, the, the reason why I asked that question, the fourth level, it's becoming, right? Throughout my life, I, I feel like I've gone through those phases, each one, one at a time, stepping through. And sometimes you have to go back and, and relearn one or two as you're going through. It's like, oh, wait a second, I gotta reset a little bit. Okay, now I'm going, now I'm on the right path. 
But it brings us to the fourth level, which is becoming and doing, acting, and actually living your purpose, right? Um, that's why I'm here in front of you right now. Because I know that one part of my mission, one part of, of my direction where I'm going, is actually to bring this program to Utah. And it is happening. On the 21st of March, we are, we are actually having the very first launch of this program. And we're not going to just um, invite the people that are having pr problems in Las Vegas to come. This is actually for you. We would like you to come. Normally this would be anywhere between $100 to $500 for the, for the class because the person presenting it is fantastic. It's one of our mentors. In fact, Cami is about to teach you a little piece of what she learned through this program. It's fantastic. And so I would like to extend an invitation to all of you as YFF because YFF will become associated with Reset Utah because I would like to send all of these youth that want a better life and to figure out what they want in life to learn how to find direction, how to find purpose, how to say go be do first of all, right? And then how to become through counselors like you guys who care about them and love them and can show them a higher road. So for you guys to know where they're coming from, I think it's kind of important for you to know where they're, where they're coming from and actually come through the program and see it yourself. So um, Cami ha has the invitation on, in email format mm -hmm. and I will have her send it all out to all of you. But I want you to write down on your papers right now, all of you, the 21st of March at 8 o'clock in the morning at Dixie University. I'm going to be renting out two buildings there to run the program. And uh, there's a fun part of the program that I would also, this is up to you now, because remember those, those, those kids who come through the program, they come with a guardian or a parent or somebody like that. Now if you are a parent, <laughs> and you have an 18-year-old kid or a 14-year-old kid, <laughs> you're welcome to bring them. <laughs> that would be really crazy here in this, in this group. But um, if you would like, bring your parents. Bring your brother, bring your sister. And I guarantee you, when you leave that program, you'll begin to understand your mom a little bit better. She'll begin to understand you a little bit better. And you will have the integrity within yourself to be responsible for all of your own actions. Um, that is, if you listen and assimilate, I can say it with pretty much guarantee in this group that that's what's going to happen. Because you guys, who loves truth? I love how fast your hands went up on that one. Okay, that was faster than the money. That was, that, that's saying something. <laughs> Wait, let's do the money one again. Okay, okay, let's try that again. Who wants a lot of money? <laughs> okay, good. Oh, okay. Good. Print money. Again. Um, I would love to help you all get a lot more money and a lot more integrity and a lot more happiness and truth in your life. And that's why I'm extending the invitation to you guys. It's, it's part of my mission and part of who I am. And I would love to show it to you so you can see if it's part of your mission and who you are. Because um, if it is, this is the beginning of it and I'm going to need some counselors to help us out through it too. Because, and I am directly going to be linking this program to YFF as a feeder program to bring more and more youth to you. So with that, I think that's what you wanted me to share. Yeah. But uh, I love you guys. You guys are in the right place at the right time. And uh, thank you for what you're doing for these kids. Who is presenting at it? What's his name? His name is Mark. What's his last name? I know his last name. He's Mark, and he is booked out for the rest of the year. So this is the one time I can get him. So, and he is booked out for a lot of money. <laughs> Any other questions? Can you give an example of something like an activity or like a principle or just like what? Yes. Responsibility and integrity. That's the, the those are the two main things. They're gonna, it's, it's a huge parenting seminar. It's a huge about the youth. I'm just totally taking it inside. So those two principles they're going to show over and over and over and over. And I'll teach you something. Yes. From what she's about to teach is coming directly from the seminar itself. Um, and I won't, we won't touch into that because I want you to get the full value of what she's going to teach. 
and you'll get it again in an entirely different format from Mark, who is awesome and crazy. Um, is there any more questions? Wait, where at this university? Okay. Um, Will that be in the email? It, it should be in the email, and it's called. I have. Yeah, it'll be in the email that she sends out. Does she? Does everybody? Has everybody given Cammy your email? Make sure to give it to her, and she will send you all that uh, information tonight. Anybody not, sure not have their did information? Did not get your email on that page, then get it. Wait, let us give you a round of applause. Let's hear it for Jonathan! Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I had Mark drag this in for me. Okay, so this is a representation of us, okay? So this is this little person, you see it? You see it? You see it? Yeah. <laughs> All of these little ping pong balls are um, stuff that if I squoze you, wouldn't be so pretty. Does that make sense? Not the orange juice. Right? <laughs> the, not the orange juice. This is the, is it going to be lemon? Rotten. Rotten. It's got to be yellow. Yeah, Pumpkin like, hus. Ah! Oh! Ah! Too yeah! far. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Thanks for that. That's that was like, just like, a band I hate word. that word. I hate it. That's great that you said that. Ew, I don't want to touch that. Okay, so there is all sorts of the negative emotions, the negative thoughts, the, the most of our projections of what's wrong with the world and what's wrong with everybody else. It's actually... It's all right here, and it's down inside. And you can get a mentor and they can reach down inside and pull that out and it's really painful. Or, I have a new idea of something we can do. Okay, so this is us cleaning out the insides because we want to take care of what's on the inside. And so if, if all of this icky is inside, we want it to get out, right? So hugs are a great way to pull it out, is what we're, we're discovering. This is um, emotions and energy travel through water. Did you guys know that? Like they travel just like water does. So actually, when you go and work out and you sweat, guess what else is coming out besides the sweat in your body? Emotions. Negative emotions. That's why exercising is so healthy for us. So through water, if I help raise your energy, Okay, so anything that raises your energy is, is a symbol of the water, okay? So if we do something like, hmm, when we came back from lunch, what was happening? Dancing. Dancing. Who started that anyway? Jay Lee. Oh, Jay Lee. Did you remember her intention? What was her intention? Share. She loves to play here, but she wanted to learn how to share, play. What do you guys think? Did she do a good job? And she goes, but Cammie, I'm up here dancing all by myself. I'm like, stick with it. And look what happened. Is that cool? You can cry. I love you. Okay, so dancing raised our energy. So we started dancing with Jay Lee. We're like, Jay Lee, that looks fun. You're dancing. And then Daniel started twerking. Online, they want to learn. They're like, what? It's in the knees. Okay, what's happening when we just raised our energy? What's happening to all of the negative stuff that's deep inside us? It's coming up. So what's another thing that we could do to raise our energy? What's another activity? Serve. Serve. If we go and serve, look what happens. Hugs. What? Hugs. Hugs. Oh, if we start squeezing people like we do at YFF, look what's happening. What else? Affirmations. Affirmations, absolutely. Declarations say, I have value. Screaming it in the morning. What else? Laughter. Laughter. <laughs> oh, laughter came through. Yeah. <laughs> we like laughing. What else? <gasps> Discussions. What's happening? <laughs> oh my goodness. All this, all this junk is coming up to the surface. And what was the one you said? Discussions and learning together, right? And we and we do that. Oh my gosh, what's happening? 
jacuzzi. <laughs> Guess what? Sometimes we do an activity, like we have a discussion, and, and we raise our energy, and stuff falls out. And sometimes we go, oh, it was that discussion. That did this to me. That's the reason I feel like this. Those darn discussions. And when I danced, oh, I felt horrible about myself. That's just awful. I just am never going to dance again. You guys see what's happening? And then when someone came and hugged me, Ew, I got all angry inside and all this anger came out and stop touching me, what are you doing? I hate hugs and touches, it's just gross. Awkward. And this gets awkward, right? <laughs> A lot of times when we raise our energy, the things that we do to raise our energy start pulling these negative emotions, negative thoughts out of our inside so that they can come out and we can cleanse them and let go forever. But a mistake that we make, I make it too, is, oh man, that one activity, that's the reason that this came to be. What's the truth? Uh, all all it was totally there and from something completely unrelated. But I raised my energy to where it could come out. Right? Does that make sense? Do you guys have any negative emotions, negative thoughts sitting inside your body? Yeah? No? Yeah. Just me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody go like this. If you're human, okay, Ephraim's an exception, but all the rest of <laughs> You just come in the dog fight. Oh, yeah. oh, shit! Ephraim's totally equal. We're, we're all equal. Yeah. Taking him back out. What? <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was a joke. Okay. That's fine. All right. So. The things that we do at the trainings, the things that we do at the conference, the things that I would do if I'm mentoring you, all are to raise your what? Energy. Your energy. Things start popping out all over the place. And a lot of the kids, when we do these types of things, they'll be like, oh, I just want to cry. I don't even know what's wrong with me. It's important that we know what's truly happening. That it wasn't the activity that caused the negative piece to come out. We don't want these things to live down inside us. Our subconscious mind cannot contain this. It has to find where in your body can I hide this if you're not willing to let it go, if you're not willing to look at it and feel it and understand it and validate it. It's like a two-year-old. Mom, watch me, watch me, watch me, watch me. I'm like, Aah! And then I'll go, okay. <clears throat> I'll just find a new place to land. And it'll stay there until I raise my energy, raise my energy, and, and then it can come out again. And what we don't want to get caught in is blaming everybody else in the world and the surroundings and the activity for what just happened. Instead of getting so excited that that just happened because it brought this to the surface. Does that make sense? Okay, what's happening in your minds right now? <laughs> Yeah. So I have a question. Okay. So when when you raise your energy level and those negative things come out, come out, you said that sometimes we'll stuff it back in. Like, what's how do you get rid of it instead of stuffing it back in? Okay. So, for example, so what happens is that the negative you can watch it body language wise. It's amazing. So if I stood up here or, or had Michael come back up here or had someone pull up and we start clapping for him, getting excited and raising his energy and pointing it to him, right? You'll see it travel through his body. And if, if he starts doing this, where is it? And it's, it's like literally we, we are standing in the liquid. And as the liquid rises, his knees will start going. And then, and then he'll be doing this type of thing because the liquid's raising because the energy's coming in. You watch it. It's coming in. And then it comes up through the chest. And you'll either see them gate, or do this, or turn away. When it's right here at the throat, they'll start clearing their throat. <clears throat> no, I can't. No, stop clapping. Stop all this good. <laughs> I'm going to choke. Like, seriously, stop it. No, really. And if we continue to let, because that's how we stuff it down, is we'll go, stop. This is so uncomfortable. Ah! And start swallowing it and pushing it back down. 
But if we allow it to keep coming through us, the goodness, the energy that comes in, it'll pop out right here a lot of times. You get me? Okay? You'll see the smile. You'll actually, as the water comes up, you'll see him go. Because if I was putting you in a bucket of water, when it got to this level, what would you do with your head? Ha <laughs> I can't breathe. <laughs> I'm really uncomfortable right now. No, I think I'm going to die. <laughs> and it's goodness. And our subconscious thinks that we're seriously going to die. Like we're literally drowning. And so their chin comes up and they're like, <gasps> Okay, I think you guys should stop complimenting me and stop loving me so big. And if we keep doing it and allow it, then it comes out right here a lot of it, and we just saturate their whole entire self with goodness. It works, doesn't it, Bryce? It works, it works, it works. So, does yeah. that answer your question mm -hmm. on how we can keep it? Yeah. So, as much as I'd like to think I have crowds following me around clocking all the time, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, what do I do okay, like, when it's just me? Those? That's exactly where I want to go. So, because on, on a daily basis, we don't, right? Jordan have YFF, just following us around going, oh, you're the coolest person ever, keep going, we encourage you, life is awesome. Can we move this back? I'm going to wander around, thank you, honey. Okay, so how do we raise our energy? Because it's on a personal level, on a daily basis, how do we raise our energy? And it's not always from other people. In fact, if you can figure out how to raise your own energy, Right? So we already started making a list. Let's continue it. Guys, I went to BYU. <laughs> Guys, I totally got it the other day. Part, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to share with you the biggest nugget I got in graduating from BYU in mathematics. Okay? Is how not to erase a board. <laughs> because <laughs> if I'm in front of my class and I'm teaching junior high and I'm erasing the board like this, then my, can you even see? <laughs> Let me make sure you can see. Okay, so when I erase like this, what happens right here? It wiggles! And so the audience would be like... Mark's outside. They see. Yeah, Mark, we're keeping him outside on this okay. side. Oh, I'm just kidding. So they taught us that instead of going back and forth with the erasing, you go up and down. Just watch Aw. <laughs> it just totally holds still, so your attention is not going to be to my rear end. It will be to what I'm saying. Of course. You guys are welcome. That is a huge nugget. Okay? You're welcome. <laughs> you can clap for that. I know. <laughs> take away from YFF trainings. And that's all you learned to be right And that, hey, I didn't say it's all I learned. It was the most important piece to me. I would have applauded more if there was, but like, oh man, I gotta go back to this. I gotta go back. I'm just gonna unlearn it then. Okay, so how can we raise our energy? You guys, I, I did this with my eight year old. Okay, I, and I need to take a picture of his little list written in his own handwriting. All the different ways that he raises his own energy every single day. And he's got. His list. Yeah. I like to sing really loud in the car when I'm driving. Love it, love it. <laughs> okay, everybody turn to your neighbor. Give each other high five. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, guess what just happened? We just raised energy. Oh, you just said another one. Huge. When you're when you're wanting to raise your energy, and you're thinking, oh man, I wish I could raise my energy. <laughs> I just wish I knew how. I got an idea. That right there. Total shift. Total shift. Just music itself. Right kind of music. Yeah. Okay. I was gonna have you clarify. The right kind of music. Absolutely. What else? So I think like preparing physically, so like being healthy and well rested really helps. Totally. But also like There's illnesses and so when we were out there, we were meeting with this woman and she was like, the best advice I ever heard, she's like, just decide to love 
everything that everyone else hates. And so like the weather and like getting up in the morning, these things, we picked out things that everyone else hated and they always complained about it. We're like, wow. we're gonna love these things. So every morning we're like, we're gonna fake it. She's like, pretend like you're super excited to get up in the morning. And so like, you know, alarm goes off at like 6.30 or something. And I was like, I'm gonna die. <laughs> and Mikey behind me like jumps out of bed and she's like, good morning. I love being alive. I just like looked at her and I was like, I love it! We just, like, we just like were so obnoxious that we were like, like we faked it so badly that we were laughing right. at ourselves, which was like the point. If, either way, even if you're faking it and you sound terrible, right? Like it's you still, still get the same results. Yes. So like, it still happens. Yeah. I love it. The the mm -hmm. laughter. I love it. That kind of, like discussions, learning something. Um, what else? What else raises your energy? Jumping out of the airplane. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or scare me to death. What are you doing? Yeah. Oh. Um, honoring my feelings. And one big way that shows mm. up is I want to talk to somebody. And I'm kind of like, oh, but I'm going to shy. I'm going to shy this time. But talking to the person ups, raises my energy. Oh, okay. Stuff, uh, yeah, totally. Following, following those. So right? talk to the pretty girl. Do it. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Say things you love about yourself or others. <laughs> Say things you love about yourself for other hey, people. Or other. Oh, or other people. I was gonna. Or oh. both. Oh, right. <laughs> Say things you love about yourself and love about others. Because did you know what? Most likely they're the same. That's why you love it about someone else. Because you totally love it about you. You just don't know it yet. Yeah. All right. So a little tidbit about me. I love tickling and wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> get him! Get him! Get him! Get him! Um, <laughs> And I'm really sad that yeah, none no. of the Taylors are here because I have really fond memories oh. of tickling and wrestling like their whole family I all at the it. same I time. Because there's so many of them here. Heck yes. Don't worry, there will be brother in laws They'll be here. Yeah. There will be uh, Taylors. There will be Taylors. Listening is. Okay, Jordan. I like to get out of nature. Yeah. Nature is a huge teacher. Whoa. So taking a walk out, going talking to the tree, going and be. You guys, there is so many different ways to raise our energy. The thing is, it's really simple when we're all here together. We're like, oh yeah, everybody else is doing, I can do it, this is okay. But what happens when we go home and we're by ourselves? And we wake up going, oh, are you serious? Another day, oh. What do we do at that point in time, right? Oh, I just wanted to point something out, like, kind of going back to the 100% thing. Yeah. Like, I'm an introvert, and so I will go home after this date and just be wiped out. Bench. Being with all of you guys. <laughs> so, like, I have to be conscious of my own energy level. Like, my 100%, my high energy isn't as bubbly as yours. It's, right. You know, a lot different. Right. And if I tried to pretend like my high energy was your high energy, I would be so grumpy by the end of the day. So I have to be my high energy. Exactly. And you have to be yours. Totally. And, you know, deal with that. I love it. Okay, everybody, this is what happens to energy. Energy is always moving. Everybody put it out here. Okay? So if this is our energy, it is either growing. Now grow it. Grow it past your neighbor. Go, go into each other's space. It's okay. <laughs> or if it's not growing, what's happening to it? It's shrinking. Bring it in. Bring it in. Because what happens when our energy shrinks? You shrink. You totally shrink. You cover up. You gate. You Shrink down, you cover you, all that kind of stuff. I just got more. Awesome. So energy is constantly moving. And to become aware of when our energy is going like this or when our energy is going like this. Because who's in charge? Yes. Yes, I am in charge of me. And so I have the power to when it, I can feel it coming like this. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I've got to, I want to increase my energy. I want to grow it. So I'm going to pick one of these and do it. So I'm going to do this in the mirror like this. <laughs> ah, I'm telling you, I feel it. And, I, and it's like struggle. It's trying to come in on me. You guys, it seriously works like this. It's like, no, I will win. I will do this. Dang it, come on. And you can feel it when it goes and starts going out. And then you're like, ah, oh, now I can dance. Now I can dance. Watch me. 
And so it just is very important for you to start being aware of what's happening with your energy level. We can influence each other's energy level, can't we? But we cannot make someone's energy shrink or, or increase. That's all up to us. And so to be aware of when the youth, I want to get inside your head right now. <laughs> to be aware of what's happening when our youth's energy is shrinking versus when it's growing, it's important. It's important as the mentors and the counselors to pay attention to not only our own, but when the youth come in to pay attention to what's happening to them. So that's why you've got from now until June to start practicing understanding what's happening inside you. So you can start seeing it with others. And it's not like, oh, your energy's shrinking. We have to do something different. <laughs> oh my gosh, this whole thing won't work if yours keeps shrinking. That's not going to work so good. But to understand if it's going like this, to say, hey, you want to take a walk with me? I've got this awesome, awesome tree out there. I could take a walk. And then what happens when we're in nature? I'm helping shift it. Does that make sense? And so for us to be seriously aware of what's happening in our energy, the, this whole bubble, we are vibrating at a certain energy level. And blessings and miracles can only get into our life if we are vibrating at the same level. It is crazy, crazy. So if we're vibrating at a level 50, and we have a level 100 blessing that we're praying for and that we want, it cannot come in. Until we raise our energy. Oh my gosh, that's like so, so big. Is that too deep? Are you guys still okay? Yeah. <laughs> right? Did I just blow your mind? <laughs> and so, <clears throat> what we're doing, why we're having it clear in March, I'm inviting you to raise your energy on your own so that every single day when you wake up, you do some different activities. That you, you say your prayers, if that helps raise your energy. You look at your vision board, if that helps raise your energy. Or if I get mad at my, energy, my vision board because I haven't created something in the last month, what's really happening? I've got a ping pong ball that needs to come out. It has nothing to do with my vision board. You see that? But we blame it on the tools. Oh, Cammie said if I looked in the mirror and smiled, I'd get happy and I'm just angrier. <laughs> 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 that Cammie, good job, right? Look inside, there's going to be stuff that's coming out. And that, all of that, as it comes out, then we've changed. Now we're no longer at 50. We're at 80. Now I cleared that. Now we're no longer at 80. We're at, we're, at, we're at 300. And watch all sorts of things that wanted to come in before that couldn't can now come in. I have a little vibrational chart that they've scientifically mapped out. You want to turn those out? Thank you. Oh, yeah, I'll just let you do it. Okay, this is just a little cheat sheet to help you guys understand. Energy is, is oh, let me write it, let me write it. Where did I put my... Okay, emotions. How many of you guys have emotion? Phew, thank goodness. Okay, emotion. I'm going to cut it up for you. Okay, all that emotion is, is energy in motion. So it is either shrinking or it is expanding. And on the chart, you can see anything under 200 starts shrinking. The energy is, is totally collapsing inside of you and turning into a black ball if you don't listen to it and pay attention to it. Does that mean I have to crawl into it forever and get depressed and just totally go there? No. It's that, wow, oh my goodness, I'm headed, I've got, I'm mad, 
And now I'm going to get mad at myself because I got mad. Because I hate it when I get mad and I should be better than this. And I should always be happy. And now I'm talking myself into guilt. And now, oh my gosh, and I'm going to, I didn't make a mistake now, which is guilt. I am a mistake, which now I've just taken it to shame. The very bottom of the chart. Shame. 20. A vibrational level of 20. And no wonder when I'm sitting in shame, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to be around people. I don't want to smile. I don't want to dance. I don't want to change the world. I don't even want to get out of my jammas, for heaven's sakes. When I'm, when I'm resonating at a 20, there's nothing I want to do. I just want to be in that icky place. So if I can recognize, oh my goodness gracious, my energy is just totally coming down to a level of 20, how long do I want to be here? Well, I deserve to be punished, and I deserve to stay in this shameful place, and oh my goodness, right? We talk to ourselves like that, I do. Instead, I'm like, hey, I can recognize that I'm dropping into shame, and this is actually not where I want to be. So I can get, allow myself 20 minutes, and totally pamper myself, and get angry, and yell, and scream, and then I'm going to cry, and then I can be done, and I can let go of it. And then I want, and just doing that takes me from shame clear up to understanding. Where's understanding at? On the vibrational chart. What? 400. All of a sudden, I went from a 20 clear up to a 400 by understanding me. And saying, Cam, why am I sitting here in shame? What just happened? What just happened? And that's what I really feel like is happening right now. Oh, okay. Then I can go through Byron Katie's questions. Is it true? What I'm making up, this huge story that I'm just creating for myself, is it true? And I can go through those questions and go, you know what, I cannot absolutely say that this is true. So I can, if I choose to believe it's true, then it's gonna lead me down to shame and I'll sit at 20. But if I can see why I, like there's no peaceful reason for me to sit in this, this vibrational level of 20. I want to understand myself, get out of it, then all of a sudden I shift to a 400 by understanding myself and everything shifts. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so here's the thing with our raising energy, okay? Every day, I challenge us all, me heavily included, and I don't just do. I'm going to ask you guys to do three things in the morning and three things right before you go to bed. <clears throat> Hopefully you'll do tons and tons and tons of stuff all day long and through the day and through the next week and all that. But even when you're feeling like poop, nobody feels like poop around here, right? <laughs> I have those poopy days. When you feel like that, if I can still get those three things in in the morning and three things in at night, everything else will work out. I can pull through. And I, I'm so grateful to have my, my little 11-year-old, Andon, that I've taught him declarations. And so no matter how mommy feels, he comes and wakes me up in the morning and says, okay, let's do our declarations. I'm like, Andon, I don't want to do it today. He's like, come on, mom. Get up, get up, get up. Having an accountability partner, huge. Guess what we have? <laughs> Accountability partners on Facebook. Check in with each other. Say, holy cow, I got my, st my stuff done. I raised my energy six times today. That kind of stuff, and we can encourage each other. This is, a, this, this is a self thing. This isn't something you do for everybody else. This is totally about you. And the miracles that we want coming to us, the kids that we want coming to us, you listening to that? The, thing, the changes that we want to make, we have got to raise our energy in order to attract them into our, into our program, into our lives, into the world, right? Okay. Um, one, of the, one of the raise your energy activities I want to do with you guys. Do I have time? Do I have time? Do I have time? Time will make time. I know, I'm trying to figure out if, that's, if it needs to be pushed back. We'll see. 
stay later. Let's do it. <laughs> I'll stay later. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. It's you and me, baby. <laughs> Come to your house afterward. <laughs> Come to your house. Yeah. Ah. yeah. Hold on, let me check in for just a second. And leave him to the side and go to the back of the room. You guys will still love me after, right? Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of dirty ping pong, <laughs> but, uh, we don't want to lose them. Okay, guys, let's let's take the chairs and just push them like up to the front of the room so we have a little more room. Don't grab my stuff first. What kind of dirt is it going to completely once we're done don't move now so in a moment but not now this is um, this activity I want you to totally focus on what's happening to your energy because at first most energy during this beginning goes like this and what what causes the energy to come in or go out do you guys know so our thoughts that lead to the feelings, right? Okay, so if I think, oh, this is so embarrassing, then which way is my energy going to go? Because I'll believe that. That's my story that I'm going to attach to. It's totally going to cave in. If I think, oh my gosh, this is so free, then what happens to my energy? And we have the power to choose which it's going to be. But most of us struggle at the beginning of this and it starts caving in. A lot of us who've been with, with YFF, we've done this several times and we know and we're just like, woohoo, yes, just raise my energy from the beginning. But if it's your first time, it might not work like that. I want you to pay attention to what happens because your thoughts create the shrinking or the, or the like growing your energy. Sandra, thank you. Okay, so just pay attention to what's going on. Okay, we're going to spread out the three rules that I want you all to agree with. Okay, number one is no talking. Okay, what's rule number one? No, no talking. Awesome. <laughs> gotcha! gotcha! I haven't committed you to start yet. Okay, so Number two is close your eyes. Already, already, what's happening here that's causing? Is your energy going like this or is it going like this? Already with two rules. Is that crazy? Okay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> good, good, good. We're totally expanding. Open your arms then, if you love them so much. Awesome. Look at that. Okay, rule number three is to shake. Okay. Now, this whole thing is about energy. And this per the purpose in, in introducing this to you guys is to raise your energy. Pay attention to your self-talk, what's going on inside you, okay? What are the three rules? Number one? No, 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 no talking. No, no. Number two? Eyes closed. Eyes closed. How, how, how much? Just a little bit? I'll just like this. Oh, 100%. So for the whole activity, you're talking about your eyes. And so Tammy says, open them. Whoa. 
Number two is close your eyes. Number three is shake. Okay, everybody spread out okay. all over the room. Yeah. What, what? If there are those who do not want to agree to the rules, then we'll take you to another place while that activity goes on. Right. So if you ever, anybody want to, like, you get your want to agree to Affirmations. All of that kind of stuff. Vision boards. What was the first one you said? Um, prayer? No. no. Say hello. Today, say hello. Yes. Say hello to someone. Give someone five. Oliver. I'm going to sing in Portuguese. Sing in Portuguese. <laughs> sing out loud. Sing in the shower. Absolutely. Sing Mark was singing in the, in the shower the other night. I was loving it. I'm like, sing for me. That's not what I was singing. He really was singing in the shower. It was lovely. I loved it. I'm like, Mark, you were singing in the shower. Normally he showers at six in the morning, and I'm in in bed, so he can't like sing in the shower. So it was really fun. It was so when we did that dance thing, <laughs> like all the dance, were you guys just watching us? Which time? Just now? Yeah. During the meditation? No, I was doing it with you. You were watching it. Yeah, he ran my music. Bits and pieces, but I took my turn. Like my dance chair. moves, awesome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure you were like there. way back in the corner. Yeah. Do you want some feedback? You guys want feedback on your? Yeah. <laughs> I, was I, was I was hoping you recorded it because I wanted to see. I was like, I'm having way more fun now than I ever do at any dance. I'm going to dance like this. Next time, I hope you do. Next time you do it, bring a GoPro and like put a like a mount so it faces you the whole time and just like then you can watch yourself. Ask you I was one person who went and grabbed his hand. I tried. It was before, like, yeah. so terrible. It wasn't, it wasn't my idea. I heard about it last year from uh, from Oliver. Yeah. And I, I still don't even know who did it, but um, from last year. But that, like, kind of touched me. So I, I love it. Yeah. And then uh, I was, uh, and I realized, like, okay, this could be weird if I touch parts of them. So I started going like this. And I started like, and then I was like, maybe they won't be so threatened if I touch their head first, then, or like work the way down. And then like, once they, once they realize that I shake their hand and then they're not being touched anymore, I think they'll get it. Oh my gosh, that's funny. Yeah. Okay, last year we had, we did it on the boys, one of the boys talked to him and I gave the rules. Yeah. He thought, I meant shake hands. And so he went around closing his eyes, shaking his hand. Yeah. It was really cool. And what's awesome is it was perfect. Because there's no right way to do that and no wrong way to do that. Exactly how you did it was exactly how you should have done it. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, all conflict begins with me. When I first saw that statement, I'm like, what? Ever. What? Ever? No way! No way, man! I can tell you all sorts of times when it didn't begin with me that it wasn't my fault. All conflict begins with me. Conflict takes three different people. The good guy, the bad guy, and the hero. Okay, so in our stories, none of us ever write ourselves into the bad guy role. We just never do. And even the ones that who we all think are bad guys, if you ask them, they're not the bad guy. What are they? The victim. The victim. They're the good guy. And you guys, and so net, like at, at our in our April training, we'll play with this. But understand, we have a favorite role that we like, and we we influence others to play into our conflicts, so that we can play the hero, the enabler the rescuer, the one that swoops in and saves the day, right? Or we play the victim. It wasn't my fault. If this happened and this happened and we justify ourselves into it. There's, there's three types of business. So we're gonna get into this a lot more with, uh, with our April training, but I, wanna, I want you guys to start thinking about it so that the, the seed is planted. So, Katie's teaching me that there's three types of business. Mine, yours, my business, your business, and God's business. Okay? Just 
just want to plant a seed. A lot of the, a lot of the mentoring and, and stuff that we're going to be doing is going to come back to this. My business, your business, and God's business. So if everything can fall into those three categories, if I'm feeling, like if the, if the negative emotions that are coming out of me are loneliness, what I'm learning about that is that if I leave myself mentally and jump into here and start worrying about your business and start living your life and thinking if she, if she did this and changed this, then everything would work out awesome for her. As long as I'm worrying and taking care of someone else and thinking like that, I'm in your business and who's taking care of me? And so I have this empty shell here where mentally I'm totally taking care of someone else and feeling really lonely because of it. Because I'm not in my own business okay I'm, I'm just planting a seed here we're going to be mentoring you through this stuff and as you get the book from from Katie holy cow it's going to really solidify this but I want I want to introduce you to the concept I want you to start thinking whose business am I in what's happening because it because what Katie's going to set up for us in this book is if I feel stressed if I feel lonely, if I'm feeling these unclean emotions, it's most likely because I'm not in my own business. And so anytime I'm in either of these types of business, conflict is going to arise. If I'm going to be the hero and rescue somebody, guess whose business I'm in? Does that make sense? Because I see them, oh, as the poor victim, and I'm going to be able to step in and help them and solve all their problems. So the, the owner of the duplex says, give me your rent. He's the bad guy. The renter says, I can't, I can't, I can't come up with it. I just don't have the money. He's the good guy. I just can't come up with the money. The mom says, oh, my gosh, my poor daughter can't come up with the money. I'm going to get in her business. I'm going to save the day and be the enabler and be the rescuer, come through for her, and I'm going to pay her rent. And now everything's good, right? What's going to happen the next month? She's going to not pay the rent again. The same thing. Because guess who's not feeling the consequences of her own choices? This is huge, huge, huge. Like, shift everything in our lives. Like, if we start thinking about this, and, and I'm just barely introducing it, so it's okay that you guys are like, okay, whoa, <laughs> my head is too heavy. Oh my gosh. This is, I want you to start taking a look at when you're feeling the stress, and the emotion is the, the big key here. It's the red flag. Hey, something's going on. Okay, back up. Whose business am I in? Okay, oh, I'm in my husband's business. That's why I'm getting so stressed out. I'm going to let him take care of his life and his business. I'm going to go back to taking care of me. Laura. Okay, two questions. Okay. One, can you define conflict a little bit better? And two, is it ever okay to be in someone else's business? Okay, great question. That's awesome. So what is conflict, guys? What is conflict? How do you guys define it? You don't feel like you're in your equilibrium and you're not feeling, for me, I hate conflict. Uh, sometimes you have to do it sometimes, but I don't enjoy it. And so I know if I'm not like all excited and happy about life, I'm like, something's wrong. Okay, so and if then, she's not all excited about life, something's wrong. Does that make sense? So that's a piece of conflict for her. Am I getting that right? I think conflict is not, well, conflict always has opposition, but opposition isn't always conflict. Ooh. So that's because there's two opposing forces. Semantics. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so Katie says all problems are imagined. Does that mean we don't have problems? No. It means if I'm having a problem and I define it as a problem, then guess what it is? It's a problem. But if I'm going through something and I define it as oh, God's hand is in my life, 
the reason that I was supposed to go through that experience through the garage and get all that stuff stolen was for me to learn to be present with Mark and for me to obey, like if that thought comes in, take care of it and acknowledge the fact, hey, I'm, I'm doing this in my head, give me 10 seconds, I'll take care of it and then I can totally be 100% present if I saw it as that. Instead, I have two choices. So I can see it as, oh my gosh, woe is me, all of this stuff got stolen, this is horrible, and life stinks, and people are evil. Make sense? Or I can see it as, this was supposed to happen. How do I know it was supposed to happen? Because it did. Because it did. It happened, so it was supposed to happen just like that for me to learn and to grow. Yeah? Okay, but we're in, like, so... I guess like my question is, what is the right balance between caring for others and being in their business in the sense of taking care of others versus really being in their business? Beautiful, beautiful. Oh my gosh, so that's like a five-day seminar, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so in, in, the, in the triangle, of uh, rescuer. We call this person the victim, but the truth is, they're all victims. Okay, and in April, we'll put you in scenarios and show you and just switch it and have you play each of the roles and see how every single one feels like the victim. Okay, when I'm rescuing Laura, when I'm rescuing someone, I am a victim too. If my purpose is to serve versus to please, these are completely different things. Service has no expectations, no manipulation to cook you dinner because I love you and I love to cook dinner and I'm gonna leave it on your on your doormat. I don't know, I don't care if you know who it's from. I don't care if you eat it. I don't care about any of those things. I don't care if you get mad that I left you dinner. And how could you? I can cook dinner for myself, you big rude somebody. <laughs> right? What matters to me is that I loved cooking dinner and I love you so much I'm gonna cook you dinner and leave it for you. No strings. Okay? That's service. That's helping. Yeah. I just wanna say that I think what you're pointing at is that when, and what you're saying, is that when whatever you're doing or whatever's going on, like even the scenario you gave like with the daughter and paying the rent, the thing is, is what you're really pointing to is that you, you're being that way, like you're being the victim and you don't know you're being the victim. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it's actually like, I don't have any, almost any say over it because I don't have any idea that I'm doing it. I don't, it's in my blind spot. I don't know what's going it's on. It's your box. So it has me would be more accurate to say like the rescuer has me. Like I can't stop being the rescuer. I don't know how to stop doing wow. it. I don't even know I'm doing it. How could I stop doing that? That's so that's so kind true. of like, that's what your point is. So you just start to get to see where am I doing that? And then you can just stop it if it's not working. If it's not, if it's, is that, is that my sense? Is that the, the water that the fish is swimming in? What water? Yeah. I don't have any water. That's, are you kidding me? It's the box that we're, we're living in. So that's service. Pleasing is a whole different animal. Pleasing is the, the, the enabler, the rescuer, that has no idea that that's what they're doing. And they swing in and with all sorts of manipulation, well, I'm going to cook Laura dinner because when I do, she's going to love me and then we're gonna be closer, and then life for me is gonna be awesome. So here's dinner, and you throw it. I'm like, oh, but I made you dinner so you would love me more and you don't love me more. Oh my gosh, what should I do now? What should, I know, I'll cook her dinner and dessert. That's what I'll do, because then she'll surely love me, and she'll thank me like this, and she'll do this and do this. It's all about it's not about the service and it's actually not about helping you. Does that make sense? So a lot of times if a parent, and this, this is the piece that from Reset, if the parent jumps in to save their child without even knowing what they're doing, 
it's actually about the parent. Because, well, you're my son, you're 11 years old, and you're not getting your report done. And it's so important to me that you get re your report done because I want you to get a good grade and I want you to look like cause you're my son and it matters. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to help you and I'm going to just go ahead and do the report for you because you're in a really big mess and you have your feelings hurt and I'm just going to go ahead and do the report for you and you're going to hand it in and put your name on it. Who's that all about? It's totally about me. It's, if my son doesn't do his report, then I then he doesn't do his report. And if he doesn't get the consequence of not doing his report, well, how will he ever learn? He knows if I keep doing that, he knows, hey, I don't got to do my report because guess who's going to step in? My mom. She sure wants that A. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense? It's crazy, crazy different. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think in that situation, it also teaches the kid, it trains the kid, I'm better at living your life than you are. Yeah, totally. And that could take years to... To undo, to undo for, that, for that child. Yeah. yeah, I know better than you do. And so I better step in and, and take care of you the way that I know to do it. That's being in someone else's business. Does that make sense? We can help and we can influence. But when we step into someone else's business and try to... If, like, I'm worried about someone... I'm in someone else's business. If I want to truly help somebody, I'm going to say a prayer for them and see them getting everything that they ever wanted and the happiness and the joy coming to them. But if I'm sitting there worried, going, oh my gosh, oh, she shouldn't be dating him. He's a creep. What's going on? Uh, that's her path. Her path is perfect for her and my path is perfect for me and I need to get back on my path. And I know we're just barely, like, I'm just throwing this out there. And so you're going to have all sorts of questions. I'm so excited about it. I'll take one more question, and then we're, we're going to get some time with Ephraim. So with this, it makes sense that you're, it's all about setting boundaries. Like, my mom's a mental health therapist, and she, anytime I feel conflict, she draws a circle for me. Because I'm like, Mom, therapy me. She's like, no, you're my daughter. I'm like, please teach me something so I don't feel conflict. <laughs> so she draws a circle, and she's like, okay, this is your circle of control. You're upset about this because you wanted somebody to act a different way. Is that in your circle of control? And I'm like, no. And she's like, okay, what's in your circle of control? Thoughts. How do you think about this? There you go. You change it. And there I'm you like, go. Oh. Okay, so you see what she did. She took you out of here and put you back in there. Yep. Makes sense? So she's putting you back in. What? If it's my business, I have control over it. Does that make sense? I have no control over it. So, when you're so worried about if you hurt somebody else, if you went big, it might hurt somebody else. Whose control were you in? Whose business were you in? Worrying that you might hurt us. Does that make sense? So if you stopped worrying about us and just said, you know what, I'm gonna go big, cause I'm gonna go big. And if you bump someone on the way, you'll be like, hey, sorry about that. And then go big. <laughs> make sense? Because you're imagining that you might hurt someone stops you from, from who you are. And that's you getting in all of our business. Does that make sense? Okay. <gasps> I know, like that's just like some, I just want to drop those into your mind so you can start thinking about it because we're going to so play with that over, over the, in the group mentoring calls and in the, the April retreat and stuff. But right now... <laughs> Give a huge Youth for Freedom welcome to Ephraim Olszewski! Wow. So I just really want to start by saying thank you. Cammie told me how incredible everybody is. And um, I just really want to acknowledge you all for being here. And it's Saturday and I imagine you all have lives and things that you could be doing. And you're here. And you're here committed to making a difference in the world. So one of the things that I'm clear about is that if we empower kids and we transform the kids in the world, we transform the world because kids are the future of the world. So um, I'm not really going to tell you anything about me. Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a little bit about me. So I, um, I think I'm doing this right. <laughs> How long did you go to BYU? 
Yeah, see, I got this in like five minutes. And <laughs> <laughs> so. a lot less money. <laughs> it just cost me a rental car and gas to get here. So, um, so let's see. Cammy, I don't know when I met you, but I imagine it was like two or three years ago, something like that. And when I met Cammy, I was uh, I owned I lived in Salt Lake and I owned three call centers and the money was incredible. It was really great money. December 2011 was the best quarter we'd had and we'd done a half a million dollars in profit. It was good. And it was totally unfulfilling. There was just nothing there for me. And um, I'd had businesses in the past that hadn't worked out. And so I'd been on this roller coaster. And one morning, actually, uh, what essentially happened was I had a partner. And we went our separate ways. And the money went with him. And um, <laughs> so it was like one morning I woke up. And it was sort of this reality check of that something. It was, I had done this before. It's like I just created the same thing that I kept creating, that I created many times. I'd made a lot of money, I'd found a way to get rid of all of it. <laughs> and I thought, this must have something to do with me. And so that was really when, um, a couple months after that, I hired uh, the most, at that point, I hired, it was the most I'd ever paid for coaching. I hired this guy, it was $25,000 for 90 days. And um, it was great. It was sort of like the beginning of a transformation for me. And um, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. I grew up in a family, I was the middle of nine kids, and my dad made 30 grand a year. So the first time I ever had a new pair of clothes, I was 13, and it was a pair of jeans and a t-shirt from Walmart. So um, one of the things I always thought was having a lot of money would like solve all my problems, and, then, and there was this thing of being worthy. And it was like I was so set on being worthy and proving that I was worthy, and I thought if I just have a lot of money, then of course, then I'll be worthy. Right? Like, then I can prove it. Then I'll be enough. Then I'll be lovable. All of that. And um, I found out that's not the case. Money's great, but it doesn't, like, it won't make you happy. And it's just money. And um, I actually, we might talk about money. So how long do I have? Until six. Oh, wow. Oh, so we'll kind of like, okay. Well, we'll see where it goes. So here's another thing you should know about me. I don't plan anything. Like, I mean, I have an intention and a commitment in the way that I live my life, but when I come and I do something like this, last weekend I had uh, 22 clients in town, and um, I had nothing planned except the first 45 minutes of two days, and that was it. That was all I had planned. So you see, like, all my materials are here on them. <laughs> and um, so I really just listen. It's the same way that I coach. So I'll fast forward a little bit, and I'll tell you, um, a year ago, I, about a year and a half ago, I got into conversation with a guy named Scott Bird, and um, he is, he was an investment bank here uh, for 20 some years, and he was one of the directors at Deutsche Bank, the oldest investment bank in the world, and he was a business, he was like a coach now, what he calls a, a human or performance catalyst coach. And I thought, there's something about this guy, and I just had to know what it was. And he gave me this book to read, and I read the book, and I said, I have to work with you. And at the time, I was making under $100,000 a year. And he goes, well, the way we work together is it's $50,000, and you pay me all up front. And um, I didn't have the money to pay him. And I said, okay, I'm going to pay you next week. And I had no idea how he was going to pay him next week. And I figured it out, and I paid him. And Wait, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give you, we'll get some access to that today. So, so I, uh, I paid him and it was a breakthrough for me. It was a breakthrough in that I said to him, I, I, I sent them the wire when I said I would. And I called him and I said, I paid you. And he said, I knew you would. And I said, that makes one of us. Because <laughs> up to that point, I had this history of like, what you could count on from me was to not do what I said I would do. That's what you could count on. It's actually why I wasn't a counselor at Youth for Freedom when I first met Cammy. It was like I just never followed through on anything. And so what you could count on from me was that I wouldn't do what I said. And that was the way that I lived my life. And it was the source of a lot of problems and challenges. And um, so I'll go out and I'll spend two days a month and I'll work with the whole company. And... Um, Big stuff. So you start to you have a company that comes to you and says we need to uh, ten times our revenue, and we need to do it in a year, or two years, or three years, 
and how do you take a company and ten times the revenue, a company that's like doing well, and how do you ten times the revenue? And so what you really start dealing with is, I consider myself a human performance coach. Like whatever you want to be really great at, that. I, that's like, because it's all the same. It doesn't matter if it's making a lot of money, or if it's being a really great parent, or being a really great friend, or whatever it is that you want to be really great at. It's just doing, it, it's like, you're, you're human beings, and so I've studied human beings, and I'm like trained in what it is to be a human being. So I want to say that I have, and I, I mean that when I say that, so I also want to say that nothing I say here today is going to be true. Nothing. I, it's just something you can try, and it's what I love, and really the conversation we're having is a conversation for transformation, like possibility. And what I mean is, it's, what I love about transformation is you can try it on. So don't dismiss anything I say, and don't believe anything that I say, but try it on. There was a time I didn't own these pants, and I went and I tried them on, and I liked them, and I bought them. And that's kind of how transformation works. You can try it on, and if you like it, it's yours. And if you don't like it, that's fine. It, try something else on. So, I really just want to say thank you all for being here. It's incredible. I'm actually, I'm inspired by being here. And I know I'm absolutely in the right place. There's just no doubt about it. I'm just so excited for what this... The, what the future is and what, what, we, what you're all standing for and what you're all creating. So, um, thank you. And I really mean that. There's so many, when I, I sat here and I was, I got to drive up here from Vegas this morning and when I sat here, and even in the car I was like really in the question of what would be the most impactful thing to have a conversation about during our time together. And so, I listened today, and I just listened to everybody sharing. And I took a couple of notes, actually, and then I left my notebook over here. Wow. Can you have me my phone? There's something I want to... Oh, there's... Thank you. There's something that I want to... Um, so I took a couple of notes from things that I wrote down today. This is what I'd really love to have a conversation today is... And I mean it like a conversation. If you watch me like a TV, I'm really boring. I haven't uh, been trained as a speaker, so I have no, like, whatever you're seeing, I want to say this, whatever you're seeing is just me being the way I be in the world, and I'm not trained, like, I, I have no public speaking training, and um, I'm not, I don't know if this is what I'm supposed to do with my hands when I say that, but I'm doing that. <laughs> so that's what I mean when I say I'm just being here. So I, it's really like a conversation, and what I'm doing right now is setting a context for the conversation that we can have. Um, so a future to live into, and we talked a little bit about, I don't remember uh, who was talking about a future and living, like having a future and creating a future to live into. So everyone's heard of Apple, I assume, right? The company, you know, they're worth like billions of dollars. So we always think that, like, one of the things we will talk about is money. But, um, you know, I don't even know, does anyone know how much money Apple has? It's like... I think they're the second largest company. Billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars in cash sitting in the bank. They're crazy. And um, so I think that they figured something out. And this is something that they gave to one of the uh, interns on their first day that came to work for Apple. And it says, there's work and there's your life's work. The kind of work that has your fingerprints all over the kind of work that you'd never compromise on. That, that you'd sacrifice a weekend for. You can do that kind of work at Apple. People don't come here to play it safe. They come here to swim in the deep end. They want their work to add up to something. Something big. Something that couldn't happen anywhere else. Welcome to Apple. That's a future to live into. Like, they create a future for the people to live into, and it's so simple and it's so profound, but they're really creating a future for the people. Like, the kind of, the kind of work that you would give up your weekend for, that you'd never compromise on. The kind of work that adds up to something. You can do that kind of work here. That's who Apple is for the people that work for them. So, creating a future for someone to live into, and part of that would be like, how do we, how do you know what kind of a future somebody wants? So, how many kids are going to be here in, in June? Or be 160. The, so, 160 kids. So, how do you know what they want? 
Because you could kind of guess, right? But how do you know what they really want? Can you say something? Oh. You ask them. Yeah, you could ask them. Yeah. <laughs> so, wild idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> asking them. Um, I want to. There's a. So, you, yes, conversations. And everything is really just a function of a conversation. So, transformation. And when I say transformation, what does that mean to you? Just throw out some things of what, what that means. Change. Change, okay. A change of heart and character. Okay. A permanent? Change. Well, okay. like. Long-lasting. Okay, so it'd be a long-lasting change. Hi, welcome. Hi. <clears throat> uh, sacrifice, You're like giving up something else that's like less important. Okay, great. So I'll say this: in transformation, there's always something to give up. So what I mean by that is that, like, a lot of times it looks like giving up being right about something. So there's always something to give up in transformation, but it doesn't always have to look like a sacrifice. I would say, but yeah, do you get what I mean by that? Like. Uh, you gave something up to be here today. Whatever, you, whatever was in your life that you could have had today, you gave that up to be here. So in transformation, there's always something to give up. But again, then again, we come back and I say, so how would you distinguish transformation and change? Are they the same? Usually, oh. um, the, I was reading in a book, I can't remember which one, but there's a statement that says, Change is inevitable, but growth is optional. Yeah. So, in transformation, um, or in life, we're going to change, but if we really, uh, if we really don't move forward, we have to grow. I, I went along with his crab analogy earlier. Yeah. Awesome. We have to grow. Were you sharing something? Oh, I was just going to say, transformation is usually seen as positive. Like, you never say, I had such a transformation, I'm now a worse person than I was before. Yeah. <laughs> okay, know, so like it's like viewed as positive. positive. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, Optimus Prime could get rid of the rest and change, and he could, you know, wipe his windshield and change. Like, there's lots of things he could do to change. He could fall apart. That would be a change. Yeah. But when he transforms... He becomes something bigger and better and so much more useful and awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. awesome. I think transformation. transformation is more holistic. Like you think about changing, you can like, oh, I changed my hair color. But you never say, oh, I transformed my hair, you know? Yeah. <laughs> transformation <laughs> refers to like everything. So like internal and external. It's like if you've transformed yourself, like everything has been changed. Yeah. So it's like a higher level of change. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I was just going to kind of go along those same lines. Transformation is more of an internal kind of decision that you, you choose to become something better, whereas change is what everybody else has been saying. It's almost just inevitable. Okay. It's the only thing that's constant. Yeah. So. I don't remember who said that, but <laughs> Greek mythology. If anyone's in the Greek mythology, who are you going to share? It was basically along the same lines how like transformation is more intentional mm. than change. There's so it would be intent behind transformation. Yeah, awesome. So my conversation is, what I said, is really a conversation for transformation. Have you ever heard the saying that the more things change, the more they stay the same? That's a French proverb. I heard that hundreds of times, and I had no idea what it meant. The more things change, the more they stay the same. What does that mean? Is it, who, who has heard that? Okay, so half of you. What does it mean? Does anybody know? Take a stab at it. Please. Um, you know, the more experience that I see, you know, in this life, you know, even from people with you know, all different kinds of backgrounds and things like that, we all have certain things in common that basically always stay the same. Mm. I think that's basically what it means. The more knowledge we get and the more, you know, our vision expands, the more we can understand what was always the same. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, for something to change, what has to be there? Motivation. Okay, motivation. Willingness. Willingness. Something to change. Okay, yeah, it's actually, way. so everything with me is really simple, and we just like to make it really complex. So, so yes, yeah, so in order for something to change, what has to be there? 
something. Something. Yeah. Right? So then you're always just changing something. And you notice how like how many times you've changed. And then it's like, you know, and we just we keep changing. So in order for something to change, something has to be there already. And consider that in order so transformation is really about creation. So, uh, have you ever heard the saying that if you wanted to create an apple pie from scratch, you first have to create the universe? So, <laughs> if, if we look from, like, what about, you know, so from nothing, so you'd actually create from nothing. What I mean by that is, this is a, so this whiteboard is a clearing or a space for marker, right? For, for me to write with, with a dry erase marker. What if I got a piece of chalk or, and tried to, to write on it? Would that work? No. Yeah, it wouldn't. Or like, you notice it doesn't, it's not a clearing for the cloth. It's for the marker. That's what it's a clearing for. It's a space where the marker can show up. And so that's really a, one of the, we're going to kind of, we're going to go, we're going to cover a lot. And, um, and I want to make sure you're getting that, that you're clear. And transformation isn't something that you need to understand. It's something that you get. Does everyone know how to ride a bike? Did you need to watch videos or read books or like study how to ride a bike? Or did you just get it? Like you got on the bike and you rode the bike and you got it. And you got balancing on a bike. To learn so how you to ride a bike. Them. Would it make any difference for them if you explained to them so that they understood how to ride a bike? Would that make any difference? <laughs> My son doesn't know anything about gravity. He doesn't, he couldn't tell me anything. He'd say, what's gravity? He doesn't know how that works. But that's a part of riding a bike, right? And you don't need to understand that. And if we brought bikes, could everybody get on a bike and just ride it? But are you sitting here trying to remember how to ride a bike? No. It's just, you get it. You get how to ride a bike. And that's how transformation works. So, it's, so the more things change, the more they stay the same because you're changing this thing and you just change it into something else and then change it into something else and change it into something else and change it into something else, but it's just this thing changed five times. Transformation would be a creation from nothing. If I take this circle, how many things could I change it into? A few, right? I mean, we could, we could make it a snowman, we could make it a sun, we could change it to a lot of things, but it would be a circle changed into other things. And by the way, Cammy is like a professional artist compared to the way I draw. So, um, but if you see, so I'm limited on what I can do with it, right? I mean, it's a circle, I'm limited on what I can do with the circle? Yeah. I want you to get that, there's a limit of what I can do with the circle. So now, this would be, that would be, I would change the circle to something. Now, let's have a conversation for creation. And to create, you have to have nothing. That's the first, like, the first thing you have to create to create is nothing. So, I have nothing. Now, what could I create on the board? Anything. Anything. If you, um, that's, that's transformation. That's creating. It comes from nothing. It's actually not about something else. And if you really get, there's a limit of what I can do with the circle that's on the board. And now I'm free to, I could do anything or everything would be better yet set. So on the board it's easy. I mean, I take the marker and I go like this, right? And I write and I draw and I create. That's how I create on the board. How do you create in life? So you said, how do you, how do you, how do you just do that, right? So I want to give you a, a, a context to listen from today. So in life, imagine in this circle, this circle represents everything that there is to know in the world. Just imagine that. Like there's, this circle represents everything that there is to know. And this little sliver, or some sliver of it, is what you know. And this sliver is what you don't know. But those are both given by something. Anyone want to take a shot? So if this represents everything that there is to know, and this is what I know, and this is what I don't know, both of those are given to me by... Your experience. Okay, my experience, yes, and even simpler. Myself. How do I... It's like, I know I know this. Transformation or creation? Okay. Well, you must know that you don't know that. 
Okay, yeah. So they're both mm -hmm. given to me by what I know. But you don't know what you don't know. It's, okay, yeah. So I know I know this. Like, how many of you know you know how to drive a car? And how many of you know you don't know how to fly an airplane? <laughs> so it's what you know you know, and if there's any pilots, then... And this is what you know you don't know. And what we typically do is we try to fit everything into one of these two categories. Now, what you know, what can you do with it? Sure. It. No more. No more. You can use it. You can whatever, right? You can ignore. It. What you don't know, what can you do with that? You can learn. Learn, it. learn it or ignore it, right? So what would be in the rest of this? If this is what I know I know, and this is what I know I don't know. What would be over here? What you don't know you know. Yeah. Wow, you guys are fast. I. It's what I don't know, and I don't know I don't know it. It's literally hidden from my blind, it's like hidden from my view, it's a complete blind spot. What I was pointing to with the, um, with the victim and the villain and the hero thing. They're being a villain, and they don't know they're being a villain, and they don't know they're, they don't know, they don't know that. So, or I'm being a hero, and I don't know I'm being a hero. Like, I'm paying the rent, and I'm being a hero, and I don't know I'm being a hero. It's just totally hidden. I have no idea that's going on. It's, it's what I don't know I don't know. So what we typically try to do is we, we listen and we sit here and we go, okay, so everything that I hear, I want to filter it through what I know. So I go, oh, I didn't know, I, I, yeah, I knew I didn't know that. Or we want to make it fit into something that I already knew. And we go, yeah, I already knew that. What you know makes no difference for you from here. It'll make no difference. So your life... It's like, it, your life is the way that it is, it's a result of what you know. And what you know will just have your life keep being the same way that it's been. So if you want something new, this is where you want to get, like, you want to really start to discover what's in this realm. What's in the realm of what I didn't know I didn't know? And I really start looking and discovering, what do I not know and I don't know I don't know of? This is where life's happening. Does, that, who, does everyone have a job? To make money? Um, how many of you go to work to make money that you already have? <laughs> no one? Yeah. What you already have doesn't make any difference. It just made the difference it's made up to this point in your life. So what you already, what you already know and what you already have, life's about what you don't have. So for me, life's a game. And in order to have a game, you have to have something that's more important than something else. So what would be more, and until what is important is created, it doesn't exist, like you have to create it. So how do you go out and create in your life? With your thoughts. Hmm? With your thoughts. Okay, with thoughts. I like to do this experiment, so everybody, and when I'm talking with somebody, I'm talking with everybody, right? And I want to be clear, um, actually I just, I want to say this, coaching is not like a better than or like it's not even really a teaching type of relationship. I'm just trained in the conversation of coaching. Just like if Mark got up and he taught what he teaches, I'd be like, no idea what he's teaching. Uh, and he's trained in that conversation. I'm just trained in the conversation of coaching and human performance. So it's not a, there's, there's nothing better than or um, I've just been fortunate to be able to be in the conversation that I've been in. And so for me, it's just, it's out of a commitment of, what I've gotten and what the difference is that it's made for my life to share that with people. So, okay, so think something, and I'm going to try and guess what you're thinking. So she says you create with thoughts. Does everyone agree with that? Okay, so let's have an experiment. So think something, and I'm going to guess what you're thinking. I'm really good at this, by the way. I'm married. <laughs> you can only appreciate that if you're married. Uh, my wife's incredible. Maybe you'll get to meet her one day. Uh, okay, are you thinking that? I'm not getting anything. Okay, I don't know what you're thinking. So, now I'm going to think something, and you... Now, everyone try to guess it. Did it... Wait, but did anyone know what she was thinking, by the way? Anyone? Okay. Marg knew. She was thinking of gummy bears and marshmallow cream. How was he doing? Is that close? <laughs> no. It's not it. Okay, now I'm going to think something, and you guess what I'm thinking. Abraham Lincoln. Mm. Get out of my head. <laughs> so I just want you to get, like, you're not... That was great. Uh, so... <laughs> you're, it's like... So I'm not saying... Yeah. I just changed my thoughts. 
So, <laughs> so what is a, and I want to distinguish uh, thoughts from thinking. Has everyone seen like the stock tickers? You know how the stocks just roll, run by on the stock ticker? That's kind of like thoughts. They're just there and they're just going by and there's like, you know, a million of them a day or something. And they're just there. And then thinking is like actual intellectual effort, thinking. You know, I'm actually thinking about it. So, um, so I'll go with thoughts and there's something, what is influencing the thought? That's what, okay, so I'll go with thoughts. It, let's go down that. Mm -hmm. Let's look. What's influencing the thought? Talk about information precedes thoughts earlier. Okay, so yeah, information is preceding the thought? Yeah, you have to know something before you can think it. Right, that's what right. I'm pointing at. So everyone got the question? Do emotions influence thought or do thoughts influence emotion? So there's a new model that has nothing to do with cause and effect. And it's the correlate model, meaning that they correlate, they're, in, they're correlating, they're in a dance. And we could do a demonstration in the interest of time, we won't, but if someone came, if two people came and stood here and they followed each other, like no one was leading, and you would see like they were moving together, who's leading who? And you see them, they're like, they're in this dance, they're correlating. So that's a great question. So what if it's neither, so who... What are some other possibilities? Like if it's our thoughts influencing our beliefs, or are our beliefs influencing our thoughts? What is it? Because Does anyone have like really ways. solid information on this? Both ways? It could be both ways. Okay. At least that's what I think, because sometimes you'll have a thought, then you'll have a feeling. Other times you'll realize the feeling first and then have a thought after. At least that's how I think it works. Okay. Awesome. Yeah? Uh, feelings are the truth of what you're thinking, I guess. Okay. Okay, so I'm thinking whatever I'm thinking, and then my feelings show up, however they show up, that are in line with whatever I'm thinking. Is that what you're saying? So I think um, something, and then the feelings tell me what I'm thinking like. I think if you want to know the truth, uh, how do I say it? Sometimes your thoughts will be different than your feelings because you're a bit self-deceived or something, but I think if, if we tend to focus more on our feelings, then our thoughts will start to make more sense. That makes sense. Okay. All right. So focusing more on your thought and then the feelings kind of get in line with, get in line with that? Oh, uh, the opposite. Oh, the opposites. Focusing on your feelings and your thoughts get in line? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Are you going to share? Yeah. Uh, Simultaneously, I, I can't not think or not feel. Like, I do them both simultaneously. Okay. Yeah. I have for as long as I can remember. And, you know, it's, there's always a, an emotion that precedes and comes after a thought. And there's always a thought that precedes and comes after an emotion. Perfect. Yeah. I think it is a dance. Yeah, so I'm saying they're in a dance. But you can see, like, just from the sharing around the room, does anyone have, I, I asked a question, does anyone have like a good solid model to say, and I've studied neuroscience and like, I mean, does anyone have a good solid model to say, this is the way it is and this is how you transform your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions? It's kind of like, please. I think it kind of depends on your personality. Okay. Because like I'm very much one where like, where I'll think about it and then choose how I feel about it. Other people will feel first and then work out their thoughts later, so it's, Definitely. it's on an individual basis, I feel like. So there isn't really, there can't be a concrete. Okay. Like, all right. Because we're all different, so you can't define it in undefinable. Yeah, so it's different for everybody. Some people feel first, some people think about it, and that determines how they feel. So, um, kind of how I view it is uh, we'll think certain thoughts and we'll decide to believe certain ones, we'll cast out certain ones. The more we believe, the more narrow paths are created. Yeah. It's thicker and thicker and thicker. If you want to say something different about yourself or believe new thoughts, you believe new thoughts to create a new narrow path. And the more thoughts, it builds up and it adds up to be a thicker path. Yeah. That's why it's so hard to change thoughts because it's already so thick. You just have to learn to create a bigger one. Yeah. That's excellent. And you said something and you don't know what you said. And I don't think anybody, maybe few people actually even know what you said. But you really pointed to something that's like, that's key. 
So I'm asking, how do you create in your life? So if you just go around and you think, is your life going to change? That was like the secret. You know, I know people who, um, in the secret, they, they would say, like, if I go and I, they would sit in their, on their couch and they would imagine that they were driving the car. And, but they never got the car. I know a guy who actually quit his job and had no money and sat on his couch and he was going to, like, uh, envision his way into having all this money. It, does, it doesn't work that way. So this is kind of the new thing. Uh Define, learn, and do. Yeah. So you think about something, you could come up with so many things to do, but it doesn't mean anything until you do something or take that action. Yeah. So action, definitely. Also, is that there's the middle step of you, you define what it is you want. You have to learn whatever action or skills or information is requisite for that thing. And it'll be different depending on the transformation. Right. And then you implement those things. Yeah. Yeah, without action, none of it will make any difference. Right? I mean, everyone's in agreement with, like, without action, there's none of it makes any difference. So if that's the model you use to get to action, but without action, none of it will make any difference. I just got some notes. Cam was kind of teaching us today that we have this vibration. It depends on the percentage we give. So if we give 50% to 100% blessing, we only get 50% of that blessing. So we're going to have to be, we could be doing stuff. We could be thinking, but we have to do things that will add up that 100% vibration so we can get more things. So more things will come with that. Mm. So, I love the sharing. I really just, I've been asking questions and what I want you to notice is that there's no like really solid model. And I coach people in their 50s and 60s and they have no solid model for how you say, this is how you transform the way that you feel or think about something. So when I first hired uh, Scott, when I was coaching with him, I had this thing on my phone for a long time as my screensaver, and it said, I take decisive action regardless of thoughts, feelings, emotions, moods, circumstances, or situations. I take decisive action regardless of thoughts, feelings, emotions, moods, circumstances, or situations. Like a Eight months that was on my phone. This is a thing I saw a hundred times a day. And we were talking about that earlier, like, um, I don't remember what the language was because I was translating it through um, Napoleon Hill's work and Outwitting the Devil. But, like, just um, the act, the action that I'm taking is consistent with what my purpose is. Oliver was talking about that. Can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, so I take decisive action regardless of thoughts, feelings, emotions, moods, circumstances, and situations. That's the access to having an amazing life. So, we're talking about creating and how do you create. And this is how, this is, I have this, um, I want to come back to this. I just want to write it so I remember. So how do you create? And there's actually, what, how are your thoughts happening? There's something so simple here that we just kind of really overlook. How are your thoughts happening? Okay, like really simple. So thoughts are happening and even I'm having a feeling and then I'm interpreting the feeling using... So subconscious words? words. So now, yes, words. So I would, I would say language. Thoughts are happening in language. Feelings happen and I interpret it through language. Consider that there is no, that the world isn't fixed or malleable. We look, when we look at things like cause and effect, it's fixed or it's malleable. Like this is a chair. There's like an isness or a fixedness to it. And it, we say that is a chair. And there's a philosopher who said reality is out there. Descriptions of it are not. So in my work, when someone pays my fees to work with me, I work with them really on like two or three things the whole time we work together. And the foundation of all of it is language. 
It's the access to creation. It's how you create out in the world. And then we come back and we say, there's people who, they can say all the right things and it lacks integrity. And we'll, we'll talk about integrity and give a new model for integrity that you may or may not have right now. And uh, we've, we've talked, is that valuable? Yeah? So, um, so language, that's how you create. It's really that simple. Does anyone know of um, the verse that says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God? Yeah. So I'm literally saying, as a human being, I'm asserting what it is to be a human being is that you, who you are is your Word, and who I am is my Word. It's much more likely to, to me than something like my feelings or my thoughts, which I have like what control, what lasting control do I have over my thoughts or my feelings? I mean, I could have woken up this morning and not felt like being here. Or I could have had the thought of sleeping in and not been here. But I said I'd be here and so I'm here just as a matter of my word. That's it. Um, there's no big reason for me. Now I have a commitment in something that I'm committed to, but all of that is still just a matter of what I gave my word to. So. We have what we call, in, in the model of coaching that I do, we have what we call adults. And so in adults, we're going to distinguish adults. We have adult children, and we have adult adults. And adult children are like um, the people that are going to war. You know, we, I would say it's like the people who have all of the, um, the ping pong balls inside of them. And everything's, you know, they're getting triggered and they're, um, that's like an adult child. And they're walking around in an adult body and they look like adults, but they're adult children. And then there's adult adults who just deal with life in an adult way. And in my world, like, everything just gets resolved in a conversation. Anything that's going on, any issue, the biggest issues, like, that you can imagine. And um, it's just like, it all just gets resolved in a conversation. It's just a function of a conversation. So adult children, uh, and we have fun with it. We, we have, um, there's probably um, maybe a few hundred coaches in the world that do the kind of work that I do. And so, um, and I know a handful of them. So it's, um, we have fun with it. And in, you, you can see when you're relating to somebody and like, you know, they have whatever, like whatever stuff is going on for them. So I want to talk about there's, it's funny because there's people have a lot of stuff around money, and it's really one of the domains that I deal a lot in. I'm really not convinced. <laughs> so when I talk about creation, I'm talking about creating power or non-power. And what I mean by that is that we have a, these different filters in the world that we use to like view the world, and we go, it's power. We say it's right or it's wrong or it's good, or it's bad, or should, or shouldn't. Everyone's familiar with these? Yeah. And then when you're enlightened, you start saying positive and negative. And um, I really have no concern for any of that. The way my conversation is a conversation for power. So everything in the world for me as I'm looking at it is that everything that's happening in my life, I'm looking at it as it's powerful, or it's not powerful. As far as what's right and wrong, I don't know. It's really open to interpretation. And if you spend time with all different kinds of cultures, you'll see that. I mean, ISIS is right in their minds. You know, if you really get that, like, what ISIS is doing is right to them. That's what they should do, and they're good for doing it. So, that's the, um, does it work? No, it doesn't work. But they're right, and they get to be right about it. So, I get, I'm in a conversation for power. So, what's the access to power? And what do I mean by power? When I say power, what do you think of? Choice. Choice. Like ability to change something. Okay, yeah, absolutely. I was going to say capacity to alter your environment. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say right in line with that, and choice is a huge part of it, yes? I think truth. Okay, truth. Awesome. So I, for me, when I distinguish power, what I really mean by power, so you get that, I, what I, one of the things I want you to get is that I'm asking you, what does that mean to you when I say that? Because I say power, and I don't know how many of you are here, but each one of you has your own interpretation of power, right? And yours was truth, and yours was altering 
your results or whatever. So how do you know what I'm saying when I say power? So I'm telling you, right? I'm giving you a, a context uh, and a way to listen to what I'm saying. So when I say power, I mean the ability to create results right now. And the ability to create results right now, and 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 right now. And um, was that you talking about uh, someone who's made, uh, won the lottery? Was that you were talking about? I love yeah. sharing. Thank you. That was great. You're like contagious. Um, yeah, that's such a great point, right? So w look at Donald Trump. I don't know. Does anyone know how many times he's been bankrupt? Like three? And look at him. He's right back on top every time because he has power. Now, you can like his hair or not like his hair. He has power. <laughs> so he lives with power. He produces results right now and right now and right now and right now. Bankrupt or not bankrupt, he can produce power. And he can produce results. So power, when I talk about power, I mean the ability to produce results right now. And um, now you get to see my art. Let's see. Yes, it is a gingerbread guy. And it's you. <laughs> See, you knew what it was. It's a gingerbread guy. So imagine that this is this is this is your lot. This is you, and you have the ability to access all of this. Is the ability you can all of this is available to you. You can access this. This is the power that's available to you. And most people. are using about that much. Like a thumbnail. That this is all the power that you can access and that's about how much people are using. I might have given too much. Um, so how do you access the rest of this? Do you ever have the feeling like you know there's something more for you? And then like, but what? And how do you access that? How do you live that way? Man, I spent so many years, like, how do I access the power, like, who I really am, you know? They say that, being, that a miracle is being who you really are. You know, and you can interpret, however that, like, who God made you to be. That's a miracle, being who you really are. So my intention in being with you is to cause a miracle, that you be who you really are. How do you access the rest of this power? And you already have access to it. That's what I want you to know. It's already there. Stop being afraid of it. Okay, yeah, so stop being afraid of it. It's already there. It's just something gets in the way of us being that. Being really powerful. You don't know what you don't know? Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. So what gets in the way of accessing that, really, then? Ourselves. Okay, ourselves. So in the model that I work in, we deal in integrity. And when I say integrity, what does that mean to you? So our words are what is making us so we can't access it. Okay, yeah. Our words get in the way. You notice, like, you know, Cammie drew this. And there was, like, we'll say the victim, the villain, and the hero. This is the model I learned from the Hendrickson. And um, you notice in the victim there's a type of language they're using. Do you notice that? that? All the victims sound the same, and all the villains sound the same, and all the heroes sound the same. That's how we know. We can just listen to the conversation that's happening with them, and you can tell where each person is on here. So, yeah, words, absolutely. So what if I just say all the right things, and then there's no integrity behind it? It doesn't work. I tried that route. And so what's integrity then? When I say integrity, what, do I, what does that mean to you? You're to your words. Okay, so like, do what you like say. okay, do what I said I would do. Okay, what else? Anything else for integrity? You also mean what you say. Okay, you know, meaning what I say. You say what you are. Right. You don't speak. You speak according to your character, and not something else. Right. Absolutely. Being the same person in private that you are in public. Yeah. Totally. Or the other way around, maybe. Absolutely. <laughs> So all of those yes, and if we had two days to go into integrity, then we would go further into that. And I'll keep it simple for this, for this, is that for a person, 
Integrity is a matter of their word. That's it. And then we would have two parts of that. Keeping your word or cleaning up, not dealing with, not keeping your word. So either I keep my word or I honor my word, which would be like cleaning up and dealing with the impact of having not kept my word. But so often, integrity gets confused with morality and what's ethical. Have you noticed that? Because then I, we say to people, what's integrity? And they, it's like, well, it's usually it falls in the line of what's, of, of what's moral and what's uh, ethical. So how do we have any kind of a distinction between these things? And then all of a sudden, it's bad if you didn't do what you said you would do. Right? Like there's something morally wrong with it. In our model, there's nothing wrong with not doing what you said you'd do, and there's nothing right about doing what you said you'd do. It doesn't have anything to do with that. You have what's moral and what's ethical, and that's over here, and it's not a conversation I'm even having right now. And then you have integrity, and it has nothing to do with what's moral or what's ethical. They live in two different worlds. So you have to really kind of get them uncollapsed, so that one's over here and one's over here. You have morality and what's ethical, and you have integrity. I mean integrity as just as workability. That's it. Oh my gosh, that's such a huge aha, because like if we kept it in integrity, we could feel remorse and shift it, and, and just admit, oh, I messed up, I'm going to shift it. But when we take it into more, and when we lay the morals and ethical and all that kind of stuff, then it's I am the mistake, and it leads to this shame. Yeah. But if you separate those two, it's impossible to be ashamed of, I'm late. Right. Oh my gosh. And I'll go one step further and say, I'm late to story. Right? So Jordan just walked out, but when she comes back, I'll go, I'll touch on that. Was she the one that came in yes. late? Okay, great. Cool. So, um, integrity. And that's the access to, to the rest of your power. If I drop this marker, what's the source of it hitting the ground? Gravity. 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 And that's obvious, right? Half the time when I do that, the answer is like dropping it. And the other half of the time, it's gravity. But it kind of looks like the reason that it hit the ground is because I dropped it, doesn't it? Isn't that what it kind of looks like? Like it hit the ground because I dropped it? If you wouldn't have dropped it, it wouldn't hit the ground. Yeah. If it didn't exist, it wouldn't have hit the ground either. But the source, <laughs> yeah. So the source, like it's the same every time, the source is gravity. And what happens is that we have integrity like morality, you know, like they're the same thing. And then we attribute out of integrity consequences with something other than out of integrity actions. So the impact of integrity or lacking integrity is hidden from our view. I'll say that again. We attribute out of integrity consequences with something other than out of integrity actions. So being out of integrity or lacking integrity stays hidden from our view, the impact of it. Just like if what you really thought was that the marker hit the ground because I dropped it, You'd never see the act. You'd never see the the impact of being of of not being present to gravity and the law of gravity. And gravity is a law, and integrity is a law. Just like every time I drop this marker, it's going to hit the ground. It's the law of gravity. No one's going to argue with gravity. The thing that no one taught us was that integrity is a law, and that you can count on the same way you can count on gravity every single time. So one of the things we said last week is that there's a lot of integrity in being out of integrity. Meaning you can count on the same thing every time that you're out of integrity. Like stuff getting stolen out of your garage. Right? Yes. Every time you can count on it. Whenever a person lacks integrity, there's a lot of integrity in being out of integrity. Like you can just count on what's going to happen when you lack integrity. So this is really the conversation, like when I go into big companies, this is the conversation I have with them. Integrity. And you'd be amazed at what it does to profits. It's actually, it's good for, good for money. One quick question. Yeah. So you were talking about integrity is separate from moral and ethical, and then you said, I mean integrity purely as... Workability. Workability. 
it just works to do what you say you're going to do. Doesn't it just work to say we're going to be here at 10 and be here at 10? Don't. See, what I mean is it's like it's about performance because the performance would be if we, if everybody came, said we'll be here at 10 this morning and then everybody came at 10, 10. We like to trick ourselves and we go, well, we had pretty good performance, but what was the performance of the meeting from 10 to 10, 10? Zero. Zero. So when something lacks integrity, there's no foundation for performance. So it really just works to just do what we say we're going to do. Imagine what the world would be like if you could just count on everyone to do what they said they were going to do. Politicians. <laughs> yeah, so we have an election coming up next year. And what's the thing with, with presidents? When we're listening to a president, what does everyone say? Like, who, who are they going to vote for? There's a listening for politicians. Like, there's a particular way we listen to them. Did anybody really think Obama was going to do all the stuff that he said he was going to do when he got elected? And did anyone think that? No, because we don't listen to politicians that way. We know they're not Yeah. We trust them. Exactly. To not yeah. Well, it works because then if we don't, if like, then we don't have to deal with our own out of integrity stuff, right? It's like, well, look, even the president, he doesn't have integrity. It's definitely okay for me to lack integrity. Um. So, um, so that's integrity. It's just about workability. That's it. There's nothing right about it. There's nothing good about it. It'll have your life work. It will. So, if I understand what you're saying about integrity, so the reason why I think people get it confused with morals is because we say we're going to do morals, and then integrity comes into morals because of what we say we're going to do. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. If the, if it's it's just a function of your word. Yeah, so, and morality is what, so you'd have to see, too, that, like, that's really a conversation that's open to what's moral, right? Like, if we went around to all the different cultures, they'd have all kinds of different ideas of what, what's moral and what's not moral. But integrity really gives us, like, all around the world, we can have one view of integrity, like, it's just about doing what you said you'd do. And if you didn't do what you said you'd do, there's nothing bad about that, you just deal with not having done what you said you would do. Um... So if one of the things, that, and I didn't bring this up, but like even um, who came after 10 o'clock today that's in the room right now? You came after 10, and you came after 10, and you came after 10. Awesome. And you came after 10. Um, and you guys were like broken down on the freeway somewhere, yeah. so yeah. thanks for being here. Uh, it's unreasonable to break down in Fillmore and still make it here, so it's awesome. Um, but there's nothing bad about... See, what happens though, is, so tell me what happened, just like the, the brief, like uh, what happened with I the... I was trailer in our Tahoe and the Tahoe, uh, the, what was it, the radiator radio burst basically. Okay. And the oil was leaking too. So. <laughs> Great. So you dealt with it? Yeah, yes it is. Cool. Uh, can I coach you for a minute? Yes, sir. Cool. Thank you. So, you notice how, did everyone just immediately, like, when you heard they had car problems in Fillmore, what did everyone think? Like, they weren't going to be here on time. What did you all think? Oh, he's yeah. off the hook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's off the hook, right? Did anyone think anything other than that? Like, it was totally okay for them to be late. They had car problems. It's just about... Totally. Yeah. What did you say? I... I thought while I was texting Oliver, I am not being my word. Awesome. I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm... That's what you were texting him? No, that's not what I was texting him, that's what I was thinking while I was texting him. Oh, okay. You were thinking, I'm not being my word. I'm not being well, my you're word. Not texting him. I can give him a story, but the bottom line is I'm not being my word. I'm not there. Yeah. Does it really matter, like, if there was a herd of goats that was blocking the road or you had car trouble or like you were abducted by aliens does any of it really make any difference for like being here or not being here it really doesn't it's just that we think that your story is a good story now that's what happened right it's like that's what happened but inevitably so I remember I, I'll remember this the rest of my life I had uh, I think four or five stitches right here so I'll always have that as a reminder there's a, there'll probably be a scar there forever so I was at CrossFit one morning, and I had this meeting at like 9 or 10 that morning, and I didn't want to go to it. And this was years ago. 
and I'm uh, over by the barbell rack, and I don't even know what happened, but I like pulled the pin and the bar, and it slammed down and it smashed my finger. And I'll save you like, no I won't. Um, <laughs> so I like immediately grab it, and I go in the bathroom, and I like wrap it up, and I look at it, and it's like literally popped open, like on the tip here. And the inside of my finger is like hanging out, and I'm like, oh man. So I go to my friend, and she's there, and I think she has four kids. She can tell me what to do. So I go to her, and I'm like, what do you think of this? And she's like, I just put a Band-Aid on it. <laughs> and I'm like, no. <laughs> so I wrap it up really tight, and I drive home like 10 minutes to my house, and it's early. I was at the 5 a.m. class, and we hadn't even started, so my wife is asleep, and... I um, walk into the bedroom and I'm like, I smashed my finger open. <laughs> so she's like asleep. So she wakes up and she looks at it and she goes, oh, you need stitches. So we go to the ER and I, it's like the most pain I've ever been in in my whole life. I mean, it was like so painful. I can't even tell you. So there was a, the, there was a fracture in the tip of my finger and it's popped open and my nail was like, it was like, it was crazy. So five stitches from like right there. I mean, it was like, that much had five stitches. It was crazy. So I call him, and now I think I have a good excuse to not go to my meeting. And I call Taylor, the guy, and I say, I'm not going to be there. I smashed my finger open. Five minutes later, I get a call from Shane, who Taylor works for, and he goes, so you smashed your finger open so you wouldn't have to meet with Taylor. And I said, uh, I, yeah. <laughs> you know, just like looking from that place, and I thought, yeah, I did. And he goes, look how powerful you are. <laughs> <laughs> like, you'll do anything to not keep your word. Whoa. And um, I called Taylor and I said, I'll be there at 10. <laughs> <laughs> and I went. And it was like, there was a moment there that something, it, like the excuse or the reason, see, he was actually willing to stand for me as something other than my story or something other than the reasons that I had made up. Like, he saw who I really am, and he was standing for that. And I want to be clear, like, whatever you're experiencing right now, people, um, I'll go and I'll work with a company, and they think, and then they'll say, well, that's your personality, like, that's just the way you are. No. Was I this way when you met me? No. I'm not, this isn't my personality, I wasn't born this way. And I'm not sharing that because it's anything about me. I'm just being this way. And it, being a particular way is open to anybody. Anybody could be however I'm being. You'd just be being that way however you're being. So being powerful, that's a possibility. Anyone could be powerful. And each one of you would be powerful in your own way. It would, like, it would look like you being powerful. It wouldn't look like me being powerful, the person sitting next to you being powerful. It would look the way that you're powerful. But it's a way of being, and that's open to everybody. I just have a question. So I understand living in integrity in, like, in our own lives. Mm -hmm. How do we respond to people when... We're just like, I just wasn't there on time. That's just like, that's just the way it is, and I'm, whatever it is. But if they respond with a moral response, like, well, you're a horrible person, like, you let me down, and you're, you know, if they respond with that version of integrity, how do we counteract that? Does that make sense? Totally. If they don't have the same understanding or like view that we have of integrity, how do we respond without hurting their feelings? Because for them, it is a feeling. It is like a moral or ethical yeah. problem. And so we're going to come off, I feel like we're going to come off very like, well, <laughs> That's your problem. Fix your meaning of integrity. Oh, like, sure. Because if it's valuable, I'll do this. We'll do this right now. And if it's not, we'll do it. We can talk about it after. Okay. So, does everyone want to know? Yeah. Like, yeah. this is something you deal with in your life. Like, people don't keep their word to you. Mm -hmm. So, first, I'm going to. So, can, can I coach you? Yeah. We can work to Okay. So, first, I'm going to say this. <clears throat> I said this whiteboard is a clearing for marker. So, what you've got to get. First of all, that people show up for you the way that you, you know, have you ever heard it said that people uh, treat, like, you teach people how to treat you? Mm -hmm. So, Cammie, do people call me on time? Absolutely. Every time. When they say they're going to call me at a particular time, they call me at that time. So people get to be really great with me. Like, they really get to be who they really are, and they have total freedom to be that way with me. Now, are there times when they forget things, or they don't call when they said they would call, or, I mean... I'm not telling you I'm perfect, and I'm not standing here saying I have integrity. Integrity is the mountain without a top, and you just climb because you love climbing. So I'm not trying to 
Like, I'm not saying, there's no, like, I'm a, one day I'm going to have integrity. There's no such thing. It's a, it's a mountain without a top, and you climb because you love climbing. There's no arriving at having integrity. So I don't want you to get the idea that I'm standing here telling you that I have integrity. I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you I'm committed to integrity. That's what I'm telling you. And so, okay, great. So then someone, so, so tell me, like, give me, a, give me an example of somebody, like, you're, you're meeting, you're, you're late for something, and somebody's all, like, I mean, they're really, they're in their emotions about it, and they're, right? Mm -hmm. so, tell, so give me an example of that. And we'll just kind of role play it, like, what they might say. And so you just tell me, like, what's the worst thing someone could say to you if you were late? <laughs> You're fine. Why would you do this to me? Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Like, you always. Um, yeah. yeah. You just care what people say. Yeah, I like that. Or I thought you were better than this. Mm. So, so just so okay. So yeah. So let's role play that. So I, what so I heard you, you, you. Yeah. So you tell. So I'm light for something. Okay. And you said I. Th you thought I was better than this. I thought you were better than this. I was counting on you. Mm. What I'm hearing you say is that you were counting on me to be here on time, and I wasn't. And now you thought I was better than that. So actually there's like some disappointment for you. You thought I was the person that would be here on time. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I get that. I imagine like you were probably sitting here the last 15 minutes thinking like, where is he? <clears throat> is he blowing me off? Is he not coming? What's happening? And so I want you to know what you can count on from me is that when I make an agreement to be somewhere with you, that I'll be there. And if something comes up and it gets in the way of me being there when I said I would be there, I'll communicate that to you. Because I really get that it doesn't work for you to just be sitting here for 20 minutes wondering what's going on and I'm not communicating with you. Mm -hmm. So you can count on me to either be here when I said I would be here or I'll communicate with you if something gets in the way of me doing that. Does that work for you? And our relationship is important to me, so I want you to know that if um, I don't want there to be anything in the way, like I don't want you to think if we're meeting for breakfast, I don't want you to be thinking he's always 20 minutes late. So I don't want that to be in the way. So it's really important to me that we have a relationship where there's nothing in the way of our relationship. So if anything isn't working, I want you to bring that to me. I want to hear that. Okay. So I want this to be like, I mean, I'm willing to listen to anything you have to say so that we can put this in the past, and I'm not, I don't want to be clear, it's not like I'm trying to avoid it. I want to be clear so that we can put it in the past and let it be in the past. And then we could have a relationship where there's like anything's possible. And then you could relate to me like being on time and being here when I said I would be here. So is there anything else that you need to say to have it be complete for you? I'm not going to think of the moment. <laughs> okay. I just don't feel like I have, I, like, that flows really well, and like I understand that, like, and I'm a reasonable person, so like it's reasonable I understand that, but I don't always have reasonable people people to work with. Okay, yeah. Does that make sense? Like, who wants to like give me a switch, challenge? Switch the role play and pretend like she's the late person. Great. You did you hear all I did though? Is what did I do? Like she said whatever she said to me. No. Yeah. Listen. I just listened, well, and it's people aren't listened to in the world. Well, I kind of like didn't really identify that because you were like, I, I realize that you can't be sitting here for 20 minutes. And I'm thinking in my head, well, I just did sit here for 20 mm. minutes. Like, yeah, so you got to say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why I asked, and then notice I asked her, I, so I guessed sort of like what was the impact on her. Mm -hmm. And then I said, yeah, it doesn't work. And what you can count on is that I'll be here when I said I would be here. Yeah, but like for me, I'm like, well, how can I count on that if you just were 20 minutes late? Yeah. So you got to say that. So, okay, so she wants yeah, to give me a challenge. So. <laughs> yeah, okay, so we went through all that, and you're like, well, I just sat here for 20 minutes, right? Yeah, so yeah. how can I know that I can count on you if you just show me that you can't be counted on? Yeah, that's a great question. Will you tell me what it was like for you sitting here for 20 minutes wondering where I was? Well, I was frustrated that you didn't keep your word to me. Yeah. Was there anything else that was like, I mean, did you think at some point maybe I wasn't coming or like why I wouldn't have communicated it with yeah, you or something? Yeah, maybe he forgot, maybe he, you know, tried to call but couldn't make it. Yeah. Or I was thinking maybe you just like forgot or blew me off. Yeah. I get it. I really do. And I get that it doesn't work. And it's really not what I'm committed to. So I don't know how you can trust me. 
I mean, all I can offer you is what I'm telling you is that I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm committed to being here when I said I'd be here or communicating it with you if something does get in the way. And I'm, you'll, it's kind of like, I, I, I'm willing to hear anything. Well, let me ask you that. So is there something that I could do for you that would say, yes, this is like, I know I'll be here. So sometimes, like, maybe I, maybe I could set an alarm, like, before we meet, and if I'm going to be driving somewhere, I could set an alarm, like, 30 minutes before to remind me to be here on time. How would that be? Okay. So, like, next time we meet for breakfast, I'll set an alarm an hour and then 30 minutes before to go off and remind me to leave at 30 minutes so I'll be here five minutes early. Okay, yeah. Would that work for you? Mm -hmm. And I really want there to not be anything in the way of our relationship so that, like, you're not sitting here thinking, he made me wait for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So if something else comes up for you, will you let me know? Yes. Is there anything else you need to say about it? No. Awesome. So it's complete for you? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I like that you validated like, that it won't happen again. Like when you put up those safeguards, like, because you knew that it happened once, but then you validated that, you know, that that was a concern for me, but then you put up those safeguards, like it won't happen again, and yeah. I committed to it not happening again. Yeah. And then I have a structure of something that will support me in actually being here when I said I would be here. Yeah. But notice how I'm willing to hear anything that you have to say. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not trying to like run away and avoid the impact of whatever you might share with me. Mm -hmm. Like you might say, I think you're a jerk for being 20 <laughs> minutes late. And I would just say, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's totally a jerk to be 20 <laughs> minutes late. I'm not trying, like there's nothing, there's this scripture that says, I am that, I am. That might be a different way that you've ever heard it before. <laughs> But like, yeah, I have totally been a jerk. I mean, like, that's, it's a jerk thing to do to have you wait for me for 20 minutes. It really is. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't work. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so as you were doing that, I'm like, if I was in your situation, like, I could say all that and I could really mean it. But then, like, afterwards, I'd be like, oh, my gosh, like, she felt so, like, it, I feel really guilty mm. about the whole situation. So how do you handle that? So, because, like, I actually had a situation like that. And, like... I feel like it, like it was resolved, but then afterwards it wasn't resolved for me. And I was like, like I thought, like I, well, I still think about it sometimes. Yeah. I'm like, how do I get rid of it so I don't have to keep thinking about it? Because it's right. resolved. Like, I'm the only one that's worried about it. You know, like, how do you fix that? It's such a great point, and I had no intention of having this conversation in this way, but it's really something that I work with a lot of people is being incomplete with something or with another person. So, um, so can I work with you? Can I coach you? Okay, cool. I'm going to write a word that you've probably never heard before. You don't even know you don't know this word. I'm not sure if it's a Scrabble word. You'll have to look that up in the dictionary. In my dictionary, this is a very real word. Unmessable with. It actually just goes back to the same thing. Of, like, you notice Donald Trump's unmessable with? Even if he's bankrupt three times, he's unmessable with. Like, you can't actually throw him off of who he's committed to being. Anyone in this room could say anything to me right now, and you couldn't throw me off of who I'm committed to being for you. Anything. And you couldn't throw me off. And I've had people try. So, so how do you, so when I, when I hear you say that, I hear you say, how do I be unmessable with? Mm -hmm. Well, and not even like that you can get a reaction out of me, but like, how do I, like, like, I guess I like, I feel vulnerable. Like when you just said, like, will you mind explaining to me how you felt when I was late? Cause I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't know, I want to know how she felt because don't that would that? mean I'm a bad person because I made her feel that way. Yeah, we do that. I think what she's doing is, is taking her integrity and, miss, and putting the morality and the ethical because you're saying I am. Like, so you're taking it. If they share their feelings about you, you're saying I am those things. Mm. And you unravel all that and say, I was late. Not I'm a dishonest, horrible, bad person that is going to hell. But I was late. I said I would be here at this time, and I wasn't. That's it. That's all that happened. Not, I'm a horrible person. So when they share their feelings with you and say, it was horrible, you weren't here on time, blah, all this stuff, 
you, the understanding that you, makes you unmessable with is that I was late. I was late, and it caused this, that she chose all of this. Mm -hmm. Whatever she chose to get into, right? Because I was late. So you understand. And maybe when, I'm also, like, playing the hero victim role of, mm -hmm. like, she has to feel good. Like, yeah. if I did something, and because of that, she chose to not feel good, like... Yeah, yeah she was business right now. Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say what Pam was saying, is you totally put the what's my business and what's your business. You said, you know, if she chose to still be angry with you, you can't do anything about that. Right. You can do everything you can, but at the, in the end, it's her choice to be angry with you. Right. And I'm really taking the stand. So I want to go back to what, so thanks for bringing that up, because I want to go back to what Cammie said, is that I'm actually making it my business that it's complete for her. Mm -hmm. I'm making that my business. Well, well, there's this question, and you'd be surprised how much it's there when we're living. Like, how do I live and have integrity at the same time? That's kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> really, it's like it's really there for us. We go, how do I live and have integrity? And um, you just have to decide, you know, what are you willing? So that would be like an either or. And I would invite you to look in the world of what's possible, which we'll look at. So it's a really good question, and I want to come back to it. Because I want to look in the world of what's possible. Because notice how it's like this or that. And then decisions kill off possibility, right? It's like I have to decide between one of those. There's no choice. And we talked about choice a little bit ago. So, yeah. I feel like it's your, it's your commitment to integrity that gives you the ability to have that posture with somebody. Right. Well, You're, yeah. To be able to accept their feelings but not lose... And or not take them personally. I don't yeah, know. it isn't about me. Even if I was an hour there, an hour later than I said I would be there, it's still not. A, that's not about me. What happened is I said I'd be there at this time, and I was there at that time. And so often we collapse. Like we think what happened is what we made it mean, and it isn't that. It isn't that way. It's just what happened is what happened. So did you want to share something? Yeah, Please. I just wanted to say, did anybody notice how often he got defensive? Never. No. Never. Yeah. Because that's not part of it. So there's a saying that, does anyone know the first act of war? Defense. Yeah. Wow, oh, you guys are like, I'm, I'm blown away, really. <laughs> so the first act of war is defense. If I never perceive there's anything to defend, what would, what would I defend? So say anything. Say, I think you're a jerk for being light. I think you ruined my life. I could see how I ruined your life for being late. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, it's like I'm, I'm willing to be with whatever. And then, and then I'm going to give you... So what I want to get to is that I'm listening, and I'm listening to nothing. I said, is there anything else you need to say to have this be complete? And you said, no. I'm listening to nothing. <clears throat> Why? What do you have to have before you can create something? Nothing. Nothing. And then notice what I did. I created the possibility of being on time from nothing. But if I just said, oh yeah, you said you're, you were 15 minutes late, and I said, oh yeah, don't worry, next time I'll be here on time. Isn't that what we do in, in life? And people do that with us, and we go, yeah, right. And everybody, do you know all have those people in your life that you just know they're going to be there 20 <laughs> minutes late or an hour late or whenever they show up late? <laughs> That's just how you relate to them. It's just the way they are, right? It's like their personality. They were light. So, how do you um, change that? <laughs> right. So you first like listening, and then how do you create? Did you notice I read you something from Apple? And they created a future. So it's actually like you are creating a future for somebody that wouldn't have existed before. But I can't do that over on top of all these other things. I have to get like, I have to get the, what's in the way of them listening to me out of the way. So I, I want to come uh, yeah. So I want this is where I want to come back to. So okay, well this might be different, but like you mentioned that like you said, Cami, are people ever late to our phone calls? And I'm like, okay, well how do you train them? Like you know, if you're in that position where you're someone is asked to be coached by you, what do you do to train them so that they? Um, you can keep talking. I'm just yeah, I don't know, this. like just so that they keep their commitments to you, 
Um, and so, because I feel like when I'm in that position, I'm like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And then, <laughs> like, and honestly, it kind of is okay with me. Like, it's not a huge deal to me. But, like, on those things that are a big deal, or on the ones where you've asked them to do something and they aren't meeting that, like, what do you do? Because it will help them if you can help them build integrity. Yeah. So, I, yeah, it's actually, it's not about me at all, really. <laughs> And it's really about who I am for them. So them doing what they said they would do. I, I don't believe in big things and small things. The same thing for me that says I'll call you at this time is the same thing that says I'm going to make X amount of money this year. It's the same. It takes the same integrity to create that. So I sat in this meeting with this company. I said, how in the world do you think you're going to do $20 million in profit? And we can't even start a meeting when we say we're going to start a meeting. But somehow this year we're going to do $20 million in profit. But we, we can't start a meeting at, on time. Like we said, we'll start at 9, we start at 9.05. And 9.05 isn't 9 o'clock. It's just good to get that. Like, 9 is not 9.05. <laughs> and so often we think, and so I had this, so I actually, so I want to give you another possibility. I had this lady, I called her up, and I actually called her three minutes after I said I would call her. Now in the world, that's not a big deal. People, like three minutes is like, they don't even notice. And I said, Ann, I am calling you. See, I remember her name because it, it doesn't happen that often. And I said, Ann, I'm calling you. And I, I said I'd call you at 3, and I'm calling you at 3.03. And she goes, oh, it's not a big deal. I usually figure about five minutes. And I said, well, I appreciate that. And what I really want you to know is it actually is important to me. It's important to me that I do what I say I'm going to do. And calling you at 3.03 isn't calling you at 3 o'clock. And what I said is I would call you at 3 o'clock. And so what you can count on me, from me, in our relationship moving forward, is if I say I'm going to do something, then I'll do it. That's what you can count on. I'm curious as to calling early. If you called it 2.57... It doesn't work with me. And here's why I say that. Because I have calls every hour on the hour. And so if you call me at, at 9.57 and our call's at 10, I'm on another call right then. So it doesn't work. So that's just me, because 8.57 isn't... Is it nine? <laughs> now, if I'm going somewhere, I could get there early, right? And I could be like, I could be there a little early, so I can be. But if I'm calling somebody, I'm literally calling them right on time. And here's what I'll tell you: it's not hard. It's really if you're sitting there going, "This sounds like so hard, or so difficult, or so challenging." I'll show you, I'm going to show you why you think that it's hard. So you said, how do you, how do you, how do you train people to be with you, right? How do you, language, did I spell that right? Okay. Pretty much taught myself. So, um, so that's the question then, is um, how do you, so how do you create someone being that way with you? And you do that, it's all a function of language. All of it is just a, a function of a conversation of how you are with people. That's what they know they can count on from me. And then I make agreements. So most of the time we live life in expectation. We expect this, we expect that. Expectation leads to disappointment. And for anyone married or that ever intends on being in any kind of a relationship ever again, it would be a good idea to get that expectation leads to disappointment. Exactly what Cammie was talking about in serving and pleasing. Expectation leads to disappointment, every time. And so what is there other than expectation? There's agreements. I just make agreements. Don't we have an agreement? Do you just call me when you say you're going to call me? And now I don't even have to expect it. I just have an agreement with her that she calls me when she says she's going to call me. That's how I create it. I just make agreements with people. Whether it's call me at 9 o'clock, or they're sending me a wire for payment for working with them, I just know I can count on them to do what they say they're going to do. And it starts with me. <laughs> It'd be like absurd to walk around and say I'm a stand for integrity and totally lack integrity, or not be committed to it. So I said I don't have integrity, but I am committed to it. Isn't that saying like, I know she's going to call when she agreed to call? Isn't that knowing? In a way, an expectation, though? I have an, so I want to distinguish it with an agreement. So I have an agreement that that's when they're going to call me. Right? And I have an agreement that they keep their agreements. 
So if you want to keep going back, then I would just keep going the other way on agreement. So do you get what I mean with that? So I would distinguish it. An expectation would be like this unspoken thing in my head that I think you should know. And an agreement would be we actually have an agreement for it. Okay. Is that okay, clear? That uh, So an expectation would be like something unspoken or unknown. And an agreement would be like there's an actual, it's like we have an agreement. We, we've communicated and we have an agreement. Do you want to I show? Was, I was going to say that, that, uh, that the uh, expectation would be something unspoken. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Go ahead. So when you first started learning about integrity, was it difficult for you not to be emotionally involved? Like to take out the good, bad, you know, fail, succeed? Right, so we have this filter, you know. As people, we have filters. And it's like, we really tend to look at things. If you, does anyone remember the day they were born? No, no one? Okay, I'm going to read. <laughs> nice. Do you remember what it was like in the room? I want you to, I, I have this theory that the day you were born, like at the moment you were born, it went from like, you had a great life. You had like room service 24-7 and it was like really comfortable and, you know, I mean, it was like you had a water bed. And, I mean, it was great. <laughs> you had a really great life. And then all of a sudden you were born. And if you can just get what it was like to be born, and there has to be this immediate thing like there's something wrong here. <laughs> like it immediately has to be this experience of there's something wrong here. Now, I don't know. I'm <clears throat> asserting this. And so throughout life, we go through life, and how often in life something's wrong. Like there's something wrong here. I remember, I'll tell you this really quick story, had, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm thinking, this was years ago and I had a whole bunch of stuff going on with a business that was falling apart and like I'm, ex for, in my mind, I'm expecting to get delivered papers for a lawsuit. <coughs> it's Friday night and it's like around Christmas time and the doorbell rings and it's like 10 o'clock at night and I know that's about what time the constable comes to the door. And um, so I get, and immediately I think, Oh, I'm getting sued. That was the first thing I thought. So I thought, i got to go like sign the papers for the lawsuit and send it to my attorney. And I walk over and I answer the door. And the whole time I'm walking to the door is what I'm thinking. And I open the door and it's my dad. And he goes, oh, your grandma sent 100 bucks for you for Christmas. And he gives me the $100. And I'm like, oh, it's awesome. And I never got that lawsuit that I was expecting to get. I say often that I'm really glad my life didn't turn out the way I thought it was supposed to. Because I don't know how that would have been. I wouldn't read the things that go on and what. Um, so, yeah, it gets like, I want to answer that with the, like, there's something wrong here. You know, how often that's there in our life. Can you see that if you just kind of look? Can you see, like, someone does something, they're late, and there's something wrong with them being late. Or they said they would do this and they didn't do it and there's something wrong with that. Or whatever the filter is, but it's something like there's something wrong there. And if that's wrong, then I get to be right. And so, um, you know, probably, if, so in my work we call it the lizard brain, but the ego or whatever you would call it, would be, it has two jobs, to be right and survive. And ironically, it knows how to survive by being right. So it really has one job, and that's to be right. So it's like, we just want to be right. So I said in transformation, there's something to give up, and usually that looks like being right, you know? And I've worked with a lot of people, and I've seen a lot of times people would rather be right than have their lives work. Really. It's like they're, they would much rather be right than have their lives work. So, yeah, that's there. And it's just the filter that's there. And you just kind of get, that's the filter that's there, and... And if, whenever you notice you're doing it, see, like, if you don't know you're doing it, it's back here in your blind spot. And when you notice you're doing it, it's kind of like this, and you go, yeah, I don't want to, I'm not going to do that anymore. There's a really great video, uh, Bob Newhart, on Mad TV called Stop It. And it's like seven minutes, and it, people are laughing because they've seen it. I use this consistently as a coaching tool. Someone sends me this long text message of all their stories and excuses, and I send them a link to the video. <laughs> um, I love the video. It's really great. It's like five or seven minutes or something. So, yeah, that's there. I mean, it's like it's a part of being, it's a part of being people. Um, yeah. So just along with another question that was asked, like, how do you get thicker skin to where when somebody says, like, to me, I'm a jerk, I take that in and I'm like, what did I do wrong in my life? I'm a jerk. And I dwell on it like all day long. So what are you doing that you don't want to be doing? 
like tearing myself down and just being like, I believe them, instead of being like, I'm not a jerk, I was just late. That is a jerk to be late, but it doesn't mean I am a jerk. Right. So how do you like change all Stop that? it. Yeah, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a video. Um, <laughs> it's a great question. Did everyone get the question? It's like, how do you not take it personally? There's what happened, and there's what we made it mean. And they are totally different. And when you can just get that, you just get that there's what happened and there's what I made it mean. So even this, like, she says, you're a jerk and you ruined my life. That's just what, so what happened there? You're late. You're late. Yeah, but what, so she says, you're a jerk and you ruined my life. What happened? She said, you're a jerk and you ruined my life. And what does that mean? She she said, said, she said, yes. <laughs> There's an old Zen cone, and it go is the question is they would give the uh, the master would give something for them to meditate on, and if they could get the answer, then they were enlightened. And they would so one of them is they would go meditate on it for days until they could get the answer, and they'd say, "What's the sound of one hand clapping?" And then you'd go meditate on that until you got the answer. So does anyone know this? So if you know it, don't answer. So what's the sound of one hand clapping? There. So, okay, silence. What else? So tell me. <laughs> tell me what it is. I hear it. Tell me what it is. Snapping. It's a snapping. Silence. It's a one hand clap. Okay. It's a so, you can't describe because you can only hear it. Okay, you can only hear it. Okay. But you describe lots of things you hear though, right? That's true. It's the sound of one hand clapping. Yes. Did everyone get that? <laughs> Say it again louder so they hear it. It's the sound of one hand clapping. Yeah, so the sound of one hand clapping is? The sound of one hand yes. clapping. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's put it in your line. So how many of you want more money? I hope everybody. Woo. I love money. Uh, and money loves me. So, okay, so you want more money. So what's the reason, okay, so who wants to have some fun? Who wants to, okay, right here. Okay, so what's the reason you have the amount of money that you have right now? My efforts, my state of mind, my story. Okay, so what, okay, yeah, but what's that? What did you just tell me? So it's, what's, okay, good try. We'll come back. <laughs> Do you want to go? What's the reason you have the amount of money you have right now? I don't know. Okay, she doesn't know. Anyone, tell me. Because of the, my current thoughts. Okay, because of your thoughts? Because of the amount of money that I have. Oh, what? Because of the amount of money that I yeah, have. Yeah, so you have the amount of money that you have right now because... Of the amount of money that I have. That's the amount of money that you have. You mean it's not because when you were five and your dad said that thing and then your mom did that other thing? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Are you sure it's not because of that? Uh -huh. Okay. Do business like these CEOs go... I'm paying you for this? <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a quote that says that complexity occurs to the direct ratio of non-confront, and I'll translate it to English. So when I'm unwilling to deal with something, I make it really complex. Okay. It's just simple. Life is really simple. If I'm really willing to deal... How many of you was the first thought was, I have the amount of money that I have because that's the amount of money that I have? How many of you thought that? Okay? Awesome. Some of you. But if you're unwilling to deal with, like, that's the amount of money that I have, then you're going to make it complex. And you're going to make up this story because when you were 10, and that, your dad said that thing, and your mom said money doesn't grow on trees, and that's why you have the amount of money that you have right now. I wouldn't have had that thought four minutes ago. <laughs> but because of the conversation. But do you see what I mean by that? It's like complexity occurs to the direct ratio of non-confront. So when I'm unwilling to confront something or deal with it, then I make it complex so I don't have to deal with it. Because then what am I dealing with? Instead of dealing with not having the money that I want, what am I dealing with? The thing that happened to me when I was 10. And guess what? As soon as I deal with that thing, then guess what? I go, now I can go make all the money. Oh, no, but then there was that time when I was 10 and a half. <laughs> and so then I go deal with that thing, and then I go, oh, now I can go make all the money. And then I go, remember that time when I was 11? <laughs> And then I go deal with that thing, and then pretty soon I'm dead. <laughs> Were you going to share something? Oh, well, my question, a question. So, if someone, if the question is, <clears throat> why did you lie to me? It's because I lied to you. Well, you don't. Okay, so this is this is like you can't use the truth. You can only be used by it. So you can't use the truth. What I mean by that is it doesn't work to say, it doesn't, that doesn't work. Like someone says, why did you lie? And you say, because I lied to you. 
You can only be used by it. You can't use it. So you can't use the truth. You can only be used by the truth. You might not get that right now, so you're going to have to let that sink in. Okay, so I have a question going back to like, the agreements and the language. Yeah, yeah. So, like, we are Christians, but we are not necessarily the same as leadership position here or you know, like a guiding position. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we're all in those positions in other places, and in order for our lives to work, we oftentimes have to you know, make those agreements with other people, um, and they agree to keep their word, and we agree to keep our word. So what happens when they don't? Yeah, then you After do it, right? Agreement. Yeah, then you do with it. Just like what we had an agreement that I would be there for breakfast, and I wasn't. And then, I, and then we dealt with it, right? Mm -hmm. So are you saying what if it happens repeatedly? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, so, like, say, you know, you're trying, you're trying to run a business, and you've got meetings, and your staff showing up 10 minutes late for meetings. Like, how do you handle that? When they've agreed to be there on time. Yeah. So I'll tell you the first thing is that it, that just doesn't happen with me. I mean, but really, you, like... What do you say in the beginning? Like, right, how, how do, do I... So part of it is that... So I, I'm going to answer that, I promise. Okay? So it's a really awesome question. So if you'll listen to this next part with, like... I really... We're just getting started. I know we're almost done, but we're just getting started. What time is it? It's like 2. 22. Yeah. <laughs> so we have about 15 minutes. I really plan on taking all this time. So this about 15 minutes. You guys loving this? Yeah. 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 So it's a really great question. I want to answer. Do you want to share? Oh, I was just going to say maybe could you role play kind of like you role play the other Right. Situation? So yes, if you don't get it after this part right here, then I'll, then yes, we'll come back to it. But I think you'll get it here. So the, so whatever your question is, like there's been a, a lot of really amazing questions. <clears throat> it's like a lot of how to. How do you do this? How do you do that? It's that's not your access to, to discovering. There's you're going to do it however you do it. That's how you're going to do it. That's really not what <laughs> Really. It's like, and you'll discover something about that here. So, um, who has a goal that they are committed to achieving this year? And do, 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 do you want to share? Just share some, one thing with me. Run a half marathon. Okay, run a half marathon. Um, so we could just run a marathon over there. Or for actually for everybody. You can all imagine something that you want in your life, right? And we'll call this point B. Whatever you want to get it in your life. If it's running a half marathon or whatever it is. Lots of money. I like money. Um, and I like money because it's a really great tool to see like I can really kind of see what kind of results I'm producing. It's a really and you know I mean there's nothing selfish about having a lot of money. You ever notice on the airplane that when they say if um, if you lose if the cabin loses pressure, then you put your mask on, but you put your mask on first. It's really hard to give someone like right now. If you ask me for a dollar, I can't give you a dollar because I don't have any dollars with me, right? So I couldn't give you a dollar that I had. Just like what you were sharing, you were sharing that earlier, right? There's nothing selfish about having a lot. You can't spend that. It's just not possible. I'd love to try. Yeah. If, any, if, you, if you don't believe me, you should watch Brewster's Millions. I love that show. Oh, yeah. I love that. Okay, so this is point B, where we're committed to getting. And that's pretty much all we do. We go, that's how we plan and set goals. We go, I'm going to run a half marathon. And then we plan everything to do that, right? And we forget something. Does anyone know what we're forgetting? Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, I kind of gave it away, didn't I? <laughs> but what's point A? Where I am now. Yeah. Will you say it again? Where I am now. Yeah. Do you really think about that? Do we really go like, where am I now? Do people really do that in the world? Like, if this is where I am, and, and this is, how do I get to here? And then there's a lot of talk about becoming. So I want to make an agreement that we get rid of the word becoming. We could start here in this room, and then we could go out there. Here's what I mean by that, because like, in transformation, a thing is or a thing isn't. So there's no such thing as becoming powerful. There's either being powerful or not being powerful. There's no becoming powerful. If I'm not being powerful, I can be powerful right now. Or right now, or right now. 
And like this never-ending journey to become something, just you never get there. You're always, it's always a journey of becoming. Does that make sense? If you just get like, I'm being powerful or I'm not being powerful, there's no gray area. It's black and white, it's, that's it. When I teach this to guys who've been in the army and stuff, they're like, oh yeah. They get it. They really get it from that. Because that's like, I, um, I was working with a guy last week and he was like, he, I said, and he said, he was actually pointing out, he said, in transformation, it's black and white. There's no like in between. And that was something he'd gotten out of his training with the army. So where I am and where I'm committed to being, and how do we normally get to here? What do we do? We like plan everything that we need to do, right? Yeah. And I've heard talk about being. I love it. That's my, that's my work. We're human beings, so we're always being something. So how do I get from here to here? You wait until you're 90% to plan B, and then start working on it. That's right. <laughs> Don't I need to like um, visualize for 10 years getting to there or something? Sign up for the race. <laughs> right. That would be an action, so being in action about it. But I'm missing like, well, just tell me, would I go like this? That would be nice. Would that be the fastest way there? Mm -hmm. Does anyone disagree that that's the fastest <clears throat> way there? I mean, I know it's not like totally straight, but... Unless you fold up the board. Okay. <laughs> well, we're not going to do that. <laughs> or you could just erase A and write B. <laughs> she says she's erasing and writing. <laughs> well, that's creative so, so, yes. So that's funny, and it's actually exactly what we're going to do. And I mean that in a different way than you mean it, probably. <clears throat> If I'm running a half marathon, how would, how would you know if I'm being, if we're looking from human being and I'm being, how would you know if I'm being who I need to be? Or if I'm being the person that runs a half marathon, how would you know that? I'm running the marathon or I've run the marathon, would that be, a, or the half marathon? Would that be, is that, I heard a lot of answers, but I think that's what I was getting. So I would, I would. Be the, if I was being the person who was running the half marathon, you'd know that because I would have run the marathon, right? But you see there's a particular way I would be if that's what I was. So, so often in life we go, well, I want this, and we make these goals, and then we go, I've got to do that. What are we concerned with? We make a goal, and then we think, I've got to do this. How do I do that? And then it's all about doing and doing and doing and doing and doing. Like strategy and all of that. This will be so unconventional for a world consumed by doing, because we live in a world that's completely consumed by doing. I don't deal in the world of doing. I just, it's not my domain. If I want to get to be, I see that there's a particular way that I'll need to be to run a half marathon. So I have a goal for my business this year. And if I want to make... Uh, Let's say, so last year, if I said I want to make a million dollars last year, you can see that if I go, think about a number of how much money, bless you, how much money you'd like to make. Just think about it in your head. And think about like who you'd, it, it's got to be more than what you're making now. And think about who you'd have to be to make that money. Can you kind of get an idea? And I don't mean what you do, I mean who you'd have to be. So for me, if I look at the amount of money I'm committed to making, it would be like, I would need to be powerful, committed, integrity, a leader. Those are ways of being. Do you get what I mean by being? Those are ways of being. <clears throat> and I can always check in and I could, and then I could ask, see what gives me my action is who I'm being. So whatever I'm doing, we could say, is given to me by who I'm being. So I would say, if I was, and then I would look from this place and I would say, if I was being committed, what would I do? What action would I take next? This is right in line with what you were sharing earlier. If I was being committed, what would I do? What would be the next action I would take? If I was being the leader, what would be the next action I would take? It really opens up this world of possibility. Leaving it open to whatever action it is, is right now. And I'm not saying don't plan anything. I mean, if you saw my calendar, everything's planned. So, but it's like who I'm being is what's giving me that. We tend to think that they're separate or something. I think, as you said, it's, it's very similar to the define our do. Absolutely. And where we 
as a society tend to go backwards. Like I said, we, we look immediately at what am I going to do. Right. And when we do think of a goal, immediately instead of thinking, <coughs> now what do I need to learn to be that, we immediately go, okay, yep. that's my definition, and we skip learning goal right to do. We don't ask ourselves, what do I need to get there totally. to be that? We go immediately to what am I doing now. This is right in line with what, everything that you've been talking about today. Because you need necessary, in my work we call it necessary required skills, necessary required actions, and necessary required information. And I'm just clear about all those things. So necessary required skills, necessary required information, and necessary required action. And we summarize it by NRI, NRS, NRA. So, and if you want me to, I'll, I can write those. But, um, so who do I need to be? That's really the question that I'm dealing with. And um, if I determine what it looks like to be, who I need to be over here, at least like a possibility, who I need to be to get to here, what I do is I take this and I just start being that right now. So essentially it's a lot like erasing the A and putting the B there. I look at who I'd have to be and I be that right now. One of my favorite scriptures says, act as if you have faith, and faith shall be given you. Yeah. As soon as you act the part, you gain everything you need to be that part. Yep, absolutely. There's another, another good quote that goes along with that. It's like, um, to become who you want to be, I know that we're not using the word become, but to become who you want yeah. to be, you need to be, you need to consistently be who you want to become. Yeah. It's kind of that Yeah, yeah. Here. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, it is. It's very, it's actually... It's saying, just be who you need to be, right? Like that's the... No, that's really great. Um, I really want to give you this, and we'll probably go five minutes over if I do. Yes. Do it. Awesome. Totally fine with that. Go for it. Is everyone... And if you need to leave... I really yeah, want, I really want to give you this. <laughs> I really want to give you this. So, um, so did, you get, did you get something? Did, I, did something open up for you? It's who I'm being with people. It's not, I could say, say this and say that. You were just experiencing me being however I'm being. That's what you were experiencing. I don't have a script. There's nothing in the back of my head like a script. I just listened. And then I was like, I'm out here. I'm not in my, my thoughts in my head. I'm out here. I'm listening to what's being said. And then I can acknowledge that and speak directly to that. Rather than being, see, most of us are unaware that we have a conversation going on in our head. And we're not like, you know, you've either... Today you've either been listening to me or you've been listening to the conversation in your head about me. <laughs> and people, you know, when we when people first start to discover there's a voice that lives in their head or a committee, if you're me, then <laughs> it's like they go, you know, they it's like, no, I don't have a voice in my head, and I go, that's the voice, that's the voice, the one that says I don't have a voice. Okay, so how do you create that with people? It's um. We're gonna go like laser through this. <laughs> Can everyone read my writing? Context versus content. What's the difference? What holds like the glass versus the water? Okay. Yeah. So what would the glass be in this example? Context. Context. The context. Yeah. And the content would be what shows up in the glass. So, did everyone get that the context is, it's like the space that things show up in your life, or in other words, that the content shows up in your life. So imagine, if this room was dark and there were no windows and all the lights were off and there was one blue light turned on, and we pulled a yellow car in here, would the car ever look yellow? No, no not in that context, it would never look yellow. That's the context. So just like someone said to you earlier, the other thing that you could be thinking, like with your stuff got stolen, so stuff got taken out of your garage, that's what happened. And that's the content. And the way that it shows up is in the context. Meaning it could show up like, oh, I should have closed the garage door, and I should have listened to that. It could show up like, somebody must need that more than I need it, like your daughter said. Someone must need that bike more than I need that bike. It could show up like, you know, uh, well, my husband knows that I care about him and that he's important to me, and I was there with him. That's just an example. It's the same content, right? Yeah. And it shows up all these different ways in the context. So, 
it'd be accurate to say the context is the space in which the events of your life show up. So one might have little say over what actually happens in their life. I mean, did you want stuff to get stolen out of your garage? And did you really have a lot of say in it? I mean, I know you could have closed the garage, but does that assure that stuff wouldn't have gotten taken out of your garage? No. So we may have, now there's certainly content that we have say over, but there's things that just happen that just happen. Right? Like, I mean, it just, it just happened. Uh, like uh, getting your car blowing up in Fillmore. <laughs> That's just happened, right? And then there's the context for it to show up. It could be like, God hates me and doesn't want me to be at this training today, so he's making me late. That's, that's a possible context. I know people in my past, dude, that would have been the context for them. So the context is the way that it shows up. Like, whatever the content is, is the way that it shows up. One might not have a lot of say in the content of their life. What actually happens. Things happen. People get cancer. All kinds of things happen in people's lives. Um, and you might not have a lot of say of what actually does happen with that. But you have all the say in the world of the context of your life. And if you get anything, this is what I would want you to get out of today and out of my time with you, is that you have all the say in the world of the context of your life, of the way that things show up for you. So how do you create context? I'll give you an... Uh, it's written, it was written right here. How do you create context? Language. Language. <clears throat> The way that I speak about things is the way that they show up for me. And as I do that over and over and over and over again, there was a time, and if you guys, if you guys meet my wife, you'll laugh at me when I tell you this. There was a time I thought my wife was the meanest person I'd ever known. And that was how she showed up for me, and it was how I kept talking about her. So what happens is we go, this is what we don't like, right? And it's right here. And then I talk about it, and I keep talking about it, and I keep saying, I can't believe she's that way to me. I wish she wasn't that way. I wish she would be this way and be this other way. And I can't believe she's this way, and blah, 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 blah. And we call that the vicious circle. The vicious circle. It just gets you more of what you already have that you don't want. And you see that. It's just going around in circles. It just gets you more of what you don't want. Context is created in language, and there's two types of language. Descriptive language and declarative language. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Was he describing something that already existed? No, no. Nope, he was declaring something that had never existed before. It was not there. It was, out, it was from nothing. Describing things doesn't get you what you want. It just describes what's already there. And there can be value in using descriptive language. Like being, like it's like, in, it's, it can be informative. But you create, and you, so you've been asking like, how do we get people to be this way with us? You declare who you're gonna be for them. You declare who they are for you. And you keep creating a future. Look what Apple's doing. They're training people. This is the kind of work that you give up weekends for. The kind of work that you uh, don't step over anything. The kind of work like, you know, you never look over any... There's no small details here that you're going to look over. Bless you. Bless you. It's the kind of work that has your life really matter. You can do that work at Apple. Do you see what they're doing? You're going to work weekends. <clears throat> and you're going to love it and be excited about it. And they do. Have you guys met someone who works for Apple? They love it. Are they describing something that already exists? It's their first day as an intern. They're creating a future. So declaring would look like commitments, promises, requests, declarations, all those. Yes, they're creating a context for them to show up and do what they do at Apple. And they're creating it in language using declarative language. Promises, requests, declarations, assertions. You just make a declaration and, it create, and you keep creating context. For so long I was trying to get fulfilled in my marriage with my wife. Like fulfillment was somewhere out there and I was going to go get it. Like I mean... Like I was going to go to the store and pick up an ounce of fulfillment or something. <laughs> it's 
not there. Happiness isn't out there. You can't go on a scavenger hunt and find it. Satisfaction isn't. So would you say that context is a meaning that you give it? Or it's how it's like it just is it just shows up in this context. You don't have to you don't have to it, like the car is not yellow in the room with the blue light, right? It's just like it, that's just how it shows up. So yes, yeah, so it would be like how it's interpreted. So the content gets interpreted through the context. The context is decisive. The context is decisive. If the context for my life is that I'm a victim, everything in my life is going to be about me being a victim. It is decisive, absolutely. So could you say that the context is your paradigm? Yes, and it's decisive. When I got that the context is decisive, it was like, I'd heard that for a year, and then all of a sudden I'm sitting in my office and I was like, what? <laughs> I got it. I got that the context is decisive. All over. An example would be that if you're, you, you talked about working at Apple a minute ago. If you work at Microsoft, you do a lot of the exact same things, but you not, might not feel about it the same way, mm -hmm. or treat it the same way because it was given a different context. So even though it's the content or the job description and what you do from 9 to 5 is the same thing. Yeah. I want to read this again. I want you to like just listen and really kind of, you can create a future for somebody. For the 160 kids who are coming, you can create a future for them, for the people in your life, for yourselves. You can create a future for you to live into. Just saying who you're going to be and being it. Making promises, declarations, assertions. It creates a context for your life. You can create a future for someone to live into. So I want to read this again. And I want you to listen to it from this context. There's work, like working at Microsoft. And there's your life's work. The kind of work that has your fingerprints all over it. The kind of work that you'd never compromise on. That you'd sacrifice a weekend for. You can do that kind of work at Apple. People don't come here to play it safe. They come here to swim in the deep end. They want their work to add up to something. Something big. Something that couldn't happen anywhere else. Welcome to Apple. <laughs> it's incredible. You just get like, there's something moving about that if you just actually are really present to it. It's just incredible. So if you want to know how do you have everything you've ever wanted in your life, just be the person that has all of that. And whenever you notice the thought, like, well, how do I do that, and all of that, that's just the ego and the lizard brain trying to make it all complex. No, just, who do you need to be to do that? And then just be that person. So you learned all this, and one day you woke up, and you're like, all right, today's the day, I'm just going to be this, <laughs> and the change was just overnight? I, it's not like you're not experiencing, I didn't wake up this way this morning, that's what I want you to get. Right. But you I'm, thought, committed, I'm, I'm, I'm creating being this way right now with you. And I could stop creating it at any moment but I'm committed to this is who I am for the world. I'm here because I'm committed to the world working. So what did your wife think all of a sudden when you're like, I'm just she, my word? I will probably, I'll save you uh, probably the explicitives, but she said, <laughs> it's about time, right? <laughs> <laughs> so can I tell you a two minute story and yes. then we'll wrap up? So this is when I got this. I came home, I have two little kids. Uh, my son will be five next month and my daughter's two. And I walked home and my wife was sitting in the chair in the front room and she was crying. And she said, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I can't like be with you and have it like so unstable and like I never know what I can count on from you. I never know, like it's so just up in the air, I never know what I can count on from you. And she's in, tear, and she's in tears and she said, it's got to be different. Like something has to change. And I got it. And I got it, she said, if something doesn't change, I'm leaving and I'm taking the kids. And talk about like it getting real. <laughs> so my life was on the line, literally. Like, okay, my life's on the line. Your life might not be on the line. You can wait and you can discover like I did for yourselves how out of integrity actions, where that will lead you in life. Or you can take my word for it, if you will. <laughs> And you'll discover what you discover about it. I promise you, try integrity on. It'll give you an access to power that you never knew existed. 
Watch your language, like you're creating, so your thoughts, so I, I want to tie this back, your thoughts are influenced by, your, they're correlated with your language. The way that things show up for us, the context, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our moods. When I just describe, like, so this would be, transformation would bring a new possibility into being. When I say, I declare, like, I say, I'm committed that our time together makes a real difference for you. When I work with someone, I tell them it's an experience you don't ever get over. It's like it's there in your life, throughout your whole life. You don't ever get over working with me. What does that create? It creates a whole world for them. You get, you kind of see that world? What if I said, I'm hungry. Does that make any difference? Like, is there any new world for me to live into? There's no new possibility there. It's like, I'm hungry. Okay, great. But I can actually create a future. Now I could create a future and I could say, I'm going to get food and eat it. That could be like, that's declaring something. And it creates a new future. I'm going to this place at this time and I'm going to get food. That's a lot, that's very different than saying I'm hungry. This doesn't create anything new. This <clears throat> moves the game forward. It moves life forward. I promise you, I'll make you a promise. If you will master your speaking, like what comes out of your mouth, and you live in this world of declaration, promises, assertions, commitments, agreements, you live in that world, and you are committed to integrity, I promise you, you'll master your life. When I hired Scott, he said to me, in the next 12 months, you'll master living, because you'll master speaking powerfully. When you hang out with, I'm this way at my house, and when I'm in my pajamas at home, like, this is how I am. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, it's just like, I'm just absolutely committed that everybody, this is available to anybody. So I just, I know we're past uh, and we're over time, and thank you for being so generous in your listening. I want to say that without your listening here, like without you here listening and sharing, and I'm just a guy in a front of a room talking, and um, I could do that anywhere. So what's actually really given me the power to say anything that I've said, and if I've said anything that's made a difference for you, you did that. That was all in your listening. I just said whatever I said, and your listening of what I said is what created Work that. For you, I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd, uh, I'll be around, so um, I think we're, some of us are, are going later. So I'll be around, so I'd love to, uh, if, if there's any questions or anything, but I mean, really, it's like, I have a, um, so I'll, I'll leave you with this. I have a vision for the world, and it's a commitment that the world works. Now, the world works the way it works right now. And my observation and assertion is the world really isn't working. People are going to war. People are dying. I think every four seconds someone dies of hunger. So the world really isn't working. And um, until the world works, I don't stop. There's no rest until the world works, like until there's peace. And that's what I'm committed to. And you can count on that from me. I don't care how much money I have, ever. I'm committed to the world working. And this is a privilege to get to be here because for me, this is a way that I get to make a difference in the world. And you said thousands of kids, I say every kid in the world. That's who I am for Youth for Freedom. That every kid in the world lives the principles and what's taught at Youth for Freedom. So thank you so much for letting me be here. And thanks for your listening. <laughs>
Um, but one other thing, start promoting it for freedom. Each of you has a, a vision, a powerful purpose. Help people to come here to get around each other, to get around Cami, to get around everybody. We have flyers. I didn't know we had flyers. <laughs> okay. I don't want these in my hands, though. Okay. We're going to put them right here for the second. Grab several of these and pass them out to people. Okay. We're going to have, within the next couple of days, we're going to update the website a bunch and fix some stuff, and it'll be, all be good. Some language for promoting it. Turn to page four on your manual. Talks about each session. Tells you a little cool thing about what it is and why, why it exists, right? And we've talked a lot about Youth for Freedom and the vision that, that some of the leaders have for it. Figure out why are you doing Youth for Freedom and promote it to people to come to it. Also, as part of your, your pay as a counselor, for those of you who, who are definitely in it as counselors, um, you get to comp one youth. Um, they get $100 off their entrance um, price. Thank you. Halfway through that sentence, my brain like went somewhere else. I didn't even know where. Okay, so to say that again, each of you can give one youth a $100 discount as part of your pay. Does that make sense? Okay. So find out who it's going to be. We want this to spread to everybody. Like, like you've just said, every kid in the world needs this. Okay. So again, any other questions? Talk to your session directors. Okay. Can I get a volunteer for a closing prayer before we leave? Daniel? Yeah. Thank you. Daniel, can I just thank, thank everybody for being here? Holy cow. My brain is like, what? <laughs> just even being in your presence is an honor. It's totally an honor. 14 years ago when we set out this envision of who on earth would be sitting in the seats. Like what Ephraim said, without you guys sitting here, we wouldn't have the youth coming to us, and we wouldn't have this program to be doing all of, all of the things that we're doing, the changes that we're making, and the things we're talking about, and all of it. It happens because you chose to be here. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to spend all of today with you. So I want to thank you for that. <laughs>